Section 13 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Burning of Rome under Nero, A.D. 64 by Tacitus. There followed a dreadful disaster. Whether fortuitously, or by the wicked contrivance of the prince, is not determined, for both are asserted by historians. But of all the calamities which ever befell this city from the rage of fire, this was the most terrible and severe. It broke out in that part of the circus which is contiguous to Mounts Palatine and Celius, where, by reason of shops in which were kept such goods as minister elements to fire, the moment it commenced it acquired strength, and being accelerated by the wind, it spread at once through the whole extent of the circus, for neither were the houses secured by enclosures, nor the temples environed with walls, nor was there any other obstacle to intercept its progress. But the flame, spreading every way impetuously, invaded first the lower regions of the city, then mounted to the higher, then again ravaging the lower. It baffled every effort to extinguish it, by the rapidity of its destructive course, and from the liability of the city to conflagration, in consequence of the narrow and intricate alleys and the irregularity of the streets in ancient Rome. Add to this the wailings of terrified women, the infirm condition of the aged, and the helplessness of childhood, such as strove to provide for themselves and those who labored to assist others, these dragging the feeble, those waiting for them, some hurrying, others lingering, altogether created a scene of universal confusion and embarrassment, and while they looked back upon the danger in their rear, they often found themselves beset before and on their sides, or, if they had escaped into the quarters adjoining, these two were already seized by the devouring flames. Even the parts which they believed remote and exempt were found to be in the same distress. At last, not knowing what to shun or where to seek sanctuary, they crowded the streets and lay along in the open fields. Some, from the loss of their whole substance, even the means of their daily sustenance, others, from affection for their relations whom they had not been able to snatch from the flames, suffer themselves to perish in them, though they had opportunity to escape. Neither dared any man offered to check the fire, so repeated were the menaces of many who forbade to extinguish it, and because others openly threw firebrands with loud declarations that they had one who authorized them, whether they did it that they might plunder with the less restraint or in consequence of orders given. Nero, who was at that juncture sojourning at Antium, did not return to the city till the fire approached that quarter of his house which connected the palace with the gardens of Messinus. Nor could it, however, be prevented from devouring the house and palace and everything around. But, for the relief of the people, thus destitute and driven from their dwellings, he opened the field of Mars and the monumental edifices erected by Agrippa, and even his own gardens, he likewise reared temporary houses for the reception of the forlorn multitude, and from Ostia and the neighboring cities were brought up the river household necessaries, and the price of grain was reduced to three sesterces the measure. All which proceedings, though of a popular character, were thrown away, because a rumor had become universally current that at the very time when the city was in flames, Nero going on the stage of his private theatre, sang the destruction of Troy, assimilating the present disaster to that catastrophe of ancient times. At length, on the sixth day, the conflagration was stayed at the foot of Esquilier, 
by pulling down an immense quantity of buildings, so that an open space and, as it were, void air might check the raging element by breaking the continuity. But ere the consternation had subsided, the fire broke out afresh, with no little violence, but in regions more spacious, and therefore with less destruction of human life. But more extensive havoc was made of the temples and the porticos dedicated to amusement. This conflagration, too, was the subject of more censorious remark, as it arose in the Emilian possessions of Tigellinus, and Nero seemed to aim at the glory of building a new city and calling it by his own name, for of the fourteen sections into which Rome is divided, four were still standing entire, three were leveled with the ground, and in the seven others there remained, only here and there, a few remnants of houses, shattered and half-consumed. It were no very easy task to recount the number of tenements and temples which were lost, but the following, most venerable for antiquity and sanctity, were consumed. That dedicated by Servius Tullius to the moon. The temple and great altar consecrated by Evander the Arcadian to Hercules while present. The chapel vowed by Romulus to Jupiter Stator. The palace of Numa with the temple of Vesta and in it the tutelar gods of Rome. Moreover, the treasures accumulated by so many victories, the beautiful productions of Greek artists, ancient writings of authors celebrated for genius, and till then preserved entire, were consumed. And though great was the beauty of the city in its renovated form, the older inhabitants remembered many decorations of the ancient which could not be replaced in the modern city. There were some who remarked that the commencement of this fire showed itself on the 14th before the calends of July, the day in which the Senon set fire to the captured city. Others carried their investigation so far as to determine that an equal number of years, months, and days intervened between the two fires. To proceed, Nero appropriated to his own purposes the ruins of his country, and founded upon them a palace, in which the old-fashioned and, in those luxurious times, common ornaments of gold and precious stones were not so much the object of attraction as lands and lakes. In one part, woods like vast deserts. In another part, open spaces and expansive prospects. The projectors and superintendents of this plan were Severus and Seller, men of such ingenuity and daring enterprise as to attempt to conquer by art the obstacles of nature and fool away the treasures of the prince. They had even undertaken to sink a navigable canal from the lake of Vernus to the mouth of the Tiber, over an arid shore or through opposing mountains. Nor, indeed, does there occur anything of a humid nature for supplying water except the pomptine marshes. The rest is either craggy rock or parched soil. And had it even been possible to break through these obstructions, the toil had been intolerable and disproportioned to the object. Nero, however, who longed to achieve things that exceeded credibility, exerted all his might to perforate the mountains adjoining to Avernus, and to this day, there remain traces of his abortive project. But the rest of the old site, not occupied by his palace, was laid out, not as after the Gallic fire, without discrimination and regularity, but with the lines of streets measured out, broad spaces left for transit, the height of the buildings limited, open areas left, and porticos added to protect the front of the clustered dwellings. These porticos Nero engaged to rear at his own expense, and then to deliver to each proprietor the areas about them cleared. He, moreover, proposed rewards proportioned to every man's rank and private substance, and fixed a day within which, if their houses, single and clustered, were finished, they should receive them. 
he appointed the marshes of Ostia for a receptacle of the rubbish, and that the vessels which had conveyed grain up the Tiber should return laden with rubbish, that the buildings themselves should be raised a certain portion of their height without beams, and arched with stone from the quarries of Gabii or Alba, that stone being proof against fire, that over the water springs, which had been improperly intercepted by private individuals, overseers should be placed, to provide for their flowing in greater abundance, and in a greater number of places, for the supply of the public, that every housekeeper should have in his yard means for extinguishing fire. Neither should there be party walls, but every house should be enclosed by its own walls. These regulations, which were favorably received, in consideration of their utility, were also a source of beauty to the new city. Yet, some there were who believed that the ancient form was more conducive to health, as from the narrowness of the streets and the height of the buildings, the rays of the sun were more excluded, whereas now the spacious breadth of the streets, without any shade to protect it, was more intensely heated in warm weather. Such were the provisions made by human councils. The gods were next addressed with expiations, and recourse had to the Sibyl's books. By admonition from them, to Vulcan, Ceres, and Proserpina, supplicatory sacrifices were made, and Juno propitiated by the matrons. First in the capital, then upon the nearest shore, where, by water drawn from the sea, the temple and image of the goddess were besprinkled. The ceremony of placing the goddess in her sacred chair and her vigil were celebrated by ladies who had husbands. But not all the relief that could come from men, not all the bounties that the prince could bestow, nor all the atonements which could be presented to the gods, availed to relieve Nero from the infamy of being believed to have ordered the conflagration. Hence, to suppress the rumor, he falsely charged with the guilt and punished with the most exquisite tortures the persons commonly called Christians, who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius, but the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, whither all things horrible and disgraceful flow from all quarters as to a common receptacle and where they are encouraged. Accordingly, first those were seized who confessed they were Christians, Next, on their information, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. And in their deaths they were also made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses, or set fire to, and when day declined, burned to serve for nocturnal lights. Nero offered his own gardens for that spectacle, and exhibited a Circensian game, indiscriminately mingling with the common people in the habit of a charioteer, or else standing in his chariot, whence a feeling of compassion arose toward the sufferers, though guilty and deserving to be made examples of by capital punishment, because they seemed not to be cut off for the public good, but victims to the ferocity of one man. In the meantime, in order to supply money, all Italy was pillaged, the provinces ruined, both the people in alliance with us and the states which are called free. Even the gods were not exempt from plunder on this occasion, their temples in the city being despoiled, and all the gold conveyed away, which the Roman people in every age either in gratitude for triumphs or in fulfillment of vows, had consecrated in times of prosperity or in seasons of dismay. Through Greece and Asia, indeed, the gifts and oblations, 
and even the statues of the deities were carried off. End of section 13. Section 14 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. Persecution of the Christians under Nero. A.D. 64-68. to 68. Frederick William Farrar. Down to the reign of Nero, Christians in the Roman Empire were regarded by the ruling powers merely as a Jewish sect, harmless and guilty of nothing which could call for the interference of the state with their ways of life or of worship. They were therefore unmolested. But during the reign of the infamous emperor, in whom they saw Antichrist, and the actual embodiment of the symbolic monstrosities of the Apocalypse, the Christians began to be recognized as a separate people, and from milder persecutions at first, under cover of legal procedure, they were soon subjected to outrages, tortures, and deaths than which history has none more revolting and pitiful to record. In Kaulbach's great painting of Nero's persecution, there is enough of portrayal and suggestion to add a terrible vividness to the ordinary historian's word pictures. The emperor, surrounded by his boon companions, stands on his garden terrace to receive divine honors, while a group of suffering Christians, among them St. Peter, crucified head down, and St. Paul, passionately protesting against the diabolical work, move to compassion a company of elderly men and a body of German soldiers who look upon the horrible spectacle of martyrdom. This, the first persecution of the Christians, reached its culminating point of ferocity in A.D. 64, after Nero had been accused of kindling, or conniving at the work of those who did kindle, the great fire in Rome. In order to divert attention, even if he could not turn suspicion, from himself, having charged the Christians with causing the conflagration, he ordered the atrocities which added a still darker stain to his personal and imperial record of shameless crime and savage inhumanity. First, such as confessed themselves to be Christians were dealt with, and from these information was extorted on which vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. Nero's character and acts have been depicted by many writers and in famous works of art, but not even the pencil of Kalbach can make more keen the realization of those scenes enacted in this persecution than the thrilling narration of Farrar, which, for picturesque eloquence, fired with dramatic intensity, has seldom been surpassed in English literature. Nero was so secure in his absolutism, he had hitherto found it so impossible to shock the feelings of the people or to exhaust the terrified adulation of the Senate that he was usually indifferent to the pasconades which were constantly holding up his name to execration and contempt. But now he felt that he had gone too far and that his power would be seriously impelled if he did not succeed in diverting the suspicions of the populace. He was perfectly aware that when the people in the streets cursed those who set fire to the city, they meant to curse him. If he did not take some immediate step, he felt that he might perish, as Gaius had perished before him, by the dagger of the assassin. It is at this point of his career that Nero becomes a prominent figure in the history of the church. It was this phase of cruelty which seemed to throw a blood-red light over his whole character, and led men to look on him as the very incarnation of the world power in its most demoniac aspect, as worse than the Antiochus Epiphanes of Daniel's Apocalypse, as the man of sin, whom, in language figurative indeed, yet awfully true, the Lord should slay with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
for Nero, endeavored to fix the odious crime of having destroyed the capital of the world upon the most innocent and faithful of his subjects, upon the only subjects who offered heartfelt prayers on his behalf, the Roman Christians. They were the defenseless victims of this horrible charge, for though they were the most harmless, they were also the most hated and the most slandered of living men. Why he should have thought of singling out the Christians has always been a curious problem, for at this point St. Luke ends the Acts of the Apostles, perhaps purposely dropping the curtain, because it would have been perilous and useless to narrate the horrors in which the hitherto neutral or friendly Roman government began to play so disgraceful a part. Neither Tacitus nor Suetonius nor the Apocalypse help us to solve this particular problem. The Christians had filled no large space in the eyes of the world. Until the days of Domitian, we do not hear of a single noble or distinguished person who had joined their ranks. That the Pudens and Claudia of Romans 16 were the Pudens and Claudia of Martial's epigrams seems to me to be a baseless dream. If the foreign superstition with which Pomponia Gracina, wife of Aulus Plotius, the conqueror of Britain, was charged, and of which she was acquitted, was indeed, as has been suspected, the Christian religion, at any rate the name of Christianity was not alluded to by the ancient writers who had mentioned the circumstance. Even if Romans 16 was addressed to Rome, and not, as I believe, to Ephesus, they of the household of Narcissus, which were in the Lord, were unknown slaves, as also were they of Caesar's household. The slaves and artisans, Jewish and Gentile, who formed the Christian community at Rome, had never in any way come into collision with the Roman government. They must have been the victims, rather than the exciters of the messianic tumults, for such that they are conjectured to have been which led to the expulsion of the Jews from Rome by the futile edict of Claudius. Nay, so obedient and docile were they required to be by the very principles on which their morality was based, so far were they removed from the fierce independence of the Jewish zealots, that, in writing to them a few years earlier, the greatest of their leaders had urged upon them a payment of tribute and a submission to the higher powers, not only for wrath, but also for conscious sake, because the earthly ruler, in his office of repressing evil works, is a minister of God. That the Christians were entirely innocent of the crime charged against them was well known both at the time and afterward. But how was it that Nero sought popularity and partly averted the deep rage which was rankling in many hearts against himself? by torturing men and women on whose agonies he thought that the populace would gaze not only with a stolid indifference, but even with fierce satisfaction. Gibbon had conjectured that the Christians were confounded with the Jews, and that the detestation universally felt for the latter fell with double force upon the former. Christians suffered even more than the Jews, because of the calumny so assiduously circulated against them, and from what appeared to the ancients to be the revolting absurdity of their peculiar tenets. Nero, says Tacitus, exposed to accusation and tortured with the most exquisite penalties, a set of men detested for their enormities, whom the common people called Christians. Christus, the founder of this sect, was executed during the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate, and the deadly superstition, suppressed for a time, began to burst out once more, not only throughout Judea, where the evil had its root, but even in the city, whither from every quarter all things horrible or shameful are drifted and find their votaries. The lordly disdain which prevented Tacitus from making any inquiry into the real views and character of the Christians is shown by the fact that he catches up the most baseless allegations against them. He talks of their doctrines as savage and shameful when they breathed 
the very spirit of peace and purity. He charges them with being animated by a hatred of their kind, when their central tenet was a universal charity. The masses, he says, called them Christians, and while he almost apologizes for staining his page with so vulgar an appellation, he merely mentions in passing that, though innocent of the charge of being turbulent incendiaries, on which they were tortured to death, they were yet a set of guilty and infamous sectaries, to be classed with the lowest dregs of Roman criminals. But the haughty historian throws no light on one difficulty, namely the circumstances which led to the Christians being thus singled out. The Jews were in no way involved in Nero's persecution. To persecute the Jews at Rome would not have been an easy matter. They were sufficiently numerous to be formidable, and had overawed Cicero in the zenith of his fame. Besides this, the Jewish religion was recognized, tolerated, licensed. Throughout the length and breadth of the empire, no man, however much he and his race might be detested and despised, could have been burned or tortured for the mere fact of being a Jew. We hear of no Jewish martyrdoms or Jewish persecutions till we come to the times of the Jewish war, and then chiefly in Palestine itself. It is clear that a shedding of blood, in fact some form or other of human sacrifice, was imperatively demanded by popular feeling as an expiation of the ruinous crime which had plunged so many thousands into the depths of misery. In vain had the Sibylline books been once more consulted, and in vain had public prayer been offered, in accordance with their directions to Vulcan and the goddesses of Earth and Hades. In vain had the Roman matrons walked in procession in dark robes, and with their long hair unbound, to propitiate the insulted majesty of Juno, and to sprinkle with seawater her ancient statue. In vain had largesses been lavished upon the people, and propitiatory sacrifices offered to the gods. In vain had public banquets been celebrated in honor of various deities. A crime had been committed, and Romans had perished unavenged. Blood cried for blood before the sullen suspicion against Nero could be averted or the indignation of heaven appeased. Nero had always hated, persecuted, and exiled the philosophers. And no doubt, so far as he knew anything of the Christians, so far as he saw among his own countless slaves, anyone who had embraced this superstition, which the elite of Rome described as not only new but execrable and malefic, he would hate their gravity and purity, and feel for them that raging envy, which is the tribute that virtue receives from vice. Moreover, St. Paul, in all probability, had recently stood before his tribunal, and though he had been acquitted on the special charges of turbulence and profanation, respecting which he had appealed to Caesar, yet during the judicial inquiry Nero could hardly have failed to hear from the emissaries of the Sanhedrin many fierce slanders of a sect which was everywhere spoken against. The Jews were by far the deadliest enemies of the Christians, and two persons of Jewish proclivities were at this time in close proximity to the person of the emperor. One was the pantomimist, Alatorus. The other was Papea, the harlot empress. The Jews were in communication with these powerful favorites, and had even promised Nero that if his enemies ever prevailed at Rome, he should have the kingdom of Jerusalem. It is not even impossible that there may have been a third dark and evil influence at work to undermine the Christians. For about this very time the unscrupulous Pharisi Flavius Josephus had availed himself of the intrigues of the palace to secure the liberation of some Jewish priests. If, as seems certain, the Jews had it in their power during the reign of Nero more or less to shape the whisper of the throne, does not historical induction drive us to conclude with some confidence that the suggestion of the Christians as scapegoats and victims came from them? St. Clement says in his epistle that the Christians suffered through jealousy. Whose jealousy? 
who can tell what dark secrets lie veiled under the suggestive word? Was Acta a Christian, and was Poppea jealous of her? That suggestion seems at once inadequate and improbable, especially as Acta was not hurt. But there was a deadly jealousy at work against the new religion. To the pagans, Christianity was but a religious extravagance, contemptible indeed, but otherwise insignificant. To the Jews, on the other hand, it was an object of hatred which never stopped short of bloodshed, when it possessed or could usurp the power, and which, though long suppressed by circumstances, displayed itself in all the intensity of its virulence during the brief spasm of the dictatorship of Berkobus. Christianity was hateful to the Jews on every ground. It nullified their law. It liberated all Gentiles from the heavy yoke of that law, without thereby putting them on a lower level. It even tended to render those who were born Jews indifferent to the institutions of Mosaism. It was, as it were, a fatal revolt and schism from within, more dangerous than any assault from without, and worse than all, it was by the Gentiles confounded with the Judaism, which was its bitter antagonist, while it sheltered its existence under the mantle of Judaism as a religio licita, it drew down upon the religion from whose bosom it sprang all the scorn and hatred which were attached by the world to its own special tenets. For however much the Greeks and Romans despised the Jews, they despised still more the belief that the Lord and Savior of the world was a crucified malefactor who had risen from the dead. I see in the proselytism of Poppea, guided by Jewish malice, the only adequate explanation of the first Christian persecution. Hers was the jealousy which had goaded Nero to matricide. Hers, not improbably, was the instigated fanaticism of a proselyte which urged him to imbrue his hands in martyr blood. And she had her reward, a woman of whom Tacitus has not a word of good to say, and who seems to have been repulsive even to Suetonius, is handed down by the renegade Pharisee as a devout woman, as a worshipper of God. And indeed, when once the Christians were pointed out to the popular vengeance, many reasons would be adduced to prove their connection with the conflagration. Temples had perished, and were they not notorious enemies of the temples? Did not popular rumor charge them with nocturnal orgies and theestian feasts? Suspicions of incendiarism were sometimes brought against Jews, but the Jews were not in the habit of talking, and these sectaries were about a fire which should consume the world, and rejoicing in the prospect of that fiery consummation. Nay, more, when pagans had bewailed the destruction of the city and the loss of the ancient monuments of Rome, had not these pernicious people used ambiguous language, as though they joyously recognized in these events the signs of a coming end? Even when they tried to suppress all outward tokens of exultation, had they not listened to the fears and lamentations of their fellow citizens with some sparkle in the eyes? And had they not answered with something of triumph in their tones? There was a satanic plausibility which dictated the selection of these particular victims because they hated the wickedness of the world with its ruthless schemes and hideous idolatries. They were accused of hatred of the whole human race. The charge of incivismy, so fatal in this reign of terror, was sufficient to ruin a body of men who scorned the sacrifices of heathendom and turned away with abhorrence from its banquets and gaieties. The cultivated classes looked down upon the Christians with a disdain which would hardly even mention them without an apology. The canal of pagan cities insulted them with obscene inscriptions and blasphemous pictures on the very walls of the places where they met. Nay, they were popularly known by nicknames like Sermentici and Semoxi, untranslatable terms of opprobrium derived from the faggots with which they were burned and the stakes to which they were chained. Even heroic courage which they displayed was described as being sheer obstinacy and stupid fanaticism. But in the method chosen for the punishment of these saintly innocents, 
Nero gave one more proof of the close connection between effeminate aestheticism and sanguinary callousness. As in the old days, on that opprobrious hill, the temple of Chemosh had stood close by that of Moloch, so now we find the spoliarium besides the fornices. Lust hard by hate. The carnificina of Tiberius at Capreae adjoined the Solariae. History has given many proofs that no man is more systematically heartless than a corrupted debauchee, like people, like prince. In the then condition of Rome, Nero well knew that a nation cruel by their sports to blood injured would be most likely to forget their miseries and condone their suspicions by mixing games and gaiety with spectacles of refined and atrocious cruelty, of which for eighteen centuries the most passing record had sufficed to make men's blood run cold. Tacitus tells us that those who confessed were first seized, and then on their evidence a huge multitude were convicted, not so much on the charge of incendiarism as for their hatred to mankind. Compressed and obscure as the sentence is, Tacitus clearly means to imply, by the confession, to which he alludes the confession of Christianity, and though he is not sufficiently generous to acquaint the Christians absolutely of all complicity in the great crime, he distinctly says that they were made the scapegoats of a general indignation. The phrase, a huge multitude, is one of the few existing indications of the number of martyrs in the first persecution, and of the number of Christians in the Roman church. When the historian says that they were convicted on the charge of hatred against mankind, he shows how completely he confounds them with the Jews, against whom he elsewhere brings the accusation of hostile feelings toward all except themselves. Then the historian adds one casual but frightful sentence, a sentence which flings a dreadful light on the cruelty of Nero and the Roman mob. He adds, and various forms of mockery were added to enhance their dying agonies. Covered with the skins of wild beasts, they were doomed to die by the mangling of dogs, or by being nailed to crosses, or to be set on fire and burned after twilight by way of nightly illumination. Nero offered his own garden for the show, and gave a chariot race mingling with the mob in the dress of a charioteer, or actually driving about among them. Hence, guilty as the victims were, and deserving of the worst punishments, a feeling of compassion toward them began to rise, as men felt as they were being immolated, not for any advantage to the commonwealth, but to glut the savagery of a single man. Imagine that awful scene, once witnessed by the silent obelisk in the square before St. Peter's at Rome. Imagine it that we may realize how vast is the change which Christianity has wrought in the feelings of mankind. There, where the vast dome now rises, were once the gardens of Nero. They were thronged with gay crowds, among whom the emperor moved in his frivolous degradation, and on every side were men dying slowly on their cross of shame. Along the paths of those gardens, on the autumn nights, were ghastly torches, blackening the ground beneath them with streams of sulfurous pitch. And each of those living torches was a martyr in his shirt or fire. And in the amphitheater, hard by, in sight of twenty thousand spectators, famished dogs were tearing to pieces some of the best and purest of men and women, hideously disguised in the skins of bears or wolves. Thus did Nero baptize in the blood of martyrs the city which was to be for ages the capital of the world. The specific atrocity of such spectacles, unknown to the earlier ages which they called barbarous, was due to the cold-blooded selfishness, the hideous realism of a refined, delicate, aesthetic age. To please these lisping Hawthorn buds, these debauched and sanguinary dandies, art, forsooth, must know nothing of morality must accept and rejoice in a healthy animalism, must estimate life by the number of its few wildest pulsations, must reckon that life is worthless without the most thrilling experiences of horror or delight. Comedy must be actual shame and tragedy genuine bloodshed. 
When the play of Ephranius, called the Conflagration, was put on the stage, a house must be really burned, and its furniture really plundered. In the mime, called Loreolus, an actor must really be crucified and mangled by a bear, and really fling himself down and deluge the stage with blood. When the heroism of Mucius Scavola were represented, a real criminal must thrust his hand, without a groan, into the flame and stand motionless while it is being burned. Prometheus must be really chained to his rock, and Derce, in very fact, be tossed and gored by the wild bull, and Orpheus be torn to pieces by a real bear, and Icarus must really fly, even though he fall and be dashed to death, and Hercules must ascend the funeral pyre, and there be veritably burned alive, and slaves and criminals must play their parts heroically, in gold and purple, till the flames envelop them. It was the ultimate romance of a degraded and brutalized society. The Roman people, victors once, now vile and base, could now only be amused by sanguinary melodrama. Fables must be made realities, and the criminal must gracefully transform his supreme agonies into amusements for the multitude by becoming a gladiator or a tragedian. Such were the spectacles at which Nero loved to gaze through his emerald eyeglass. And worse things than these, things indescribable, unutterable. Infamous mythologies were enacted, in which women must play their part in torments of shamefulness, more intolerable than death. A St. Peter must hang upon the cross in Pinkian Gardens, as a real Aureolus upon the stage. A Christian boy must be the Icarus, and a Christian man the Scavola, or the Hercules, or the Orpheus of the amphitheatre. And Christian women, modest maidens, holy matrons, must be made the Donaids, or the Proserpines, or worse and play their parts as priestesses of Saturn and Ceres and in blood-stained dramas of the dead. No wonder that Nero became, to Christian imagination, the very incarnation of evil, the Antichrist, the wild beast from the abyss, the delegate of the great red dragon, with a diadem and a name of blasphemy upon his brow. No wonder that he left a furrow of horror in the hearts of men, and that ten centuries after his death, the Church of St. Maria del Popolo had to be built by Pope Pascal II to exorcise from Christian Rome his restless and miserable ghost. And it struck them with deeper horror to see that the Antichrist, so far from being abhorred, was generally popular. He was popular because he presented to the degraded populace their own image and similitude, the frog-like, unclean spirits which proceeded, as it were, out of his mouth, were potent with these dwellers in an atmosphere of pestilence. They had lost all love for freedom and nobleness. They cared only for doles and excitement. Even when the infamies of the Petronius had been superseded by the murderous orgies of Tigellinus, Nero was still everywhere welcomed with shouts as a god on earth, and saluted on all coins as Apollo, as Hercules, as the savior of the world. The poets still assured him that there were no deity in heaven who would not think it an honor to concede to him his prerogatives, that if he did not place himself well in the center of Olympus, the equilibrium of the universe would be destroyed. Victims were slain along his path, and altars raised for him. For this wretch, whom an honest slave could not but despise and loathe, as though he was too great for mere human honors. Nay more, he found adorers and imitators of his execrable example. An Otto, a Vitellius, a Domitian, a Commodus, a Caracalla, a Heliogobulus, to poison the air of the world. The lusts and hungers and furies of the world lamented him, and cherished his memory, and longed for his return. And yet, though all bad men, who were the majority, 
admired and even loved him, he died the death of a dog. Tremendous as was the power of imperialism, the Romans often treated their individual emperors as Nero himself treated the Syrian goddess, whose image he first worshipped with awful veneration, and then subjected to the most grotesque indignities. For retribution did not linger, and the vengeance fell at once on the guilty emperor and the guilty city. Careless seems the great avenger. History's pages but record one. Death grapple in the darkness, twixt false systems and the word. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. Yet the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God, within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. The air was full of prodigies. There were rubble storms. The plague wrought fearful ravages. Rumors spread from lip to lip. Men spoke of monstrous births, of deaths by lightning under strange circumstances, of a brazen statue of Nero melted by the flash of places struck by the brand of heaven in fourteen regions of the city, of sudden darkenings of the sun, a hurricane devastated Campania, comets blazed in the heavens, earthquakes shook the ground, on all sides were the traces of deep uneasiness and superstitious terror. To all these portents, which were accepted as true by Christians as well as by pagans, the Christians would give a specifically terrible significance. They strengthened their conviction that the coming of the Lord drew nigh. They convinced the better sort of pagans that the hour of their deliverance from a tyranny so monstrous and so disgraceful was near at hand. In spite of the shocking servility with which alike the Senate and the people had welcomed him back to the city with shouts of triumph, Nero felt that the air of Rome was heavy with curses against his name. He withdrew to Naples and he was at supper there on March 19th, A.D. 68, the anniversary of his mother's murder, when he heard that the first note of revolt had been sounded by the brave C. Julius Vindex, prefect of Father Gaul. He was so far from being disturbed by the news that he showed a secret joy at the thought that he could now order Gaul to be plundered. For eight days he took no notice of the matter. He was only roused to send an address to the Senate because Vindex wounded his vanity by calling him a Hino Barbus, a bad singer. But when messenger after messenger came from the provinces with tidings of menace, he hurried back to Rome. At last, when he heard that Virginius Rufus had also rebelled in Germany and Galba in Spain, he became aware of the desperate nature of his position. On receiving this intelligence, he fainted away and remained for some time unconscious. He continued indeed his grossness and frivolity, but the wildest and fiercest schemes chased each other through his melodramatic brain. He would slay all the exiles. He would give up all the provinces to plunder. He would order all the Gauls in the city to be butchered. He would have all the senators invited to banquets and would then poison them. He would have the city set on fire and the wild beasts of the amphitheater let loose among the people. He would depose both the consuls and become sole consul himself, since legend said that only by a consul could Gauls be conquered. He would go with an army to the province, and when he got there would do nothing but weep, and when he had thus moved the rebels to compassion, would next day sing with them at a great festival, the Ode of Victory, which he must at once compose. Not a single manly resolution lent a moment's dignity to his miserable fall. Sometimes he talked of escaping to Ostia and arming the sailors, at others of escaping to Alexandria and earning his bread by his divine voice. Meanwhile, he was hourly subjected to the deadliest insults and terrified by dreams and omens so somber that his faith in the astrologers, who had promised him the government of the East and the kingdom of Jerusalem, began to be rudely shaken. When he heard that not a single army or general remained faithful to him, he kicked over the table at which he was dining, dashed to pieces on the ground two favorite goblets embossed with scenes from the Homeric poems, and placed in a golden box some poison furnished to him by Locusta. The last effort which he contemplated was to mount the rostra, beg pardon of the people for his crimes, 
ask them to try him again, and at the worst, to allow him the prefecture of Egypt. But this design he did not dare to carry out, from fear that he would be torn to pieces before he reached the forum. Meanwhile, he found that the palace had been deserted by his guards, and that his attendants had robbed his chamber, even in the golden box in which he had stored his poison. Rushing out, as though to drown himself in the Tiber, he changed his mind, and begged for some quiet hiding place in which to collect his thoughts. The freedman Phaon offered him a lowly villa about four miles from the city. Barefooted and with a faded coat thrown over his tunic, he hid his head and face in a kerchief and rode away with only four attendants. On the road he heard the tumult of the Praetorians cursing his name. Amid evil omens and serious perils he reached the back of Phaon's villa, and, creeping toward it through a muddy reed-bed, was secretly admitted into one of its mean slave chambers, by an aperture through which he had to crawl on his hands and feet. There is no need to dwell on the miserable spectacle of his end, perhaps the meanest and most pusillanimous which had ever been recorded. The poor wretch who without a pang had caused so many brave Romans and so many innocent Christians to be murdered could not summon up resolution to die. He devised every operatic incident of which he could think. When even his most degraded slaves urged him to have sufficient manliness to save himself from the fearful infamies which otherwise awaited him, he ordered his grave to be dug, and fragments of marble to be collected for its adornment, and water and wood for its funeral pyre, perpetually whining, What an artist to perish! Meanwhile, a courier arrived for Phaon. Nero snatched his dispatches out of his hand and read, that the Senate had decided that he should be punished in the ancestral fashion as a public enemy. Asking what the ancestral fashion was, he was informed that he would be stripped naked and scourged to death with rods, with his head thrust into a fork. Horrified at this, he seized two daggers, and after theatrically trying their edges, sheathed them again, with the excuse that the fatal moment had not yet arrived. Then he bade Sporus begin to sing his funeral song, and begged someone to show him how to die. Even his own intense shame at his cowardice was an insufficient stimulus, and he whiled away the time in vapid epigrams and pompous quotations. The sound of horses' hoofs then broke on his ears, and, venting one more Greek quotation, he held the dagger to his throat. It was driven home by Epaphroditus, one of his literary slaves. At this moment the centurion who came to arrest him rushed in, Nero was not yet dead, and under pretense of helping him, the centurion began to stanch the wound with his cloak. Too late, he said. Is this your fidelity? So he died, and the bystanders were horrified with the way in which his eyes seemed to be staring out of his head in a rigid stare. He had begged that his body might be burned without posthumous insults, and this was conceded by Isilus, the freedman of Galbo. So died the last of the Caesars. And as Robespierre was lamented by his landlady, so even Nero was tenderly buried by two nurses who had known him in the exquisite beauty of his engaging childhood, and by Acta, who had inspired his youth with a genuine love. But his history does not end with his grave. He was to live on in the expectation alike of Jews and Christians, the fifth head of the wild beast of the Revelation was in some sort to reappear as the eighth. The head, with its diadem and its names of blasphemy, had been wounded to death, but in the apocalyptic sense the deadly wound was to be healed. The Roman world could not believe that the heir of the defied Julian race could be cut off thus suddenly and obscurely and vanish like foam upon the water. The Christians felt sure that it required something more than an ordinary death-stroke to destroy the Antichrist, and to end the vitality of the wild beast from the abyss, who had been the first to set himself in deadly antagonism against the Redeemer and to wage war upon the saints of God. End of section 14《セクション15of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3。This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rood. The Great Jewish Revolt. Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 1. From A.D. 66, events of great moment occurred in Palestine. The Jews were in the throes of revolt against the Roman government. At the same time, the chief factions of the Revolutionary Party were constantly fighting each other. One of these factions was led by the famous John of Giscala, another by Simon Bargioras, and a third by Eleazar. These factions of a party, which, since the reduction of Judea to a Roman province soon after the death of Herod, had resisted the oppression of the procurators, were now stirred to revolt by the exactions of the procurator, Gessius Florus. The revolutionary party, called the Zealots, gained power, and there were many outbreaks in Jerusalem. The council of the more prudent spirits was disregarded. At last, Roman blood was shed. The nobility and priesthood played into the hands of the zealots by applying to Florus to put down the revolt. Florus marched against Jerusalem and was badly beaten by the zealots. Open war henceforth existed. Josephus, a Jew of the lineage of Aaron, trained according to the best discipline of his race, and who had also been well received at Rome, was placed by his countrymen in command of the province of Galilee. Afterward, as a historian, he described the events of the war. Vespasian, who was then Rome's greatest general, soon came at the head of 60,000 Roman soldiers. He attacked Galilee. Josephus, with such followers as he could gather, took position on an almost inaccessible hill in Jotapata, which the Romans for five days stormed in vain, then besieged its brave defenders, afterward repeatedly assaulted, and finally, during the night following the 47th day of the siege, Titus, serving under his father Vespasian, gained possession of the place. Josephus, with forty of the principal citizens, hid in a cave, but their refuge was discovered through treachery. Vespasian was anxious to take Josephus alive. He sent the tribune Nicanor, who had been his friend, to the Jewish leader to induce him with fair promises to surrender. Josephus was about to give himself up, but was prevented by his companions. We will care for the honor of our country, they said. At the same time, they offered a sword and a hand that shall use it against thee. Josephus then proposed that they should all die together, but by the hands of one another instead of suicide. Lots were cast. He who drew the first offered his neck to him who stood next, and so forward. Finally, through marvelous fortune, Josephus and one other alone were left, and here the slaughter ended. The two survivors surrendered to the Romans. Loud cries for the death of Josephus arose, but he was spared by the intercession of Titus. The fall of Jotapata led to the subjugation of Galilee. When captured, Josephus made to Vespasian the prophecy, Thou shalt be emperor, thou and thy son after thee, a prediction soon to be fulfilled, for in A.D. 69 Vespasian was proclaimed emperor, and the next year went to Rome, leaving Titus to carry on the war and subdue Jerusalem. Vespasian himself, it is recorded, released Josephus, cutting off his chains, thus relieving him from all stain of dishonor. The capture of Jerusalem by Titus in this campaign, says Hosmer, is one of the most memorable events in the history of mankind. It caused the expulsion of an entire race from its home. The Roman valor, skill, and persistence were never more conspicuously displayed. 
no more desperate resistance was ever opposed to the eagle-emblemed mistress of the ancient world there is no event of ancient history the details of which are more minutely known the circumstances in all their appalling features are given to us by the eyewitness josephus so that we know them as vividly as we do the events of the career of grant the legions had orders to encamp at the distance of six furlongs from jerusalem at the mount called the mount of olives which lies over against the city on the east side and is parted from it by a deep valley interposed between them which is named cedron now when hitherto the several parties in the city had been dashing one against another perpetually this foreign war now suddenly come upon them after a violent manner put the first stop to their contentions one against another and as the seditious now saw with astonishment the romans pitching three several camps they began to think of an awkward sort of concord and said one to another what do we hear and what do we mean when we suffer three fortified walls to be built to coop us in that we shall not be able to breathe freely while the enemy is securely building a kind of city in opposition to us and while we sit still within our own walls and become spectators only of what they are doing with our hands idle and our armor laid by as if they were about somewhat that was for our good and advantage we are it seems so did they cry out only courageous against ourselves while the romans are likely to gain the city without bloodshed by our sedition thus did they encourage one another when they were gotten together and took their armor immediately and ran out upon the tenth legion and fell upon the romans with great eagerness and with a prodigious shout as they were fortifying their camp these romans were caught in different parties and this in order to perform their several works and on that account had in great measure laid aside their arms for they thought the jews would not have ventured to make a sally upon them and had they been disposed so to do they supposed their sedition would have distracted them so they were put into disorder unexpectedly when some of them left their works they were about and immediately marched off while many ran to their arms but were smitten and slain before they could turn back upon the enemy the jews became still more and more in number as encouraged by the good success of those that first made the attack and while they had such good fortune they seemed both to themselves and to the enemy to be many more than they really were the disorderly way of their fighting at first put the romans also to a stand who had been constantly used to fight skilfully in good order and with keeping their ranks and obeying the orders that were given them for which reason the romans were caught unexpectedly and were obliged to give way to the assaults that were made upon them now when these romans were overtaken and turned back upon the jews they put a stop to their career yet when they did not take care enough of themselves through the vehemency of their pursuit they were wounded by them but as still more and more jews sallied out of the city the romans were at length brought into confusion and put to flight and ran away from their camp nay things looked as though the entire legion would have been in danger unless titus had been informed of the case they were in and had sent them succors immediately so he reproached them for their cowardice and brought those back that were running away and fell himself upon the jews on their flank with those select troops that were with him and slew a considerable number and wounded more of them and put them all to flight and made them run away hastily down the valley now as these jews suffered greatly in the declivity of the valley so when they were gotten over it they turned about and stood over against the romans having the valley between them and there fought with them thus did they continue the fight till noon but when it was already a little after noon titus set those that came to the assistance of the romans with him and those that belonged to the cohorts to prevent the jews from making any more sallies and then sent the rest of the legion to the upper part of the mountain to fortify their camp 
this march of the Romans seemed to the Jews to be a flight, and as the watchman who was placed upon the wall gave a signal by shaking his garment, there came out a fresh multitude of Jews, and that with such mighty violence that one might compare it to the running of the most terrible wild beasts. To say the truth, none of those that opposed them could sustain the fury with which they made their attacks, but, as if they had been cast out of an engine, they brake the enemy's ranks to pieces, who were put to flight, and ran away to the mountain, none but Titus himself and a few others with him being left in the midst of the acclivity. Now, these others, who were his friends, despised the danger they were in, and were ashamed to leave their general, earnestly exhorting him to give way to these Jews that are fond of dying, and not to run into such dangers before those that ought to stay before him, to consider what his fortune was, and not, by supplying the place of a common soldier, to venture to turn back upon the enemy so suddenly, and this because he was general in the war, and lord of the habitable earth, on whose preservation the public affairs do all depend. These persuasions Titus seemed not so much as to hear, but opposed those that ran upon him and smote them on the face, and when he had forced them to go back, he slew them. He also fell upon great numbers as they marched down the hill and thrust them forward, while those men were so amazed at his courage and his strength that they could not fly directly to the city, but declined from him on both sides, and pressed after those that fled up the hill. Yet did he still fall upon their flank, and put a stop to their fury. In the meantime, a disorder and a terror fell again upon those that were fortifying their camp at the top of the hill, upon their seeing those beneath them running away, insomuch that the whole legion was dispersed, while they thought that the sallies of the Jews upon them were plainly insupportable, and that Titus was himself put to flight, because they took it for granted that if he had stayed, the rest would never have fled for it. Thus were they encompassed on every side by a kind of panic fear, and some dispersed themselves one way, and some another, till certain of them saw their general in the very midst of an action, and being under great concern for him, they loudly proclaimed the danger he was in to the entire legion, and now shame made them turn back, and they reproached one another that they did worse than run away by deserting Caesar. So they used their utmost force against the Jews, and declining from the straight declivity, they drove them on heaps into the bottom of the valley. Then did the Jews turn about and fight them, but as they were themselves retiring, and now because the Romans had the advantage of the ground and were above the Jews, they drove them all into the valley. As now the war abroad ceased for a while, the sedition within was revived, and on the feast of unleavened bread, which was now come, it being the fourteenth day of the month Xanthicus, Nisan, when it is believed the Jews were first freed from the Egyptians, Eleazar and his party opened the gates of this inmost court of the temple and admitted such of the people as were desirous to worship God into it. But John made use of this festival as a cloak for his treacherous designs, and armed the most inconsiderable of his own party, the greater part of whom were not purified, with weapons concealed under their garments, and sent them with great zeal into the temple, in order to seize upon it, which armed men, when they were gotten in, threw their garments away, and presently appeared in their armor. Upon which there was a very great disorder and disturbance about the holy house, while the people, who had no concern in the sedition, supposed that this assault was made against all without distinction, as the zealots thought it was made against themselves only. So these left off guarding the gates any longer, and leaped down from their battlements before they came to an engagement, 
and fled away into the subterranean caverns of the temple, while the people that stood trembling at the altar and about the holy house were rolled on heaps together and trampled upon, and were beaten both with wooden and with iron weapons without mercy. Such also, as had differences with others, slew many persons that were quiet, out of their own private enmity and hatred, as if they were opposite to the seditious. And all those that had formerly offended any of these plotters were now known, and were now led away to the slaughter, and when they had done abundance of horrid mischief to the guiltless, they granted a truce to the guilty, and let those go off that came out of the caverns. These followers of John also did now seize upon this inner temple, and upon all the warlike engines therein, and then ventured to oppose Simon. And thus that sedition, which had been divided into three factions, was now reduced to two. But Titus, intending to pitch his camp nearer to the city than Scopus, placed as many of his choice horsemen and footmen as he thought sufficient opposite to the Jews to prevent their sallying out upon them, while he gave orders for the whole army to level the distance as far as the wall of the city. So they threw down all the hedges and walls which the inhabitants had made about their gardens and groves of trees, and cut down all the fruit trees that lay between them and the wall of the city, and filled up all the hollow places and the chasms, and demolished the rocky precipices with iron instruments, and thereby made all the place level from Scopus to Herod's monuments, which adjoined to the pool called the Serpent's Pool. Now, at this very time, the Jews contrived the following stratagem against the Romans. The bolder sort of the seditious went out at the towers, called the women's towers, as if they had been ejected out of the city by those who were for peace, and rambled about as if they were afraid of being assaulted by the Romans, and were in fear of one another, while those that stood upon the wall, and seemed to be of the people's side, cried out aloud for peace, and entreated they might have security for their lives given them, and called for the Romans, promising to open the gates to them. And as they cried out after that manner, they threw stones at their own people, as though they would drive them away from the gates. These also pretended that they were excluded by force, and that they petitioned those that were within to let them in. And rushing upon the Romans perpetually with violence, they then came back, and seemed to be in great disorder. Now the Roman soldiers thought this cunning stratagem of theirs was to be believed real, and thinking they had the one party under their power, and could punish them as they pleased, and, hoping that the other party would open their gates to them, set to the execution of their designs accordingly. But for Titus himself, he had this surprising conduct of the Jews in suspicion, for whereas he had invited them to come to terms of accommodation by Josephus but one day before, he could then receive no civil answer from them, so he ordered the soldiers to stay where they were. However, some of them that were set in the front of the works prevented him, and catching up their arms, ran to the gates, whereupon those that seemed to have been ejected at the first retired. But as soon as the soldiers were gotten between the towers on each side of the gate, the Jews ran out and encompassed them round, and fell upon them behind, while that multitude which stood upon the wall threw a heap of stones and darts of all kinds at them, insomuch that they slew a considerable number, and wounded many more, for it was not easy for the Romans to escape. By reason, those behind them pressed them forward. Besides which, the shame they were under for being mistaken, and the fear they were in of their commanders, engaged them to persevere in their mistake. Wherefore they fought with their spears a great while, and received many blows from the Jews, though indeed they gave them as many blows again, and at last repelled those that had encompassed them about, while the Jews pursued them as they retired, and followed them, and threw darts at them as far as the monuments of Queen Helena. Now the warlike men that were in the city, and the multitude of the seditious that were with Simon, 
were 10,000 besides the Idumeans. Those 10,000 had 50 commanders, over whom this Simon was supreme. The Idumeans that paid him homage were 5,000, and had eight commanders, among whom those of greatest fame were Jacob, the son of Sosas, and Simon, the son of Cathlas. John, who had seized upon the temple, had 6,000 armed men under 20 commanders. The zealots also that had come over to him and left off their opposition were 2,400 and had the same commander that they had formerly, Eleazar, together with Simon, the son of Aranus. Now, while these factions fought one against another, the people were their prey on both sides, and that part of the people who would not join with them in their wicked practices were plundered by both factions. Simon held the upper city and the great wall as far as Cedron, and as much of the old wall as bent from Siloam to the east, and which went down to the palace of Monobazus, who was king of the Adiabeni, beyond Euphrates. He also held that fountain and the Acra, which was no other than the lower city. He also held all that reached to the palace of Queen Helena, the mother of Monobazus. But John held the temple, and the parts thereto adjoining for a great way, as also Ophla, and the valley called the Valley of Cedron. And when the parts that were interposed between their possessions were burned by them, they left a space wherein they might fight with each other. For this internal sedition did not cease even when the Romans were encamped near their very walls. But although they had grown wiser at the first onset the Romans made upon them, this lasted but a while, for they returned to their former madness, and separated one from another, and fought it out, and did everything that the besiegers could desire them to do, for they never suffered anything that was worse from the Romans than they made each other suffer, nor was there any misery endured by the city after these men's actions that could be esteemed new. But it was most of all unhappy before it was overthrown, while those that took it did it a greater kindness. For I venture to affirm that the sedition destroyed the city, and the Romans destroyed the sedition, which it was a much harder thing to do than to destroy the walls, so that we may justly ascribe our misfortunes to our own people, and the just vengeance taken on them to the Romans, as to which matter let every one determine by the actions on both sides. Now, when affairs within the city were in this posture, Titus went round the city on the outside with some chosen horsemen, and looked about for a proper place where he might make an impression upon the walls. But as he was in doubt where he could possibly make an attack on any side, for the place was no way accessible where the valleys were, and, on the other side, the first wall appeared too strong to be shaken by the engines, he thereupon thought it best to make his assault upon the monument of John, the high priest, for there it was that the first fortification was lower, and the second was not joined to it the builders neglecting to build strong where the new city was not much inhabited. Here also was an easy passage to the third wall, through which he thought to take the upper city, and through the tower of Antonia, the temple itself. But at this time, as he was going round about the city, one of his friends, whose name was Nicanor, was wounded with a dart on his left shoulder. As he approached, together with Josephus, too near the wall, and attempted to discourse to those that were upon the wall about terms of peace, for he was a person known by them. On this account it was that Caesar, as soon as he knew their vehemence, that they would not bear even such as approach them to persuade them what tended to their own preservation, was provoked to press on the siege. He also, at the same time, gave his soldiers leave to set the suburbs on fire, and ordered that they should bring timber together, and raise banks against the city. And when he had parted his army into three parts, in order to set about those works, he placed those that shot darts, and the archers in the midst of the banks that were then raising, 
before whom he placed those engines that threw javelins and darts and stones, that he might prevent the enemy from sallying out upon their works, and might hinder those that were upon the wall from being able to obstruct them. So the trees were now cut down immediately, and the suburbs left naked. But now, while the timber was being carried to raise the banks, and the whole army was earnestly engaged in their works, the Jews were not, however, quiet. And it happened that the people of Jerusalem, who had been hitherto plundered and murdered, were now of good courage, and supposed they should have a breathing time, while the others were very busy in opposing their enemies without the city, and that they should now be avenged on those that had been the authors of their miseries, in case the Romans did but get the victory. However, John stayed behind, out of his fear of Simon, even while his own men were earnest in making a sally upon their enemies without. Yet did not Simon lie still, for he lay near the place of the siege. He brought his engines of war, and disposed of them at due distances upon the wall, both those which they took from Cestius formerly, and those which they got when they seized the garrison that lay in the tower Antonia. But though they had these engines in their possession, they had so little skill in using them that they were in great measure useless to them. But a few there were who had been taught by deserters how to use them, which they did use, though after an awkward manner. So they cast stones and arrows at those that were making the banks. They also ran out upon them by companies and fought with them. Now those that were at work covered themselves with hurdles spread over their banks, and their engines were opposed to them when they made their excursions. The engines, that all the legions had ready prepared for them, were admirably contrived, but still more extraordinary ones belonged to the tenth legion. Those that threw darts and those that threw stones were more forcible and larger than the rest, by which they not only repelled the excursions of the Jews, but drove those away that were upon the walls also. Now the stones that were cast were of the weight of a talent, and were carried two furlongs and farther. The blow they gave was no way to be sustained, not only by those that stood first in the way, but by those that were beyond them for a great space. As for the Jews, they at first watched the coming of the stone, for it was of a white color, and could therefore not only be perceived by the great noise it made, but could be seen also before it came, by its brightness. Accordingly, the watchmen that sat upon the towers gave them notice when the engine was let go, and the stone came from it, and cried out aloud in their own country language, The sun cometh! So those that were in its way stood off, and threw themselves down upon the ground by which means, and by their thus guarding themselves, the stone fell down and did them no harm. But the Romans contrived how to prevent that, by blacking the stone, who then could aim at them with success when the stone was not discerned beforehand as it had been till then, and so they destroyed many of them at one blow. Yet did not the Jews under all this distress permit the Romans to raise their banks in quiet, but they shrewdly and boldly exerted themselves and repelled them both by night and by day. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 16 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Root. The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70. By Josephus. Part 2. And now, upon the finishing the Roman works, the workmen measured the distance there was from the wall, and this, by lead and a line which they threw to it from their banks, for they could not measure it any otherwise, 
because the Jews would shoot at them if they came to measure it themselves. And when they found that the engines could reach the wall, they brought them thither. Then did Titus set his engines, at proper distances, so much nearer to the wall that the Jews might not be able to repel them, and gave orders they should go to work. And when, thereupon, a prodigious noise echoed round about from three places, and that, on a sudden, there was a great noise made by the citizens that were within the city, and no less a terror fell upon the seditious themselves. Whereupon both sorts, seeing the common danger they were in, contrived to make a like defense. So those of different factions cried out one to another that they acted entirely as in concert with their enemies, whereas they ought, however, notwithstanding God did not grant them a lasting concord in their present circumstances, to lay aside their enmities one against another, and to unite together against the Romans. Accordingly, Simon gave those that came from the temple leave, by proclamation, to go upon the wall. John also himself, though he could not believe Simon was in earnest, gave them the same leave. So on both sides they laid aside their hatred and their peculiar quarrels, and formed themselves into one body. They then ran round the walls, and, having a vast number of torches with them, threw them at the machines, and shot darts perpetually upon those that impelled those engines which battered the wall. Nay, the bolder sort leaped out by troops upon the hurdles that covered the machines, and pulled them to pieces, and fell upon those that belonged to them, and beat them, not so much by any skill they had as principally by the boldness of their attacks. However, Titus himself still sent assistance to those that were the hardest beset, and placed both horsemen and archers on the several sides of the engines, and thereby beat off those that brought the fire to them. He also thereby repelled those that shot stones or darts from the towers, and then set the engines to work in good earnest. Yet did not the wall yield to these blows, excepting where the battering ram of the 15th legion moved the corner of a tower, while the wall itself continued unhurt. For the wall was not presently in the same danger with the tower, which was extant far above it. Nor could the fall of that part of the tower easily break down any part of the wall itself together with it. And now the Jews intermitted their sallies for a while, but when they observed the Romans dispersed all abroad at their works, and in their several camps, for they thought the Jews had retired out of weariness and fear, they all at once made a sally at the tower Hippicus, through an obscure gate, and at the same time brought fire to burn the works, and went boldly up to the Romans, and to their very fortifications themselves, where, at the cry they made, those that were near them came presently to their assistance, and those farther off came running after them. And here the boldness of the Jews was too hard for the good order of the Romans, and as they beat those whom they first fell upon, so they pressed upon those that were now gotten together. So this fight about the machines was very hot, while the one side tried hard to set them on fire, and the other side to prevent it. On both sides there was a confused cry made, and many of those in the forefront of the battle were slain. However, the Jews were now too hard for the Romans by the furious assaults they made like madmen, and the fire caught hold of the works, and both all those works and the engines themselves had been in danger of being burned, had not many of those select soldiers that came from Alexandria opposed themselves to prevent it, and had they not behaved themselves with greater courage than they themselves supposed they could have done, for they outdid those in this fight that had greater reputation than themselves. This was the state of things till Caesar took the stoutest of his horsemen and attacked the enemy, while he himself slew twelve of those that were in the forefront of the Jews, which death of these men, when the rest of the multitude saw, they gave way, and he pursued them, and drove them all into the city, and saved the works from the fire. Now, it happened at this fight, 
that a certain Jew was taken alive who, by Titus's order, was crucified before the wall to see whether the rest of them would be affrighted and abate of their obstinacy. But after the Jews were retired, John, who was commander of the Idumeans, and was talking to a certain soldier of his acquaintance before the wall, was wounded by a dart shot at him by an Arabian, and died immediately, leaving the greatest lamentation to the Jews, and sorrow to the seditious, for he was a man of great eminence, both for his actions and his conduct also. Now, on the next night, a surprising disturbance fell upon the Romans, for whereas Titus had given orders for the erection of three towers of fifty cubits high, that, by setting men upon them at every bank, he might from thence drive those away who were upon the wall, it so happened that one of these towers fell down about midnight, and as its fall made a very great noise, fear fell upon the army, and they, supposing that the enemy was coming to attack them, ran all to their arms. Whereupon a disturbance and a tumult arose among the legions, and as nobody could tell what had happened, they went on after a disconsolate manner, and, seeing no enemy appear, they were afraid one of another, and every one demanded of his neighbor the watchword with great earnestness, as though the Jews had invaded their camp. And now were they like people under a panic fear, until Titus was informed of what had happened, and gave orders that all should be acquainted with it. And then, though with some difficulty, they got clear of the disturbance they had been under. Now, these towers were very troublesome to the Jews, who otherwise opposed the Romans very courageously, for they shot at them out of their lighter engines from those towers, as they did also by those that threw darts, and the archers, and those that flung stones. For neither could the Jews reach those that were over them by reason of their height, and it was not practicable to take them, nor to overturn them, they were so heavy, nor to set them on fire, because they were covered with plates of iron. So they retired out of the reach of the darts, and did no longer endeavor to hinder the impression of their rams, which, by continually beating upon the wall, did gradually prevail against it, so that the wall already gave way to the Nico, for by that name did the Jews themselves call the greatest of their engines, because it conquered all things. And now they were for a long while grown weary of fighting and of keeping guards, and were retired to lodge in the night-time at a distance from the wall. It was on other accounts also thought by them to be superfluous to guard the wall, there being besides that two other fortifications still remaining, and they being slothful, and their counsels having been ill-concerted on all occasions, so a great many grew lazy and retired. Then the Romans mounted the breach where Nico had made one, and all the Jews left the guarding that wall and retreated to the second wall. So those that had gotten over that wall opened the gates and received all the army within it. And thus did the Romans get possession of this first wall, on the fifteenth day of the siege, which was the seventh day of the month Artemisius, Giar, when they demolished a great part of it, as well as they did of the northern parts of the city, which had been demolished also by Cestius formerly. And now Titus pitched his camp within the city, at that place which was called the Camp of the Assyrians, having seized upon all that lay as far as Cedron, but took care to be out of the reach of the Jews' darts. He then presently began his attacks, upon which the Jews divided themselves into several bodies, and courageously defended that wall, while John and his faction did it from the Tower of Antonia, and from the northern cloister of the temple, and fought the Romans before the monuments of King Alexander. And Simon's army also took for their share the spot of ground that was near John's monument, and fortified it as far as to that gate where water was brought in to the tower Hippicus. However, 
the Jews made violent sallies, and that frequently also, and in bodies together out of the gates, and there fought the Romans. And when they were pursued all together to the wall, they were beaten in those fights as wanting the skill of the Romans. But when they fought them from the walls, they were too hard for them. The Romans, being encouraged by their power, joined to their skill, as were the Jews, by their boldness, which was nourished by the fear they were in, and that hardiness which is natural to our nation under calamities. They were also encouraged still by the hope of deliverance, as were the Romans by their hopes of subduing them in a little time. Nor did either side grow weary, but attacks and fightings upon the wall, and perpetual sallies out in bodies, were there all the day long. Nor were there any sort of warlike engagements that were not then put in use. And the night itself had much ado to part them, when they began to fight in the morning. Nay, the night itself was passed without sleep on both sides, and was more uneasy than the day to them, while the one was afraid lest the wall should be taken, and the other lest the Jews should make sallies upon their camps. Both sides also lay in their armor during the night time, and thereby were ready at the first appearance of light to go to the battle. Now among the Jews, the ambition was who should undergo the first dangers, and thereby gratify their commanders. Above all, they had a great veneration and dread of Simon, and to that degree he was regarded by every one of those that were under him, that at his command they were very ready to kill themselves with their own hands. What made the Romans so courageous was their usual custom of conquering and disuse of being defeated, their constant wars and perpetual warlike exercises, and the grandeur of their dominion. And what was now their chief encouragement? Titus, who was present everywhere with them all, for it appeared a terrible thing to grow weary while Caesar was there, and fought bravely as well as they did, was himself at once an eyewitness of such as behaved themselves valiantly, and he was to reward them also. It was, besides, esteemed an advantage at present to have any one's valor known by Caesar, on which account many of them appeared to have more alacrity than strength to answer it. And now, as the Jews were about this time standing in array before the wall, and that in a strong body, and while both parties were throwing their darts at each other, Longinus, one of the equestrian order, leaped out of the army of the Romans, and leaped into the very midst of the army of the Jews. And as they dispersed themselves upon this attack, he slew two of their men of the greatest courage. One of them he struck in his mouth as he was coming to meet him. The other was slain by him by that very dart which he drew out of the body of the other, with which he ran this man through his side as he was running away from him. And when he had done this, he first of all ran out of the midst of his enemies to his own side. So this man signalized himself for his valor, and many there were who were ambitious of gaining the like reputation. And now the Jews were unconcerned at what they suffered themselves from the Romans, and were only solicitous about what mischief they could do them, and death itself seemed a small matter to them, if at the same time they could but kill any one of their enemies. But Titus took care to secure his own soldiers from harm, as well as to have them overcome their enemies. He also said that inconsiderate violence was madness, and that this alone was the true courage that was joined with good conduct. He therefore commanded his men to take care, when they fought their enemies, that they received no harm from them at the same time, and thereby show themselves to be truly valiant men. And now Titus brought one of his engines to the middle tower of the north part of the wall, in which a certain crafty Jew, whose name was Castor, lay in ambush, with ten others like himself, the rest being fled away by reason of the archers. These men lay still for a while, as in great fear, under their breastplates. But when the tower was shaken, they arose, and Castor did then stretch out his hand, as a petitioner, and called for Caesar, and by his voice moved his compassion, 
and begged of him to have mercy upon them and titus in the innocency of his heart believing him to be in earnest and hoping that the jews did now repent stopped the working of the battering ram and forbade them to shoot at the petitioners and bid castor say what he had a mind to say to him he said that he would come down if he would give him his right hand for his security to which titus replied that he was well pleased with such his agreeable conduct and would be well pleased if all the jews would be of his mind and that he was ready to give the like security to the city now five of the ten dissembled with him and pretended to beg for mercy while the rest cried out aloud that they would never be slaves to the romans while it was in their power to die in a state of freedom now while these men were quarrelling for a long while the attack was delayed castor also sent to simon and told him that they might take some time for consultation about what was to be done because he would elude the power of the romans for a considerable time and at the same time that he sent thus to him he appeared openly to exhort those that were obstinate to accept of titus's hand for their security but they seemed very angry at it and brandished their naked swords upon the breastworks and struck themselves upon their breast and fell down as if they had been slain hereupon titus and those with him were amazed at the courage of the men and as they were not able to see exactly what was done they admired at their great fortitude and pitied their calamity during this interval a certain person shot a dart at castor and wounded him in his nose whereupon he presently pulled out the dart and showed it to titus and complained that this was unfair treatment so caesar reproved him that shot the dart and sent josephus who then stood by him to give his right hand to castor but josephus said that he would not go to him because these pretended petitioners meant nothing that was good he also restrained those friends of his who were zealous to go to him but still there was one aeneas a deserter who said he would go to him castor also called to them that somebody should come and receive the money which he had with him this made aeneas the more earnestly to run to him with his bosom open then did castor take up a great stone and threw it at him which missed him because he guarded himself against it but still it wounded another soldier that was coming to him when caesar understood that this was a delusion he perceived that mercy in war is a pernicious thing because such cunning tricks have less place under the exercise of greater severity so he caused the engine to work more strongly than before on account of his anger at the deceit put upon him but castor and his companions set the tower on fire when it began to give way and leaped through the flame into a hidden vault that was under it which made the romans further suppose that they were men of great courage as having cast themselves into the fire now caesar took this wall there on the fifth day after he had taken the first and when the jews had fled from him he entered into it with a thousand armed men and those of his choice troops and this at a place where were the merchants of wool the braziers and the market for cloth and where the narrow streets led obliquely to the wall wherefore if titus had either demolished a larger part of the wall immediately or had come in and according to the law of war had laid waste what was left his victory would not i suppose have been mixed with any loss to himself but now out of the hope he had that he should make the jews ashamed of their obstinacy by not being willing when he was able to afflict them more than he needed to do he did not widen the breach of the wall in order to make a safer retreat upon occasion for he did not think they would lay snares for him that did them such a kindness when therefore he came in he did not permit his soldiers to kill any of those they caught nor to set fire to their houses neither nay he gave leave to the seditious if they had a mind to fight without any harm to the people and promised to restore the people's effects to them for he was very desirous to preserve the city for his own sake and the temple 
for the sake of the city. As to the people, he had them of a long time ready to comply with his proposals. But as to the fighting men, this humanity of his seemed a mark of his weakness, and they imagined that he made these proposals because he was not able to take the rest of the city. They also threatened death to the people, if they should any one of them say a word about a surrender. They, moreover, cut the throats of such as talked of a peace, and then attacked those Romans that were come within the wall. Some of them they met in the narrow streets, and some they fought against from their houses, while they made a sudden sally out at the upper gates, and assaulted such Romans as were beyond the wall, till those that guarded the wall were so affrighted that they leaped down from their towers and retired to their several camps, upon which a great noise was made by the Romans that were within, because they were encompassed round on every side by their enemies, as also by them that were without, because they were in fear for those that were left in the city. Thus did the Jews grow more numerous perpetually, and had great advantages over the Romans by their full knowledge of those narrow lanes, and they wounded a great many of them, and fell upon them, and drove them out of the city. Now, these Romans were at present forced to make the best resistance they could, for they were not able in great numbers to get out at the breach in the wall it was so narrow. It is also probable that all those that were gotten within had been cut to pieces, if Titus had not sent them succors, for he ordered the archers to stand at the upper ends of these narrow lanes, and he stood himself where was the greatest multitude of his enemies, and with his darts he put a stop to them, as with him did Domitius Sabinus also, a valiant man, and one that in this battle appeared so to be. Thus did Caesar continue to shoot darts at the Jews continually, and to hinder them from coming upon his men, and this until all his soldiers had retreated out of the city. And thus were the Romans driven out, after they had possessed themselves of the second wall. Whereupon the fighting men that were in the city were lifted up in their minds, and were elevated upon this their good success, and began to think that the Romans would never venture to come into the city any more, and that if they kept within it themselves they should not be any more conquered for God had blinded their minds for the transgressions they had been guilty of, nor could they see how much greater forces the Romans had than those that were now expelled, no more than they could discern how a famine was creeping upon them. For hitherto they had fed themselves out of the public miseries and drank the blood of the city. But now poverty had for a long time seized upon the better part, and a great many had died already for want of necessaries, although the seditious indeed supposed the destruction of the people to be an easement to themselves, for they desired that none others might be preserved but such as were against a peace with the Romans, and were resolved to live in opposition to them, and they were pleased when the multitude of those of a contrary opinion were consumed, as being then freed from a heavy burden. And this was their disposition of mind with regard to those that were within the city, while they covered themselves with their armor, and prevented the Romans, when they were trying to get into the city again, and made a wall of their own bodies over against that part of the wall that was cast down. Thus did they valiantly defend themselves for three days, but on the fourth day they could not support themselves against the vehement assaults of Titus, but were compelled by force to fly whither they had fled before, so he quietly possessed himself again of that wall, and demolished it entirely. And when he had put a garrison into the towers that were on the south parts of the city, he contrived how he might assault the third wall. A resolution was now taken by Titus to relax the siege for a little while, and to afford the seditious an interval for consideration, and to see whether the demolishing of their second wall would not make them a little more compliant, or whether they were not somewhat afraid of a famine, because the spoils they had gotten by rapine would not be sufficient for them long. So he made use of this relaxation in order to compass his own designs. Accordingly, as the usual appointed time when he must distribute subsistence money to the soldiers was now come, 
he gave orders that the commanders should put the army into battle array in the face of the enemy and then give every one of the soldiers his pay the romans spent four days in bringing this subsistence money to the several legions but on the fifth day when no signs of peace appeared to come from the jews titus divided his legions and began to raise banks both at the tower of antonia and at john's monument now his designs were to take the upper city at that monument and the temple at the tower of antonia for if the temple were not taken it would be dangerous to keep the city itself so at each of these parts he raised him banks each legion raising one as for those that wrought at john's monument the idumeans and those that were in arms with simon made sallies upon them and put some stop to them while john's party and the multitude of zealots with them did the like to those that were before the tower of antonia these jews were now too hard for the romans not only in direct fighting because they stood upon the higher ground but because they had now learned to use their own engines for their continual use of them one day after another did by degrees improve their skill about them for of one sort of engines for darts they had three hundred and forty for stones by the means of which they made it more tedious for the romans to raise their banks but then titus knowing that the city would be either saved or destroyed for himself did not only proceed earnestly in the siege but did not omit to have the jews exhorted to repentance so he mixed a good counsel with his works for the siege and being sensible that exhortations are frequently more effectual than arms he persuaded them to surrender the city now in a manner already taken and thereby to save themselves and sent josephus to speak to them in their own language for he imagined they might yield to the persuasion of a countryman of their own as josephus was speaking thus with a loud voice the seditious would neither yield to what he said nor did they deem it safe for them to alter their conduct but as for the people they had a great inclination to desert to the romans accordingly some of them sold what they had and even the most precious things that had been laid up as treasures by them for a very small matter and swallowed down pieces of gold that they might not be found out by the robbers and when they had escaped to the romans went to stool and had wherewithal to provide plentifully for themselves for titus let a great number of them go away into the country whither they pleased and the main reasons why they were so ready to desert were these that now they should be freed from those miseries which they had endured in that city and yet should not be in slavery to the romans however john and simon with their factions did more carefully watch these men's going out than they did the coming in of the romans and if any one did but afford the least shadow of suspicion of such an intention his throat was cut immediately but as for the richer sort it proved all one to them whether they stayed in the city or attempted to get out of it for they were equally destroyed in both cases for every such person was put to death under this pretense that they were going to desert but in reality that the robbers might get what they had the madness of the seditious did also increase together with their famine and both those miseries were every day inflamed more and more for there was no corn which anywhere appeared publicly but the robbers came running into and searched men's private houses and then if they found any they tormented them because they had denied they had any and if they found none they tormented them worse because they supposed they had more carefully concealed it the indication they made use of whether they had any or not was taken from the bodies of these miserable wretches which if they were in good case they supposed they were in no want at all of food but if they were wasted away they walked off without searching any further nor did they think it proper to kill such as these because they saw they would very soon die of themselves for want of food many there were indeed who sold what they had for one measure it was of wheat if they were of the richer sort but of barley if they were poorer 
When these had so done, they shut themselves up in the inmost rooms of their houses and ate the corn they had gotten. Some did it without grinding it by reason of the extremity of the want they were in, and others baked bread of it, according as necessity and fear dictated to them. A table was nowhere laid for a distinct meal, but they snatched the bread out of the fire, half-baked, and ate it very hastily. End of section 16. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 17 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rood. The Great Jewish Revolt. Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 3. It was now a miserable case, and a sight that would justly bring tears into our eyes, how men stood as to their food, while the more powerful had more than enough, and the weaker were lamenting for want of it. But the famine was too hard for all other passions, and it is destructive to nothing so much as to modesty, for what was otherwise worthy of reverence was, in this case, despised, insomuch that children pulled the very morsels that their fathers were eating out of their very mouths, and what was still more to be pitied, so did the mothers do as to their infants. And when those that were most dear were perishing under their hands, they were not ashamed to take from them the very last drops that might preserve their lives, and while they ate after this manner, yet were they not concealed in so doing. But the seditious everywhere came upon them immediately, and snatched away from them what they had gotten from others. For when they saw any house shut up, this was to them a signal that the people within had gotten some food, whereupon they broke open the doors, and ran in, and took pieces of what they were eating almost up out of their very throats and this by force. The old men, who held their food fast, were beaten, and if the women hid what they had within their hands, their hair was torn for so doing. Nor was there any commiseration shown either to the aged or to the infants. But they lifted up children from the ground as they hung upon the morsels they had gotten, and shook them down upon the floor." but still they were more barbarously cruel to those that had prevented their coming in, and had actually swallowed down what they were going to seize upon, as if they had been unjustly defrauded of their right. They also invented terrible methods of torments to discover where any food was, and they were these, to stop up the passages of the privy parts of the miserable wretches, and to drive sharp stakes up their fundaments, and a man was forced to bear what it is terrible even to hear, in order to make him confess that he had but one loaf of bread, or that he might discover a handful of barley meal that was concealed. And this was done when these tormentors were not themselves hungry, for the thing had been less barbarous had necessity forced them to it. But this was done to keep their madness in exercise, and as making preparation of provisions for themselves for the following days. These men went also to meet those that had crept out of the city by night, as far as the Roman guards, to gather some plants and herbs that grew wild. And when those people thought they had got clear of the enemy, they snatched from them what they had brought with them, even while they had frequently entreated them, and that by calling upon the tremendous name of God, to give them back some part of what they had brought though these would not give them the least crumb, and they were to be well contented that they were only spoiled and not slain at the same time. It is impossible to go distinctly over every instance of these men's iniquity. I shall therefore speak my mind here at once briefly, that neither did any other city ever suffer such miseries, nor did any age ever breed a generation more fruitful in wickedness than this was from the beginning of the world, Finally, 
they brought the Hebrew nation into contempt, that they might themselves appear comparatively less impious with regard to strangers. They confessed what was true, that they were the slaves, the scum and the spurious and abortive offspring of our nation, while they overthrew the city themselves, and forced the Romans, whether they would or no, to gain a melancholy reputation, by acting gloriously against them, and did almost draw that fire upon the temple which they seemed to think came too slowly. And indeed, when they saw that temple burning from the upper city, they were neither troubled at it, nor did they shed any tears on that account, while yet these passions were discovered among the Romans themselves. So now Titus's banks were advanced a great way, notwithstanding his soldiers had been very much distressed from the wall. He then sent a party of horsemen, and ordered they should lay ambushes for those that went out into the valleys to gather food. Some of these were indeed fighting men, who were not contented with what they got by rapine, but the greater part of them were poor people, who were deterred from deserting by the concern they were under for their own relations, for they could not hope to escape away together with their wives and children without the knowledge of the seditious. Nor could they think of leaving these relations to be slain by the robbers on their account. Nay, the severity of the famine made them bold in thus going out. So nothing remained but that, when they were concealed from the robbers, they should be taken by the enemy, and when they were going to be taken, they were forced to defend themselves for fear of being punished, as after they had fought they thought it too late to make any supplications for mercy. So they were first whipped, and then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died, and were then crucified before the wall of the city. This miserable procedure made Titus greatly to pity them, while they caught every day five hundred Jews. Nay, some days they caught more. Yet it did not appear to be safe for him to let those that were taken by force go their way, and to set a guard over so many he saw would be to make such as guarded them useless to him. The main reason why he did not forbid that cruelty was this, that he hoped the Jews might perhaps yield at that sight, out of fear lest they might themselves afterward be liable to the same cruel treatment. So the soldiers, out of the wrath and hatred they bore the Jews, nailed those they caught one after one way, and another after another, to the crosses by way of jest, when their multitude was so great that room was wanting for the crosses, and crosses wanting for the bodies. But so far were the seditious from repenting at this sad sight, that, on the contrary, they made the rest of the multitude believe otherwise, for they brought the relations of those that had deserted upon the wall, with such of the populace as were very eager to go over upon the security offered them, and showed them what miseries those underwent, who fled to the Romans, and told them that those who were caught were supplicants to them, and not such as were taken prisoners. This sight kept many of those within the city who were so eager to desert, till the truth was known. Yet did some of them run away immediately, as unto certain punishment, esteeming death from their enemies to be a quiet departure, if compared with that by famine. So Titus commanded that the hands of many of those that were caught should be cut off, that they might not be thought deserters, and might be credited on account of the calamity they were under, and sent them in to John and Simon with this exhortation, that they would now at length leave off their madness, and not force him to destroy the city, whereby they would have those advantages of repentance, even in their utmost distress, that they would preserve their own lives, and so find a city of their own, and that temple which was there peculiar. He then went round about the banks that were cast up, and hastened them, in order to show that his words should in no long time be followed by his deeds, in answer to which the seditious cast reproaches upon Caesar himself, and upon his father also, and cried out with a loud voice that they contemned death, and did well in preferring it before slavery, that they would do all the mischief to the Romans they could, while they had breath in them, and that for their own city, since they were, as he said, to be destroyed, they had no concern about it, 
and that the world itself was a better temple to God than this. That yet this temple would be preserved by him that inhabited therein, whom they still had for their assistant in this war, and did therefore laugh at all his threatenings, which would come to nothing, because the conclusion of the whole depended upon God only. These words were mixed with reproaches, and with them they made a mighty clamor. In the meantime, Antiochus Epiphanes came to the city, having with him a considerable number of other armed men, and a band called the Macedonian band about him, all of the same age, tall and just past their childhood, armed and instructed after the Macedonian manner, whence it was that they took that name. Antiochus, with his Macedonians, made a sudden assault upon the wall, and indeed, for his own part, his strength and skill were so great that he guarded himself from the Jewish darts, and yet shot his darts at them, while yet the young men with him were almost all sorely galled, for they had so great a regard to the promises that had been made of their courage, that they would needs persevere in their fighting, and at length many of them retired, but not till they were wounded, and then they perceived that true Macedonians, if they were to be conquerors, must have Alexander's good fortune also. Now, as the Romans began to raise their banks on the twelfth day of the month Artemisius Giar, so had they much ado to finish them by the twenty-ninth day of the same month, after they had labored hard for seventeen days continually. For there were now four great banks raised, one of which was at the Tower Antonia, this was raised by the fifth legion, over against the middle of that pool which was called Struthius. Another was cast up by the twelfth legion at the distance of about twenty cubits from the other. But the labors of the tenth legion, which lay a great way off these, were on the north quarter, and at the pool called Amygdalon, as was that of the fifteenth legion, about thirty cubits from it, and at the high priest's monument. And now, when the engines were brought, John had from within undermined the space that was over against the tower of Antonia as far as the banks themselves, and had supported the ground over the mine with beams laid across one another, whereby the Roman works stood upon an uncertain foundation. Then did he order such materials to be brought in as were daubed over with pitch and bitumen, and set them on fire, and as the cross-beams that supported the banks were burning, the ditch yielded on the sudden, and the banks were shaken down and fell into the ditch with a prodigious noise. Now, at the first, there arose a very thick smoke and dust, as the fire was choked with the fall of the bank, but as the suffocated materials were now gradually consumed, a plain flame break out, on which sudden appearance of the flame a consternation fell upon the Romans, and the shrewdness of the contrivance discouraged them. And indeed, this accident coming upon them at a time when they thought they had already gained their point, cooled their hopes for the time to come. They also thought it would be to no purpose to take the pains to extinguish the fire, since if it were extinguished, the banks were swallowed up already, and become useless to them. Two days after this, Simon and his party made an attempt to destroy the other banks, for the Romans had brought their engines to bear there, and began already to make the wall shake. And here one Tephius of Garsis, a city of Galilee, and Megasaurus, one who was derived from some of Queen Mariamne's servants, and with them one from Adiabene, he was the son of Nabateus, and called by the name of Shagiras, from the ill fortune he had, the word signifying a lame man, snatched some torches and ran suddenly upon the engines. Nor were there during this war any men that ever sallied out of the city who were their superiors, either in their boldness or in the terror they struck into their enemies. For they ran out upon the Romans, not as if they were enemies, but friends, without fear or delay, nor did they leave their enemies till they had rushed violently through the midst of them, 
and set their machines on fire and though they had darts thrown at them on every side and were on every side assaulted with their enemies swords yet did they not withdraw themselves out of the dangers they were in till the fire had caught hold of the instruments but when the flame went up the romans came running from their camp to save their engines then did the jews hinder their succors from the wall and fought with those that endeavoured to quench the fire without any regard to the danger their bodies were in so the romans pulled the engines out of the fire while the hurdles that covered them were on fire but the jews caught hold of the battering rams through the flame itself and held them fast although the iron upon them was become red hot and now the fire spread itself from the engines to the banks and prevented those that came to defend them and all this while the romans were encompassed round about with the flame and despairing of saving their works from it they retired to their camp then did the jews become still more and more in number by the coming of those that were within the city to their assistance and as they were very bold upon the good success they had had their violent assaults were almost irresistible nay they proceeded as far as the fortifications of the enemy's camp and fought with their guards now there stood a body of soldiers in array before that camp which succeeded one another by turns in their armor and as to those the law of the romans was terrible that he who left his post there let the occasion be whatsoever it might be he was to die for it so that body of soldiers preferring rather to die in fighting courageously than as a punishment for their cowardice stood firm and at the necessity these men were in of standing to it many of the others that had run away out of shame turned back again and when they had set the engines against the wall they put the multitude from coming more of them out of the city which they could the more easily do because they had made no provision for preserving or guarding their bodies at this time for the jews fought now hand to hand with all that came in their way and without any caution fell against the points of their enemies spears and attacked them bodies against bodies for they were now too hard for the romans not so much by their other warlike actions as by these courageous assaults they made upon them and the romans gave way more to their boldness than they did to the sense of the harm they had received from them and now titus was come from the tower of antonia whither he was gone to look out for a place for raising other banks and reproached the soldiers greatly for permitting their own walls to be in danger when they had taken the walls of their enemies and sustained the fortune of men besieged while the jews were allowed to sally out against them though they were already in a sort of prison he then went round about the enemy with some chosen troops and fell upon their flank himself so the jews who had been before assaulted in their faces wheeled about to titus and continued the fight the armies also were now mixed one among another and the dust that was raised so far hindered them from seeing one another and the noise that was made so far hindered them from hearing one another that neither side could discern an enemy from a friend however the jews did not flinch though not so much from their real strength as from their despair of deliverance the romans also would not yield by reason of the regard they had to glory and to their reputation in war and because caesar himself went into the danger before them insomuch that i cannot but think the romans would in the conclusion have now taken even the whole multitude of the jews so very angry were they at them had these not prevented the upshot of the battle and retired into the city however seeing the banks of the romans were demolished these romans were very much cast down upon the loss of what had cost them so long pains and this in one hour's time and many indeed despaired of taking the city with their usual engines of war only and now did titus consult with his commanders what was to be done those that were of the warmest tempers 
thought he should bring the whole army against the city and storm the wall. The opinion of Titus was that if they aimed at quickness joined with security, they must build a wall round about the whole city, and he gave orders that the army should be distributed to their several shares of this work. Titus began the wall from the camp of the Assyrians, where his own camp was pitched, and drew it down to the lower parts of Sinopolis. Thence it went, along the valley of Cedron, to the Mount of Olives. It then bent toward the south, and encompassed the mountain as far as the rock called Peristerion, and that other hill which lies next it, and is over the valley which reaches to Siloam whence it bended again to the west, and went down to the valley of the fountain, beyond which it went up again at the monument of Ananus, the high priest, and encompassing that mountain where Pompey had formerly pitched his camp, it returned back to the north side of the city, and was carried on as far as a certain village called the House of the Arabinthi, after which it encompassed Herod's monument, and there on the east, was joined to Titus's own camp, where it began. Now the length of this wall was forty furlongs, one only abated. Now at this wall without were erected thirteen places to keep garrison in, whose circumferences, put together, amounted to ten furlongs. The whole was completed in three days, so that what would naturally have required some months was done in so short an interval as is incredible. When Titus had therefore encompassed the city with this wall, and put garrisons into proper places, he went round the wall at the first watch of the night, and observed how the guard was kept. The second watch he allotted to Alexander. The commanders of legions took the third watch. They also cast lots among themselves who should be upon the watch in the night time, and who should go all night long round the spaces that were interposed between the garrisons. So all hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews, together with their liberty of going out of the city. Then did the famine widen its progress, and devoured the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying by famine, and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also, and the young men, wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with the famine, and fell down dead, wheresoever their misery seized them. As for burying them, those that were sick themselves were not able to do it, and those that were hearty and well were deterred from doing it by the great multitude of those dead bodies and by the uncertainty there was, how soon they should die themselves. For many died as they were burying others, and many went to their coffins before that fatal hour was come. Nor was there any lamentations made under these calamities, nor were heard any mournful complaints, but the famine confounded all natural passions, for those who were just going to die looked upon those that were gone to rest before them, with dry eyes and open mouths. A deep silence also, and a kind of deadly night, had seized upon the city, while yet the robbers were still more terrible than these miseries were themselves, for they break open those houses which were no other than graves of dead bodies, and plundered them of what they had, and, carrying off the coverings of their bodies, went out laughing, and tried the points of their swords in their dead bodies, and, in order to prove what metal they were made of, they thrust some of those through that still lay alive upon the ground. But for those that entreated them to lend them their right hand and their sword to dispatch them, they were too proud to grant their requests, and left them to be consumed by the famine. Now every one of these died with their eyes fixed upon the temple, and left the seditious alive behind them. Now the seditious at first gave orders that the dead should be buried out of the public treasury, as not enduring the stench of their dead bodies. But afterward, when they could not do that, 
they had them cast down from the walls into the valleys beneath. However, when Titus, in going his rounds along those valleys, saw them full of dead bodies, and the thick putrefaction running about them, he gave a groan, and, spreading out his hands to heaven, called God to witness that this was not his doing, and such was the sad case of the city itself. But the Romans were very joyful, since none of the seditious could now make sallies out of the city, because they were themselves disconsolate, and the famine already touched them also. These Romans, besides, had great plenty of corn and other necessaries out of Syria and out of the neighboring provinces, many of whom would stand near to the wall of the city and show the people what great quantities of provisions they had, and so make the enemy more sensible of their famine, by the great plenty, even to satiety, which they had themselves. End of section 17. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 18 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rood. The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 4. In the meantime, Josephus, as he was going round the city, had his head wounded by a stone that was thrown at him, upon which he fell down as giddy. Josephus soon recovered of his wound, and came out and cried out aloud that it would not be long ere they should be punished for this wound they had given him. He also made a fresh exhortation to the people to come out upon the security that would be given them. This sight of Josephus encouraged the people greatly, and brought a great consternation upon the seditious. Hereupon, some of the deserters, having no other way, leaped down from the wall immediately, while others of them went out of the city with stones, as if they would fight them. But thereupon they fled away to the Romans. But here a worse fate accompanied these than what they had found within the city, and they met with a quicker despatch from the too great abundance they had among the Romans than they could have done from the famine among the Jews. For when they came first to the Romans, they were puffed up by the famine and swelled, like men in a dropsy. After which they all on the sudden overfilled those bodies that were before empty, and so burst asunder, excepting such only as were skillful enough to restrain their appetites, and by degrees took in their food into bodies unaccustomed thereto. Yet did another plague seize upon those that were thus preserved, for there was found among the Syrian deserters a certain person who was caught gathering pieces of gold out of the excrements of the Jews' bellies, for the deserters used to swallow such pieces of gold as we told you before when they came out, and for these did the seditious search them all, for there was a great quantity of gold in the city, insomuch that as much was now sold in the Roman camp for twelve attic drachmas, as was sold before for twenty-five. But when this contrivance was discovered in one instance, the fame of it filled their several camps, that the deserters came to them full of gold. So the multitude of the Arabians, with the Syrians, cut up those that came as supplicants, and searched their bellies. Nor does it seem to me that any misery befell the Jews that was more terrible than this, since in one night's time about two thousand of these deserters were thus dissected. When Titus came to the knowledge of this wicked practice, he threatened that he would put such men to death if any of them were discovered to be so insolent as to do so again. Moreover, he gave it in charge to the legions that they should make a search after such as were suspected, and should bring them to him, 
but it appeared that the love of money was too great for all their dread of punishment, and a vehement desire of gain is natural to men, and no passion is so venturesome as covetousness. Otherwise, such passions have certain bounds and are subordinate to fear. But in reality it was God who condemned the whole nation and turned every course that was taken for their preservation to their destruction. This, therefore, which was forbidden by Caesar under such a threatening, was ventured upon privately against the deserters, and these barbarians would go out still and meet those that ran away before any saw them, and, looking about them to see that no Roman spied them, they dissected them and pulled this polluted money out of their bowels, which money was still found in a few of them, while yet a great many were destroyed by the bare hope there was of thus getting by them, which miserable treatment made many that were deserting to return back again into the city. And indeed, why do I relate these particular calamities? While Menaeus, the son of Lazarus, came running to Titus at this very time, and told him that there had been carried out through that one gate, which was entrusted to his care, no fewer than a hundred and fifteen thousand eight hundred and eighty dead bodies in the interval between the fourteenth day of the month Xanthicus, Nisan, when the Romans pitched their camp by the city, and the first day of the month Panemus, Tammuz. This was itself a prodigious multitude, and though this man was not himself set as a governor at that gate, yet was he appointed to pay the public stipend for carrying these bodies out, and so was obliged of necessity to number them, while the rest were buried by their relations, though all their burial was but this, to bring them away and cast them out of the city. After this man there ran away to Titus many of the eminent citizens, and told him the entire number of the poor that were dead, and that no fewer than six hundred thousand were thrown out at the gates, though still the number of the rest could not be discovered. And they told him further that, when they were no longer able to carry out the dead bodies of the poor, they laid their corpses on heaps in very large houses and shut them up therein, as also that a medimno of wheat was sold for a talent, and that when, a while afterward, it was not possible to gather herbs, by reason the city was all walled about, some persons were driven to that terrible distress as to search the common sewers and old dunghills of cattle, and to eat the dung which they got there, and what they of old could not endure so much as to see, they now used for food. When the Romans barely heard all this, they commiserated their case, while the seditious, who saw it also, did not repent, but suffered the same distress to come upon themselves, for they were blinded by that fate which was already coming upon the city, and upon themselves also. And now the Romans, although they were greatly distressed in getting together their materials, raised their banks in one and twenty days, after they had cut down all the trees that were in the country that adjoined to the city, and that for ninety furlongs round about. And when the banks were finished, they afforded a foundation for fear both to the Romans and to the Jews, for the Jews expected that the city would be taken unless they could burn those banks, as did the Romans expect that, if these were once burned down, they should never be able to take it, for there was a mighty scarcity of materials, and the bodies of the soldiers began to fail with such hard labors, as did their souls faint with so many instances of ill success. The Romans had an advantage, in that their engines for sieges cooperated with them in throwing darts and stones as far as the Jews, when they were coming out of the city, whereby the man that fell became an impediment to him that was next to him, as did the danger of going farther make them less zealous in their attempts and for those that had run under the darts, some of them were terrified by the good order and closeness of the enemy's ranks before they came to a close fight, and others were pricked with their spears and turned back again. At length they reproached one another for their cowardice, and retired without doing anything. This attack was made upon the first day of the month Panemus, Tammuz. 
So when the Jews were retreated, the Romans brought their engines, although they had all the while stones thrown at them from the Tower of Antonia, and were assaulted by fire and sword, and by all sorts of darts, which necessity afforded the Jews to make use of, for although these had great dependence on their own wall, and a contempt of the Roman engines, yet did they endeavor to hinder the Romans from bringing them. Now these Romans struggled hard, on the contrary, to bring them, as deeming that this zeal of the Jews was in order to avoid any impression to be made on the Tower of Antonia, because its wall was but weak and its foundations rotten. However, that tower did not yield to the blows given it from the engines. Yet did the Romans bear the impressions made by the enemy's darts, which were perpetually cast at them, and did not give way to any of those dangers that came upon them from above. And so they brought their engines to bear. But then, as they were beneath the other, and were sadly wounded by the stones thrown down upon them, some of them threw their shields over their bodies, and partly with their hands, and partly with their bodies, and partly with crows, they undermined its foundations, and with great pains they removed four of its stones. Then night came upon both sides, and put an end to this struggle for the present. However, that night, the wall was so shaken by the battering rams in that place where John had used his stratagem before, and had undermined their banks, that the ground then gave way, and the wall fell down suddenly. When this accident had unexpectedly happened, the minds of both parties were variously affected, for though one would expect that the Jews would be discouraged, because this fall of their wall was unexpected by them, and they had made no provision in that case, yet did they pull up their courage, because the tower of Antonia itself was still standing, as was the unexpected joy of the Romans at this fall of the wall soon quenched by the sight they had of another wall, which John and his party had built within it. Upon the fifth day of the month Panemus, Tammuz, twelve of those men that were on the forefront and kept watch upon the banks, got together and called to them the standard-bearer of the fifth legion, and two others of a troop of horsemen, and one trumpeter. These went without noise, about the ninth hour of the night, through the ruins to the tower of Antonia, and when they had cut the throats of the first guards of the place, as they were asleep, they got possession of the wall and ordered the trumpeter to sound his trumpet upon which the rest of the guard got up on the sudden and ran away before anybody could see how many they were that were gotten up, for partly from the fear they were in, and partly from the sound of the trumpet which they heard they imagined a great number of the enemy were gotten up. But as soon as Caesar heard the signal, he ordered the army to put on their armor immediately, and came thither with his commanders, and first of all ascended, as did the chosen men that were with him, and as the Jews were flying away to the temple, they fell into that mine which John had dug under the Roman banks. Then did the seditious of both the bodies of the Jewish army, as well that belonging to John as that belonging to Simon, drive them away, and indeed were no way wanting as to the highest degree of force and alacrity, for they esteemed themselves entirely ruined if once the Romans got into the temple, as did the Romans look upon the same thing as the beginning of their entire conquest. So a terrible battle was fought at the entrance of the temple, while the Romans were forcing their way in order to get possession of that temple, and the Jews were driving them back to the Tower of Antonia, in which battle the darts were on both sides useless, as well as the spears, and both sides drew their swords and fought it out hand to hand. Now, during this struggle, the positions of the men were undistinguished on both sides, and they fought at random, the men being intermixed one with another, and confounded by reason of the narrowness of the place, while the noise that was made fell on the ear after an indistinct manner, because it was so very loud. Great slaughter was now made on both sides, 
and the combatants trod upon the bodies and the armor of those that were dead and dashed them to pieces accordingly to which side soever the battle inclined those that had the advantage exhorted one another to go on as did those that were beaten make great lamentation but still there was no room for flight nor for pursuit but disorderly revolutions and retreats while the armies were intermixed one with another but those that were in the first ranks were under the necessity of killing or being killed without any way for escaping for those on both sides that came behind forced those before them to go on without leaving any space between the armies at length the jews violent zeal was too hard for the romans skill and the battle already inclined entirely that way for the fight had lasted from the ninth hour of the night till the seventh hour of the day while the jews came on in crowds and had the danger the temple was in for their motive the romans having no more here than a part of their army for those legions on which the soldiers on that side depended were not come up to them so it was at present thought sufficient by the romans to take possession of the tower of antonia in the meantime the rest of the roman army had in seven days time overthrown some foundations of the tower of antonia and had made a ready and broad way to the temple then did the legions come near the first court and began to raise their banks the one bank was over against the northwest corner of the inner temple another was at that northern edifice which was between the two gates and of the other two one was at the western cloister of the outer court of the temple the other against its northern cloister however these works were thus far advanced by the romans not without great pains and difficulty and particularly by being obliged to bring their materials from the distance of a hundred furlongs they had further difficulties also upon them sometimes by their over great security they were in that they should overcome the jewish snares laid for them and by that boldness of the jews which their despair of escaping had inspired them with all in the meantime the jews were so distressed by the fights they had been in as the war advanced higher and higher and creeping up to the holy house itself that they as it were cut off those limbs of their body which were infected in order to prevent the distempers spreading further for they set the northwest cloister which was joined to the tower of antonia on fire and after that break off about twenty cubits of that cloister and thereby made a beginning in burning the sanctuary two days after which or on the twenty-fourth day of the forenamed month panamus or tammuz the romans set fire to the cloister that joined to the other when the fire went fifteen cubits farther the jews in like manner cut off its roof nor did they entirely leave off what they were about till the tower of antonia was parted from the temple even when it was in their power to have stopped the fire nay they lay still while the temple was first set on fire and deemed this spreading of the fire to be for their own advantage however the armies were still fighting one against another about the temple and the war was managed by continual sallies of particular parties against one another now of those that perished by famine in the city the number was prodigious and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable for if so much as the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear a war was commenced presently and the dearest friends fell a-fighting one with another about it snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food but the robbers would search them when they were expiring lest any one should have concealed food in his bosom and counterfeited dying nay these robbers gaped for want and ran about stumbling and staggering along like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of the houses like drunken men they would also in the great distress they were in rush into the very same houses 
two or three times in one and the same day. Moreover, their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything, while they gathered such things as the most sordid animals would not touch, and endured to eat them. Nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes, and the very leather which belonged to their shields they pulled off and gnawed. The very wisps of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibres, and sold a very small weight of them for four attic drachmas. But why do I describe the shameless impudence that the famine brought on men in their eating inanimate things, while I am going to relate a matter of fact, the like to which no history relates either among the Greeks or barbarians? It is horrible to speak of it, and incredible when heard. I had indeed willingly omitted this calamity of ours, that I might not seem to deliver what is so portentous to posterity, but that I have innumerable witnesses to it in my own age. And besides, my country would have had little reason to thank me for suppressing the miseries that she underwent at this time. There was a certain woman that dwelt beyond Jordan. Her name was Mary. Her father was Eleazar, of the village Bethesab, which signifies the house of Hysop. She was eminent for her family and her wealth, and had fled away to Jerusalem with the rest of the multitude, and was with them besieged therein at this time. The other effects of this woman had been already seized upon, such I mean as she had brought with her out of Perea, and removed to the city. What she had treasured up besides, as also what food she had contrived to save, had been also carried off by the rapacious guards, who came every day running into her house for that purpose. This put the poor woman into a very great passion, and by the frequent reproaches and imprecations she cast at these rapacious villains, she had provoked them to anger against her. But none of them, either out of the indignation she had raised against herself, or out of commiseration of her case, would take away her life, and if she found any food, she perceived her labours were for others and not for herself, and it was now become impossible for her, anyway, to find any more food, while the famine pierced through her very bowels and marrow, when also her passion was fired to a degree beyond the famine itself, nor did she consult with anything but with her passion and the necessity she was in. She then attempted a most unnatural thing, and snatching up her son, who was a child, sucking at her breast, she said, O oh, thou miserable infant, for whom shall I preserve thee in this war, this famine, and this sedition? As to the war with the Romans, if they preserve our lives, we must be slaves. This famine also will destroy us even before that slavery comes upon us. Yet are these seditious rogues more terrible than both the other. Come on, be thou my food, and be thou a fury to these seditious varlets, and a byword to the world, which is all that is now wanting to complete the calamities of us Jews. As soon as she had said this, she slew her son, and then roasted him, and eat the one half of him, and kept the other half by her concealed. Upon this the seditious came in presently, and smelling the horrid scent of this food, they threatened her that they would cut her throat immediately if she did not show them what food she had gotten ready. She replied that she had saved a very fine portion of it for them, and withal uncovered what was left of her son. Hereupon they were seized with a horror and amazement of mind, and stood astonished at the sight when she said to them, This is mine own son, and what hath been done was mine own doing. Come, eat of this food, for I have eaten of it myself. Do not you pretend to be either more tender than a woman or more compassionate than a mother? But if you be so scrupulous and do abominate this my sacrifice, as I have eaten the one half, let the rest be reserved for me also. After which, those men went out trembling, being never so much affrighted at anything as they were at this, and with some difficulty they left the rest of that meat to the mother. 
upon which the whole city was full of this horrid action immediately and while everybody laid this miserable case before their own eyes they trembled as if this unheard-of action had been done by themselves so those that were thus distressed by the famine were very desirous to die and those already dead were esteemed happy because they had not lived long enough either to hear or to see such miseries this sad instance was quickly told to the romans some of whom could not believe it and others pitied the distress which the jews were under but there were many of them who were hereby induced to a more bitter hatred than ordinary against our nation but for caesar he excused himself before god as to this matter and said that he had proposed peace and liberty to the jews as well as an oblivion of all their former insolent practices but that they instead of concord had chosen sedition instead of peace war and before satiety and abundance a famine that they had begun with their own hands to burn down that temple which we have preserved hitherto and that therefore they deserved to eat such food as this was that however this horrid action of eating an own child ought to be covered with the overthrow of their very country itself and men ought not to leave such a city upon the habitable earth to be seen by the sun wherein mothers are thus fed although such food be fitter for the fathers than for the mothers to eat of since it is they that continue still in a state of war against us after they have undergone such miseries as these and at the same time that he said this he reflected on the desperate condition these men must be in nor could he expect that such men could be recovered to sobriety of mind after they had endured those very sufferings for the avoiding whereof it only was probable they might have repented End of section eighteen recording by linda johnson section nineteen of the great events by famous historians volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the great events by famous historians volume three edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rood the great jewish revolt siege and destruction of jerusalem a d seventy by josephus part five and now two of the legions had completed their banks on the eighth day of the month Lus, ab whereupon titus gave orders that the battering rams should be brought and set over against the western edifice of the inner temple for before these were brought the firmest of all the other engines had battered the wall for six days together without ceasing without making any impression upon it but the vast largeness and strong connection of the stones were superior to that engine and to the other battering rams also other romans did indeed undermine the foundations of the northern gate and after a world of pains removed the outermost stones yet was the gate still upheld by the inner stones and stood still unhurt till the workmen despairing of all such attempts by engines and crows brought their ladders to the cloisters now the jews did not interrupt them in so doing but when they were gotten up they fell upon them and fought with them some of them they thrust down and threw them backward headlong others of them they met and slew they also beat many of those that went down the ladders again and slew them with their swords before they could bring their shields to protect them nay some of the ladders they threw down from above when they were full of armed men a great slaughter was made of the jews also at the same time while those that bear the ensigns fought hard for them as deeming it a terrible thing and what would tend to their great shame if they permitted them to be stolen away yet did the jews at length get possession of these engines and destroyed those that had gone up the ladders while the rest were so intimidated by what those suffered who were slain that they retired 
although none of the Romans died without having done good service before his death. Of the seditious, those that had fought bravely in the former battles did the like now, as besides them did Eleazar, the brother's son of Simon the tyrant. But when Titus perceived that his endeavors to spare a foreign temple turned to the damage of his soldiers and made them be killed, he gave orders to set the gates on fire. But then, on the next day, Titus commanded part of his army to quench the fire and to make a road for the more easy marching up of the legions, while he himself gathered the commanders together. Titus proposed to these that they should give him their advice what should be done about the holy house. Now, some of these thought it would be the best way to act according to the rules of war and demolish it, because the Jews would never leave off rebelling while that house was standing, at which house it was that they used to get all together. Others of them were of opinion that in case the Jews would leave it, and none of them would lay their arms up in it, he might save it, but that in case they got upon it and fought any more, he might burn it because it must then be looked upon not as a holy house, but as a citadel, and that the impiety of burning it would then belong to those that forced this to be done, and not to them. But Titus said that, quote, although the Jews should get upon that holy house and fight us thence, yet ought we not to revenge ourselves on things that are inanimate instead of the men themselves, end quote and that he was not in any case for burning down so vast a work as that was, because this would be a mischief to the Romans themselves, as it would be an ornament to their government while it continued. So Fronto and Alexander and Cerealis grew bold upon that declaration and agreed to the opinion of Titus. Then was this assembly dissolved when Titus had given orders to the commanders that the rest of their forces should lie still but that they should make use of such as were most courageous in this attack. So he commanded that the chosen men that were taken out of the cohorts should make their way through the ruins and quench the fire. Now it is true that on this day the Jews were so weary and under such consternation that they refrained from any attacks. But on the next day they gathered their whole force together, and ran upon those that guarded the outward court of the temple very boldly through the east gate, and this about the second hour of the day. These guards received their attack with great bravery, and by covering themselves with their shields before, as if it were with a wall, drew their squadron close together. Yet was it evident that they could not abide there very long, but would be overborne by the multitude of those that sallied out upon them, and by the heat of their passion. However, Caesar, seeing from the tower of Antonia that this squadron was likely to give way, sent some chosen horsemen to support them. Hereupon the Jews found themselves not able to sustain their onset, and upon the slaughter of those in the forefront, many of the rest were put to flight. But as the Romans were going off, the Jews turned upon them and fought them, and as those Romans came back upon them, they retreated again, until about the fifth hour of the day they were overborne, and shut themselves up in the inner court of the temple. So Titus retired into the tower of Antonia, and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp round about the holy house. But as for that house, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire, and now that fatal day was come according to the revolution of ages. It was the tenth day of the month Luce, Ab, upon which it was formerly burned by the king of Babylon, although these flames took their rise from the Jews themselves and were occasioned by them. For upon Titus's retiring, the seditious lay still for a little while, and then attacked the Romans again, when those that guarded the holy house fought with those that quenched the fire that was burning the inner court of the temple. But these Romans put the Jews to flight, and proceeded as far as the holy house itself, at which time 
one of the soldiers, without staying for any orders, and without any concern or dread upon him at so great an undertaking, and being hurried on by a certain divine fury, snatched somewhat out of the materials that were on fire, and being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window through which there was a passage to the rooms that were round about the holy house on the north side of it. As the flames went upward, the Jews made a great clamor, such as so mighty an affliction required, and ran together to prevent it. And now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since that holy house was perishing, for whose sake it was that they kept such a guard about it. And now Caesar was no way able to restrain the enthusiastic fury of the soldiers, and the fire proceeded on more and more. He went into the holy place of the temple with his commanders, and saw it with what was in it, which he found to be far superior to what the relations of foreigners contained, and not inferior to what we ourselves boasted of and believed about it. But as the flame had not as yet reached to its inward parts, but was still consuming the rooms that were about the holy house, and Titus, supposing what the fact was, that the house itself might yet be saved, came in haste, and endeavored to persuade the soldiers to quench the fire, and gave order to Liberalius the centurion, and one of those spearmen that were about him, to beat the soldiers that were refractory with their staves, and to restrain them. Yet were their passions too hard for the regards they had for Caesar, and the dread they had of him who forbade them, as was their hatred of the Jews, and a certain vehement inclination to fight them, too hard for them also. Moreover, the hope of plunder induced many to go on, as, having this opinion, that all the places within were full of money, and as seeing that all round about it was made of gold. And besides, one of those that went into the place prevented Caesar, when he ran so hastily out to restrain the soldiers, and threw the fire upon the hinges of the gate in the dark, whereby the flame burst out from within the holy house itself immediately. When the commanders retired, and Caesar with them, and when nobody any longer forbade those that were without to set fire to it. And thus was the holy house burned down, without Caesar's approbation. While the holy house was on fire, everything was plundered that came to hand, and ten thousand of those that were caught were slain. Nor was there a commiseration of any age or any reverence of gravity, but children and old men, and profane persons, and priests were all slain in the same manner. So that this war went round all sorts of men, and brought them to destruction, and as well those that made supplication for their lives as those that defended themselves by fighting. The flame was also carried a long way, and made an echo, together with the groans of those that were slain. And because this hill was high, and the works at the temple were very great, one would have thought the whole city had been on fire. Nor can one imagine anything either greater or more terrible than this noise. For there was at once a shout of the Roman legions, who were marching all together, and a sad clamor of the seditious, who were now surrounded with fire and sword. The people also that were left above were beaten back upon the enemy, and under a great consternation, and made sad moans at the calamity they were under. The multitude also that was in the city joined in this outcry with those that were upon the hill, and besides, many of those that were worn away by the famine, and their mouths almost closed, when they saw the fire of the holy house, they exerted their utmost strength and break out into groans and outcries again. Perea did also return the echo, as well as the mountains round about the city, and augmented the force of the entire noise. Yet was the misery itself more terrible than this disorder, for one would have thought that the hill itself on which the temple stood 
was seething hot, as full of fire on every part of it, that the blood was larger in quantity than the fire, and those that were slain more in number than those that slew them, for the ground did nowhere appear visible for the dead bodies that lay on it. But the soldiers went over heaps of those bodies, as they ran upon such as fled from them. And now it was that the multitude of the robbers were thrust out of the inner court of the temple by the Romans, and had much ado to get into the outward court, and from thence into the city, while the remainder of the populace fled into the cloister of that outer court. As for the priests, some of them plucked up from the holy house the spikes that were upon it, with their bases, which were made of lead, and shot them at the Romans instead of darts. But then, as they gained nothing by so doing, and as the fire burst out upon them, they retired to the wall that was eight cubits broad, and there they tarried. And now the Romans, judging that it was in vain to spare what was round about the holy house, burned all those places, as also the remains of the cloisters and the gates, too excepted, the one on the east side and the other on the south, both which, however, they burned afterward. They also burned down the treasury chambers, in which was an immense quantity of money, and an immense number of garments and other precious goods there reposited. And, to speak all in a few words, there it was that the entire riches of the Jews were heaped up together, while the rich people had there built themselves chambers to contain such furniture. The soldiers also came to the rest of the cloisters that were in the outer court of the temple, whither the women and children, and a great mixed multitude of the people, fled, in number about six thousand. But before Caesar had determined anything about these people, or given the commanders any orders relating to them, the soldiers were in such a rage that they set that cloister on fire, by which means it came to pass that some of these were destroyed by throwing themselves down headlong, and some were burned in the cloisters themselves, nor did any one of them escape with his life. And now... The Romans, upon the flight of the seditious into the city, and upon the burning of the holy house itself, and of all the buildings round about it, brought their ensigns to the temple, and set them over against its eastern gate, and there did they offer sacrifices to them, and there did they make Titus imperator with the greatest acclamations of joy. And now... All the soldiers had such vast quantities of the spoils which they had gotten by plunder that in Syria a pound weight of gold was sold for half its former value. But as for the tyrants themselves and those that were with them, when they found that they were encompassed on every side and, as it were, walled round, without any method of escaping, they desired to treat with Titus by word of mouth. Accordingly, such was the kindness of his nature, and his desire of preserving the city from destruction, joined to the advice of his friends, who now thought the robbers were come to a temper, that he placed himself on the western side of the outer court of the temple, for there were gates on that side above the Zistus, and a bridge that connected the upper city to the temple. This bridge it was that lay between the tyrants and Caesar, and parted them, while the multitude stood on each side, those of the Jewish nation about Simon and John, with great hopes of pardon, and the Romans about Caesar, in great expectation how Titus would receive their supplication. So Titus charged his soldiers to restrain their rage, and to let their darts alone, and appointed an interpreter between them, which was a sign that he was the conqueror, and first began the discourse and said, quote, I hope you, sirs, are now satiated with the miseries of your country, who have not had any just notions either of our great power or of your own great weakness, but have, like madmen, after a violent and inconsiderate manner, 
made such attempts as have brought your people, your city, and your holy house to destruction. You have been the men that have never left off rebelling since Pompey first conquered you, and have since that time made open war with the Romans. And now, vile wretches, do you desire to treat with me by word of mouth? To what purpose is it that you would save such a holy house as this was, which is now destroyed? What preservation can you now desire after the destruction of your temple? Yet do you stand still at this very time in your armor, nor can you bring yourselves so much as to pretend to be supplicants even in this your utmost extremity. O oh, miserable creatures! What is it you depend on? Are not your people dead? Is not your holy house gone? Is not your city in my power? And are not your own very lives in my hands? And do you still deem it a part of valor to die? However, I will not imitate your madness. If you throw down your arms and deliver up your bodies to me, I grant you your lives, and I will act like a mild master of a family. What cannot be healed shall be punished, and the rest I will preserve for my own use. End quote. To that offer of Titus they made this reply, that they could not accept of it, because they had sworn never to do so. But they desired they might have leave to go through the wall that had been made about them with their wives and children, for that they would go into the desert and leave the city to him. At this Titus had great indignation, that when they were in the case of men already taken captives, they should pretend to make their own terms with him as if they had been conquerors. So he ordered this proclamation to be made to them, that they should no more come out to him as deserters, nor hope for any further security, for that he would henceforth spare nobody, but fight them with his whole army, and that they must save themselves as well as they could, for that he would from henceforth treat them according to the laws of war, so he gave orders to the soldiers both to burn and to plunder the city, who did nothing indeed that day. But on the next day they set fire to the repository of the archives, to Accra, to the council house, and to the place called Oflas, at which time the fire proceeded as far as the palace of Queen Helena, which was in the middle of Accra. The lanes also were burned down as were also those houses that were full of the dead bodies of such as were destroyed by famine. End of section 19 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 20 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Root. The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege, and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus. Part 6. On the same day it was that the sons and brethren of Izates the king, together with many others of the eminent men of the populace, got together there, and besought Caesar to give them his right hand for their security. Upon which, though he was very angry at all that were now remaining, yet did he not lay aside his old moderation, but received these men. At that time, indeed, he kept them all in custody, but still bound the king's sons and kinsmen, and led them with him to Rome, in order to make them hostages for their country's fidelity to the Romans. And now the seditious rushed into the royal palace, into which many had put their effects, because it was so strong, and drove the Romans away from it. They also slew all the people that had crowded into it, who were in number about 8,400, and plundered them of what they had. 
On the next day, the Romans drove the robbers out of the lower city and set all on fire as far as Siloam. These soldiers were indeed glad to see the city destroyed, but they missed the plunder because the seditious had carried off all their effects and were retired into the upper city, for they did not yet at all repent of the mischiefs they had done, but were insolent, as if they had done well. For as they saw the city on fire, they appeared cheerful, and put on joyful countenances, in expectation, as they said, of death to end their miseries. Accordingly, as the people were now slain, the holy house was burned down, and the city was on fire. There was nothing further left for the enemy to do. Yet did not Josephus grow weary, even in this utmost extremity, to beg of them to spare what was left of the city. He spake largely to them about their barbarity and impiety, and gave them his advice in order to their escape, though he gained nothing thereby more than to be laughed at by them. And as they could not think of surrendering themselves up, because of the oath they had taken, nor were strong enough to fight with the Romans any longer upon the square, as being surrounded on all sides, and a kind of prisoners already, yet were they so accustomed to kill people, that they could not restrain their right hands from acting accordingly. So they dispersed themselves before the city, and laid themselves in ambush among its ruins, to catch those that attempted to desert to the Romans. Accordingly, many such deserters were caught by them, and were all slain, for these were too weak, by reason of their want of food, to fly away from them. So their dead bodies were thrown to the dogs. Now every other sort of death was thought more tolerable than the famine, insomuch that, though the Jews despaired now of mercy, yet would they fly to the Romans, and would themselves, even of their own accord, fall among the murderous rebels also. Nor was there any place in the city that had no dead bodies in it, but what was entirely covered with those that were killed either by the famine or the rebellion, and all was full of the dead bodies of such as had perished, either by that sedition or by the famine. So now the last hope which supported the tyrants and that crew of robbers who were with them was in the caves and caverns underground, whither, if they could once fly, they did not expect to be searched for, but endeavored that after the whole city should be destroyed and the Romans gone away, they might come out again and escape from them. This was no better than a dream of theirs, for they were not able to lie hid either from God or from the Romans. However, they depended on these underground subterfuges, and set more places on fire than did the Romans themselves, and those that fled out of their houses, thus set on fire into the ditches, they killed without mercy, and pillaged them also, and if they discovered food belonging to any one, they seized upon it and swallowed it down, together with their blood also. Nay, they were now come to fight one with another about their plunder, and I cannot but think that, had not their destruction prevented it, their barbarity would have made them taste of even the dead bodies themselves. Now, when Caesar perceived that the upper city was so steep that it could not possibly be taken without raising banks against it, he distributed the several parts of that work among his army, and this on the twentieth day of the month lose ab it was at this time that the commanders of the idumeans got together privately and took counsel about surrendering up themselves to the romans accordingly they sent five men to titus and entreated him to give them his right hand for their security so titus thinking that the tyrants would yield if the idumeans upon whom a great part of the war depended were once withdrawn from them, after some reluctancy and delay, complied with them and gave them security for their lives and sent the five men back. But as these Idumeans were preparing to march out, Simon perceived it and immediately slew the five men that had gone to Titus and took their commanders and put them in prison, of whom the most eminent was Jacob, 
the son of Sosas. But as for the multitude of the Idumeans, who did not at all know what to do, now their commanders were taken from them, he had them watched and secured the walls by a more numerous garrison. Yet could not that garrison resist those that were deserting, for although a great number of them were slain, yet were the deserters many more in number. These were all received by the Romans, because Titus himself grew negligent as to his former orders for killing them, and because the very soldiers grew weary of killing them, and because they hoped to get some money by sparing them, for they left only the populace and sold the rest of the multitude with their wives and children, and every one of them at a very low price, and that because such as were sold were very many and the buyers were few. And although Titus had made proclamation beforehand that no deserter should come alone by himself, that so they might bring out their families with them, yet did he receive such as these also. However, he set over them such as were to distinguish some from others, in order to see if any of them deserved to be punished. And indeed, the number of those that were sold was immense. But of the populace, above forty thousand were saved, whom Caesar let go, whither every one of them pleased. But now at this time it was, that one of the priests, the son of Thebuthus, whose name was Jesus, upon his having security given him, by the oath of Caesar, that he should be preserved upon condition that he should deliver to him certain of the precious things that had been deposited in the temple, came out of it and delivered him from the wall of the holy house two candlesticks, like to those that lay in the holy house, with tables and cisterns and vials, all made of solid gold and very heavy. He also delivered to him the veils and the garments, with the precious stones, and a great number of other precious vessels that belonged to their sacred worship. The treasurer of the temple also, whose name was Phineas, was seized on, and showed Titus the coats and girdles of the priests, with a great quantity of purple and scarlet, which were there deposited for the uses of the veil, as also a great deal of cinnamon and cassia with a large quantity of other sweet spices, which used to be mixed together and offered as incense to God every day. A great many other treasures were also delivered to him, with sacred ornaments of the temple not a few, which things thus delivered to Titus, obtained of him for this man the same pardon that he had allowed to such as deserted of their own accord. And now were the banks finished on the seventh day of the month Gorpius, Elul, in eighteen days' time, when the Romans brought their machines against the wall. But for the seditious, some of them, as despairing of saving the city, retired from the wall to the citadel. Others of them went down into the subterranean vaults, though still a great many of them defended themselves against those that brought the engines for the battery, Yet did the Romans overcome them by their number and by their strength. And what was the principal thing of all, by going cheerfully about their work, while the Jews were quite dejected and become weak? Now, as soon as a part of the wall was battered down, and certain of the towers yielded to the impression of the battering rams, those that opposed themselves fled away, and such a terror fell upon the tyrants as was much greater than the occasion required for before the enemy got over the breach they were quite stunned and were immediately for flying away and now one might see these men who had hitherto been so insolent and arrogant in their wicked practices to be cast down and to tremble insomuch that it would pity one's heart to observe the change that was made in those vile persons. Accordingly, they ran with great violence upon the Roman wall that encompassed them, in order to force away those that guarded it, and to break through it and get away. But when they saw that those who had formerly been faithful to them had gone away, as indeed they were fled whithersoever the great distress they were in persuaded them to flee, as also when those that came running before the rest 
told them that the western wall was entirely overthrown, while others said the Romans were gotten in, and others that they were near and looking out for them, which were only the dictates of their fear, which imposed upon their sight, they fell upon their face and greatly lamented their own mad conduct, and their nerves were so terribly loosed that they could not flee away. And here one may chiefly reflect on the power of God exercised upon these wicked wretches, and on the good fortune of the Romans, for these tyrants did now wholly deprive themselves of the security they had in their own power, and came down from those very towers of their own accord, wherein they could have never been taken by force, nor indeed by any other way than by famine. And thus did the Romans, when they had taken such great pains about weaker walls, get by good fortune what they could never have gotten by their engines, for three of these towers were too strong for all mechanical engines whatsoever. So they now left these towers of themselves, or rather they were ejected out of them by God himself, and fled immediately to that valley which was under Siloam, where they again recovered themselves out of the dread they were in for a while, and ran violently against that part of the Roman wall which lay on that side. But as their courage was too much depressed to make their attacks with sufficient force, and their power was now broken with fear and affliction, they were repulsed by the guards, and, dispersing themselves at distances from each other, went down into the subterranean caverns. So the Romans, being now become masters of the walls, they both placed their ensigns upon the towers, and made joyful acclamations for the victory they had gained, as having found the end of this war much lighter than its beginning. For when they had gotten upon the last wall, without any bloodshed, they could hardly believe what they found to be true. But seeing nobody to oppose them, they stood in doubt what such an unusual solitude could mean. But when they went in numbers into the lanes of the city, with their swords drawn, they slew those whom they overtook without mercy, and set fire to the houses whither the Jews were fled, and burned every soul in them, and laid waste a great many of the rest. And when they were come to the houses to plunder them, they found in them entire families of dead men, and the upper rooms full of corpses, that is, of such as died by the famine, they stood in horror at this sight, and went out without touching anything. Although they had this commiseration for such as were destroyed in that manner, yet had they not the same for those that were still alive, but they ran every one through whom they met, and obstructed the very lanes with their dead bodies, and made the whole city run with blood, to such a degree, indeed, that the fire of many of the houses was quenched, with these men's blood. And truly so it happened, that though the slayers left off at the evening, yet did the fire greatly prevail in the night, and as all was burning, came that eighth day of the month Gorpeus, Elul, upon Jerusalem, a city that had been liable to so many miseries during this siege, that, had it always enjoyed as much happiness from its first foundation, it would certainly have been the envy of the world. Nor did it, on any other account, so much deserve these sore misfortunes, as by producing such a generation of men as were the occasion of this its overthrow. Now, when Titus was come into this upper city, he admired not only some other places of strength in it, but particularly those strong towers which the tyrants in their mad conduct had relinquished. For when he saw their solid altitude and the largeness of their several stones, and the exactness of their joints, as also how great was their breadth and how extensive their length, he expressed himself after the manner following, quote, We have certainly had God for our assistant in this war, and it was no other than God who ejected the Jews out of these fortifications. For what could the hands of men or any machines do toward overthrowing these towers? 
end quote. At which time he had many such discourses to his friends. He also let such go free as had been bound by the tyrants and were left in the prisons. To conclude, when he entirely demolished the rest of the city and overthrew its walls, he left these towers as a monument of his good fortune, which had proved his auxiliaries and enabled him to take what could not otherwise have been taken by him. And now, since his soldiers were already quite tired with killing men, and yet there appeared to be a vast multitude still remaining alive, Caesar gave orders that they should kill none but those that were in arms and opposed them, but should take the rest alive. But together with those whom they had orders to slay, they slew the aged and the infirm. But for those that were in their flourishing age, and who might be useful to them, they drove them together into the temple, and shut them up within the walls of the court of the women, over which Caesar set one of his freedmen, as also Fronto, one of his own friends, which last was to determine everyone's fate according to his merits. So this Fronto slew all those that had been seditious and robbers, who were impeached one by another. But of the young men he chose out the tallest and most beautiful, and reserved them for the triumph. And as for the rest of the multitude that were above seventeen years old, he put them into bonds and sent them to the Egyptian mines. Titus also sent a great number into the provinces as a present to them, that they might be destroyed upon their theatres by the sword and by the wild beasts. But those that were under seventeen years of age were sold for slaves. Now, during the days wherein Fronto was distinguishing these men, there perished for want of food eleven thousand, some of whom did not taste any food, through the hatred their guards bore to them, and others would not take in any when it was given them. The multitude also was so very great that they were in want even of corn for their sustenance. Now, the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be ninety-seven thousand, as was the number of those that perished during the whole siege eleven hundred thousand, the greater part of whom was indeed of the same nation with the citizens of Jerusalem, but not belonging to the city itself. They were come up from all the country to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and were on a sudden shut up by an army, which at the very first occasioned so great a straitness among them that there came a pestilential destruction upon them, and soon afterward such a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. That this city could contain so many people in it is manifest by that number of them which was taken under Cestius, who, being desirous of informing Nero of the power of the city, who otherwise was disposed to contemn that nation, entreated the high priests, if the thing were possible, to take the number of their whole multitude. So these high priests, upon the coming of that feast which is called the Passover, when they slay their sacrifices, from the ninth hour till the eleventh, but so that a company not less than ten belong to every sacrifice, for it is not lawful for them to feast singly by themselves, and many of them were twenty in a company, found the number of sacrifices was two hundred and fifty-six thousand five hundred, which, upon the allowance of no more than ten that feast together, amounts to two millions seven hundred thousand and two hundred persons that were pure and holy. For as to those that have the leprosy, or the gonorrhea, or women that have their monthly courses, or such as are otherwise polluted, it is not lawful for them to be partakers of this sacrifice, nor indeed for any foreigners neither who come hither to worship. Now this vast multitude is indeed collected out of remote places, but the entire nation was now shut up by fate as in prison, and the Roman army encompassed the city when it was crowded with inhabitants. Accordingly, the multitude of those that therein perished exceeded all the destructions that either men or God ever brought upon the world. For, 
to speak only of what was publicly known the romans slew some of them some they carried captives and others they made a search for underground and when they found where they were they broke up the ground and slew all they met with there were also found slain there above two thousand persons partly by their own hands and partly by one another but chiefly destroyed by the famine but then the ill savour of the dead bodies was most offensive to those that lighted upon them insomuch that some were obliged to get away immediately while others were so greedy of gain that they would go in among the dead bodies that lay on heaps and tread upon them for a great deal of treasure was found in these caverns and the hope of gain made every way of getting it to be esteemed lawful many also of those that had been put in prison by the tyrants were now brought out for they did not leave off their barbarous cruelty at the very last yet did god avenge himself upon them both in a manner agreeable to justice as for john he wanted food together with his brethren in these caverns and begged that the romans would now give him their right hand for his security which he had often proudly rejected before but for simon he struggled hard with the distress he was in till he was forced to surrender himself so he was reserved for the triumph and to be then slain as was john condemned to perpetual imprisonment and now the romans set fire to the extreme parts of the city and burned them down and entirely demolished its walls and thus was jerusalem taken in the second year of the reign of vespasian on the eighth day of the month gorpeus elul it had been taken five times before though this was the second time of its desolation for shishak the king of egypt and after him antiochus and after him pompey and after them sosius and herod took the city but still preserved it but before all these the king of babylon conquered it and made it desolate one thousand four hundred and sixty-eight years and six months after it was built but he who first built it was a potent man among the canaanites and is in our own tongue called melchisedec the righteous king for such he really was on which account he was there the first priest of god and first built a temple there and called the city jerusalem which was formerly called salem however david the king of the jews ejected the canaanites and settled his own people therein it was demolished entirely by the babylonians four hundred and seventy-seven years and six months after him and from king david who was the first of the jews who reigned therein to this destruction under titus were one thousand one hundred and seventy-nine years but from its first building till this last destruction were two thousand one hundred and seventy-seven years yet hath not its great antiquity nor its vast riches nor the diffusion of its nation over all the habitable earth nor the greatness of the veneration paid to it on a religious account been sufficient to preserve it from being destroyed and thus ended the siege of jerusalem end of section 20 recording by linda johnson section 21 of the great events by famous historians volume 3 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September 2019. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 79. Destruction of Pompeii, A.D. 79. By Pliny among the historic calamities of the world none has gathered about itself more human interest whether in connection with the study of ancient cities and customs or in the calling forth of sympathy through the magical treatment of imaginative literature 
than the destruction of Pompeii and Herculaneum by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which occurred at the beginning of the reign of Titus. The eruption was accompanied by an earthquake, and the combination of natural commotions caused the complete ruin and burial of the two cities. One of the most vivid descriptions of the catastrophe is that given in the account of Dion Cassius. Among those who perished in the disaster was the elder Pliny, the celebrated naturalist, and the most famous narrative of the eruption is that here given of Pliny the Younger, nephew of the other, in the two letters which he wrote to Tacitus in order to supply that historian with accurate details. Lytton's well-known Last Days of Pompeii, although a work of imagination, deals with this subject in a manner which almost simulates the realistic tale of an actual observer, and his account, linking the calamity itself with the revelations of the earlier explorers of the buried city, after so many centuries had passed, well deserves a place in connection with the story of the older and more circumstantial writer. One of the earliest important discoveries at Pompeii, made in 1771, was that of the Villa of Diomedes, named from the tomb of Marcus Arius Diomedes across the street. Since then, every decade has seen some progress in the work of excavation, and among other buildings brought to light are the House of Pansa, the House of the Tragic Poet, the House of Salustius, the Castor and Pollux, a double house, and the House of the Vetii, the last, a recent discovery, being left with all its furnishings as found. Many interesting objects have been discovered lately, and a complete picture can now be presented of a small Italian city and its life in the first century A.D. Valuable finds are wall paintings, illustrative of decorative art, floor mosaics, etc., which may be seen in the Royal Museum of Naples. Another of the most recent discoveries is that of the Temple of Venus Pompeiana in the southern corner of the city. Others are the remains of persons who, carrying valuables, perished in a wayside inn where they had sought refuge. At the present time about one half of the city has been excavated, and the circuit of the walls has been found to be about two miles. The uncovering of the whole city will probably require many years. Excavations now being made in the adjacent country promise results as interesting as those already obtained within the city limits. Pliny Your request that I would send you an account of my uncle's death, in order to transmit a more exact relation of it to posterity, deserves my acknowledgments. For, if this accident shall be celebrated by your pen, the glory of it, I am well assured, will be rendered for ever illustrious. And notwithstanding he perished by a misfortune, which, as it involved at the same time a most beautiful country in ruins, and destroyed so many populous cities, seems to promise him an everlasting remembrance, notwithstanding he has himself composed many and lasting works, Yet, I am persuaded, the mentioning of him in your immortal writings will greatly contribute to render his name immortal. Happy I esteem those to be, to whom by provision of the gods has been granted the ability either to do such actions as are worthy of being related, or to relate them in a manner worthy of being read. But peculiarly happy are they who are blessed with both these uncommon talents, in the number of which my uncle, as his own writings and your history will evidently prove, may justly be ranked. It is with extreme willingness, therefore, that I execute your commands, and should indeed have claimed the task if you had not enjoined it. He was at that time with the fleet under his command at Misenum. On the 24th of August, about one in the afternoon, my mother desired him to observe a cloud which appeared of a very unusual size and shape. He had just taken a turn in the sun, and, after bathing himself in cold water and making a light luncheon, gone back to his books. 
he immediately arose and went out upon a rising ground from whence he might get a better sight of this very uncommon appearance a cloud from which mountain was uncertain at this distance but it was found afterward to come from mount vesuvius was ascending the appearance of which i cannot give you a more exact description of than by likening it to that of a pine tree for it shot up to a great height in the form of a very tall trunk which spread itself out at the top into a sort of branches occasioned i imagine either by a sudden gust of air that impelled it the force of which decreased as it advanced upward or the cloud itself being pressed back again by its own weight expanded in the manner i have mentioned it appeared sometimes bright and sometimes dark and spotted according as it was either more or less impregnated with earth and cinders this phenomenon seemed to a man of such learning and research as my uncle extraordinary and worth further looking into he ordered a light vessel to be got ready and gave me leave if i liked to accompany him i said i rather go on with my work and it so happened he had himself given me something to write out as he was coming out of the house he received a note from rectina the wife of bassus who was in the utmost alarm at the imminent danger which threatened her for her villa lying at the foot of mount vesuvius there was no way of escape but by sea she earnestly entreated him therefore to come to her assistance he accordingly changed his first intention and what he had begun from a philosophical he now carried out in a noble and generous spirit he ordered the galleys to put to sea and went himself on board with an intention of assisting not only rectina but the several other towns which lay thickly strewn along that beautiful coast hastening then to the place from whence others fled with the utmost terror he steered his course direct to the point of danger and with so much calmness and presence of mind as to be able to make and dictate his observations upon the motion and all the phenomena of that dreadful scene he was now so close to the mountain that the cinders which grew thicker and hotter the nearer he approached fell into the ships together with pumice stones and black pieces of burning rock they were in danger too not only of being aground by the sudden retreat of the sea but also from the vast fragments which rolled down from the mountain and obstructed all the shore here he stopped to consider whether he should turn back again to which the pilot advising him fortune said he favours the brave steer to where pomponianus is pomponianus was then at stabiae separated by a bay which the sea after several insensible windings forms with the shore he had already sent his baggage on board for though he was not at that time in actual danger yet being within sight of it and indeed extremely near if it should in the least increase he was determined to put to sea as soon as the wind which was blowing dead inshore should go down it was favourable however for carrying my uncle to pomponianus whom he found in the greatest consternation he embraced him tenderly encouraging and urging him to keep up his spirits and the more effectually to soothe his fears by seeming unconcerned himself ordered a bath to be got ready and then after having bathed sat down to supper with great cheerfulness or at least what is just as heroic with every appearance of it meanwhile broad flames shone out in several places from mount vesuvius which the darkness of the night contributed to render still brighter and clearer but my uncle in order to soothe the apprehensions of his friend assured him it was only the burning of the villages which the country people had abandoned to the flames after this he retired to rest and it is most certain he was so little disquieted as to fall into a sound sleep for his breathing which on account of his corpulence was rather heavy and sonorous was heard by the attendants outside the court which led to his apartment being now almost filled with stones and ashes if he had continued there any time longer it would have been impossible for him to have made his way out 
so he was awoke and got up and went to pomponianus and the rest of his company who were feeling too anxious to think of going to bed they consulted together whether it would be most prudent to trust to the houses which now rocked from side to side with frequent and violent concussions as though shaken from their very foundations or fly to the open fields where the calcined stones and cinders though light indeed yet fell in large showers and threatened destruction in this choice of dangers they resolved for the fields a resolution which while the rest of the company were hurried into by their fears my uncle embraced upon cool and deliberate consideration they went out then having pillows tied upon their heads with napkins and this was their whole defence against the storm of stones that fell around them it was now day everywhere else but there a deeper darkness prevailed than in the thickest night which however was in some degree alleviated by torches and other lights of various kinds they thought proper to go farther down upon the shore to see if they might safely put out to sea but found the waves still running extremely high and boisterous there my uncle laying himself down upon a sailcloth which was spread for him called twice for some cold water which he drank when immediately the flames preceded by a strong whiff of sulphur dispersed the rest of the party and obliged him to rise he raised himself up with the assistance of two of his servants and instantly fell down dead suffocated as i conjecture by some gross and noxious vapour having always had a weak throat which was often inflamed as soon as it was light again which was not till the third day after this melancholy accident his body was found entire and without any marks of violence upon it in the dress in which he fell and looking more like a man asleep than dead during all this time my mother and i who were at misenum but this has no connection with your history and you did not desire any particulars besides those of my uncle's death so i will end here only adding that i have faithfully related to you what i was either an eye-witness of myself or received immediately after the accident happened and before there was time to vary the truth you will pick out of this narrative whatever is most important for a letter is one thing a history another it is one thing writing to a friend another thing writing to the public farewell the letter which in compliance with your request i wrote to you concerning the death of my uncle has raised it seems your curiosity to know what terrors and dangers attended me while i continued at missenum for there i think my account broke off though my shocked soul recoils my tongue shall tell my uncle having left us i spent such time as was left on my studies it was on their account indeed that i had stopped behind till it was time for my bath after which i went to supper and then fell into a short and uneasy sleep there had been noticed for many days before a trembling of the earth which did not alarm us much as this is quite an ordinary occurrence in campania but it was so particularly violent that night that it not only shook but actually overturned as it would seem everything about us my mother rushed into my chamber where she found me rising in order to awaken her we sat down in the open court of the house which occupied a small space between the buildings and the sea as i was at the time but eighteen years of age i know not whether i should call my behaviour in this dangerous juncture courage or folly but i took up livy and amused myself with turning over that author and even making extracts from him as if i had been perfectly at my leisure just then a friend of my uncle's who had lately come to him from spain joined us and observing me sitting by my mother with a book in my hand reproved her for her calmness and me at the same time for my careless security nevertheless i went on with my author though now it was now morning the light was still exceedingly faint and doubtful the buildings all around us tottered and though we stood upon open ground 
yet as the place was narrow and confined there was no remaining without imminent danger we therefore resolved to quit the town a panic-stricken crowd followed us and as to a mind distracted with terror every suggestion seems more prudent than its own pressed on us in dense array to drive us forward as we came out being at a convenient distance from the houses we stood still in the midst of a most dangerous and dreadful scene the chariots which we had ordered to be drawn out were so agitated backward and forward though upon the most level ground that we could not keep them steady even by supporting them with large stones the sea seemed to roll back upon itself and to be driven from its banks by the convulsive motion of the earth it is certain at least the shore was considerably enlarged and several sea animals were left upon it on the other side a black and dreadful cloud broken with rapid zigzag flashes revealed behind it variously shaped masses of flame these last were like sheet lightning but much larger upon this our spanish friend whom i mentioned above addressing himself to my mother and me with great energy and urgency if your brother he said if your uncle be safe he certainly wishes you may be so too but if he perished it was his desire no doubt that you might both survive him why therefore do you delay your escape a moment we could never think of our own safety we said while we were uncertain of his upon this our friend left us and withdrew from the danger with the utmost precipitation soon afterward the cloud began to descend and cover the sea it had already surrounded and concealed the island of caprie and the promontory of Missinum. my mother now besought urged even commanded me to make my escape at any rate which as i was young i might easily do as for herself she said her age and corpulency rendered all attempts of that sort impossible however she would willingly meet death if she could have the satisfaction of seeing that she was not the occasion of mine but i absolutely refused to leave her and taking her by the hand compelled her to go with me she complied with great reluctance and not without many reproaches to herself for retarding my flight the ashes now began to fall upon us though in no great quantity i looked back a dense dark mist seemed to be following us spreading itself over the country like a cloud let us turn out of the high road i said while we can still see for fear that should we fall in the road we should be pressed to death in the dark by the crowds that are following us we had scarcely sat down when night came upon us not such as we have when the sky is cloudy or when there is no moon but that of a room when it is shut up and all the lights put out you might hear the shrieks of women the screams of children and the shouts of men some calling for their children others for their parents others for their husbands and seeking to recognize each other by the voices that replied one lamenting his own fate another that of his family some wishing to die from the very fear of dying some lifting their hands to the gods but the greater part convinced that there were now no gods at all and that the final endless night of which we have heard had come upon the world among these there were some who augmented the real terrors by others imaginary or willfully invented i remember some who declared that one part of missinum had fallen that another was on fire it was false but they found people to believe them it now grew rather lighter which we imagined to be rather the forerunner of an approaching burst of flames as in truth it was than the return of day however the fire fell at a distance from us then again we were immersed in thick darkness and a heavy shower of ashes rained upon us which we were obliged every now and then to stand up to shake off otherwise we should have been crushed and buried in the heap i might boast that during all this scene of horror not a sigh or expression of fear escaped me had not my support been grounded in that miserable though mighty consolation 
that all mankind were involved in the same calamity, and that I was perishing with the world itself. At last this dreadful darkness was dissipated by degrees, like a cloud or a smoke, the real day returned, and even the sun shone out, though with a lurid light, like when an eclipse is coming on. Every object that presented itself to our eyes, which were extremely weakened, seemed changed, being covered deep with ashes as if with snow. We returned to Missenum, where we refreshed ourselves as well as we could, and passed an anxious night between hope and fear, though, indeed, with a much larger share of the latter, for the earthquake still continued, while many frenzied persons ran up and down, heightening their own and their friends' calamities by terrible predictions. However, my mother and I, notwithstanding the danger we had passed, and that which still threatened us, had no thoughts of leaving the place till we could receive some news of my uncle. And now you will read this narrative without any view of inserting it in your history, of which it is not in the least worthy, and indeed you must put it down to your own request if I should appear not worth even the trouble of a letter. Farewell. End of section 21《section 22 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Destruction of Pompeii, A.D. 79, by Lord Edward Bulwer-Lytton. The amphitheatre at Pompeii was crowded to the doors. A lion was at large in the arena, and the populace surged toward an Egyptian priest, Arbaces, demanding that he be thrown down to be devoured. As the mob rolled around him, intent on his death, Arbaces noted a strange and awful apparition. His craft made him courageous. He stretched forth his hand. Behold, he shouted with a voice of thunder, which stilled the roar of the crowd. Behold how the gods protect the guiltless. The fires of the avenging Orcus burst forth against the false witness of my accusers. The eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the Egyptian, and beheld, with ineffable dismay, a vast vapor shooting from the summit of Vesuvius, in the form of a gigantic pine tree, the trunk blackness, the branches fire a fire that shifted and wavered in its hues with every moment, now fiercely luminous, now of a dull and dying red, that again blazed terrifically forth with intolerable glare. There was a dead, heart-sunken silence, through which there suddenly broke the roar of the lion, which was echoed back from within the building by the sharper and fiercer yells of its fellow beast. Dread seers were they of the burden of the atmosphere, and wild prophets of the wrath to come. Then there arose on high the universal shrieks of women. The men stared at each other, but were dumb. At that moment they felt the earth shake beneath their feet. The walls of the theatre trembled, and beyond, in the distance, they heard the crash of falling roofs. An instant more, and the mountain clouds seemed to roll toward them, dark and rapid like a torrent. At the same time it cast forth from its bosom a shower of ashes mixed with vast fragments of burning stone. Over the crushing vines, over the desolate streets, over the amphitheatre itself, far and wide, with many a mighty splash in the agitated sea, fell that awful shower. No longer thought the crowd of justice or of our bases. Safety for themselves was their sole thought. Each turned to fly, each dashing, pressing, crushing against the other, trampling recklessly over the fallen, amid groans and oaths and prayers and sudden shrieks, the enormous crowd vomited itself forth through the numerous passages. Whither should they fly? Some, anticipating a second earthquake, hastened to their homes to load themselves with their more costly goods and escape while it was yet time. Others, dreading the showers of ashes that now fell fast, torrent upon torrent, over the streets, rushed under the roofs of the nearest houses or temples or sheds, shelter of any kind for protection from the terrors of the open air. But darker and larger and mightier spread the cloud above them, 
It was a sudden and more ghastly night rushing upon the realm of noon. Meanwhile, the streets were already thinned. The crowd had hastened to disperse itself under shelter. The ashes began to fill up the lower parts of the town, but here and there you heard the steps of fugitives cranching them warily, or saw their pale and haggard faces by the blue glare of the lightning or the more unsteady glare of torches by which they endeavored to steer their steps. But ever and anon the boiling water or the straggling ashes, mysterious and gusty winds rising and dying in a breath, extinguished these wandering lights, and with them the last living hope of those who bore them. Amid the other horrors, the mighty mountain now cast up columns of boiling water. Blent and kneaded with the half-burning ashes, the streams fell like seething mud over the streets in frequent intervals. And full, where the priests of Isis had now cowered around the altars on which they had vainly sought to kindle fires and pour incense, one of the fiercest of those deadly torrents, mingled with immense fragments of scoria, had poured its rage. Over the bended forms of the priests it dashed, that cry had been of death, that silence had been of eternity. The ashes, the pitchy stream, sprinkled the altars, covered the pavement, and half concealed the quivering corpses of the priests. In proportion as the blackness gathered did the lightnings around Vesuvius increase in their vivid and scorching glare. Nor was their horrible beauty confined to the usual hues of fire. No rainbow ever rivaled their varying and prodigal dyes. Now brightly blue as the most azure depth of a southern sky, now of a livid and snake-like green, darting restlessly to and fro as the folds of an enormous serpent, now of a lurid and intolerable crimson, gushing forth through the columns of smoke far and wide, and lighting up the whole city from arch to arch, then suddenly dying into a sickly paleness like the ghost of their own life. In the pauses of the showers you heard the rumbling of the earth beneath and the groaning waves of the tortured sea, or, lower still, an audible but to the watch of intensest fear, the grinding and hissing murmur of the escaping gases through the chasms of the distant mountain. Sometimes the cloud appeared to break from its solid mass, and by the lightning to assume quaint and vast mimicries of human or of monster shapes, striding across the gloom, hurtling one upon the other and vanishing swiftly into the turbulent abyss of shade so that to the eyes and fancies of the affrighted wanderers the unsubstantial vapors were as the bodily forms of gigantic foes the agents of terror and of death the ashes in many places were already knee-deep and the boiling showers which came from the steaming breath of the volcano forced their way into the houses bearing with them a strong and suffocating vapor in some places immense fragments of rock hurled upon the house roofs bore down along the streets masses of confused ruin which yet more and more with every hour obstructed the way and as the day advanced the motion of the earth was more sensibly felt the footing seemed to slide and creep nor could chariot or litter be kept steady even on the most level ground sometimes the huger stones striking against each other as they fell broke into countless fragments emitting sparks of fire which caught whatever was combustible within their reach and along the plains beyond the city the darkness was now terribly relieved for several houses and even vineyards had been set on flames and at various intervals the fires rose sullenly and fiercely against the solid gloom to add to this partial relief of the darkness the citizens had here and there in the more public places, as the porticoes of temples and the entrances to the forum, endeavored to place rows of torches. But these rarely continued long. The showers and the winds extinguished them, and the sudden darkness into which their sudden birth was converted had something in it doubly terrible and doubly impressing on the impotence of human hopes, the lesson of despair. Frequently, by the momentary light of these torches, parties of fugitives encountered each other, some hurrying toward the sea, others flying from the sea back to the land, for the ocean had retreated rapidly from the shore, and utter darkness lay over it, and upon its groaning and tossing waves the storm of cinders and rock fell without the protection which the streets and roofs afforded to the land. Wild, haggard, ghastly with supernatural fears, these groups encountered each other, but without the leisure to speak, to consult, to advise, for the showers fell now frequently, though not continuously, extinguishing the lights which showed to each band the death-like faces of the other, 
and hurrying all to seek refuge beneath the nearest shelter. The whole elements of civilization were broken up. Ever and anon, by the flickering lights, you saw the thief hastening by the most solemn authorities of the law, laden with and fearfully chuckling over the produce of his sudden gains. If, in the darkness, wife was separated from husband or parent from child, vain was the hope of reunion. Each hurried blindly and confusedly on. Nothing in all the various and complicated machinery of social life was left, save the primal law of self-preservation. In parts where the ashes lay dry and uncomixed with the boiling torrents, cast upward from the mountain at capricious intervals, the surface of the earth presented a leprous and ghastly white. In other places, cinder and rock lay matted in heaps, from beneath which emerged the half-hid limbs of some crushed and mangled fugitive. The groans of the dying were broken by wild shrieks of women's terror, now near, now distant, which, when heard in the utter darkness, were rendered doubly appalling by the crushing sense of helplessness and the uncertainty of the perils around, and clear and distinct through all were the mighty and various noises from the fatal mountain its rushing winds, its whirling torrents, and from time to time the burst and roar of some more fiery and fierce explosion. And ever as the winds swept howling along the street, they bore sharp streams of burning dust, and such sickening and poisonous vapors as took away, for the instant, breath and consciousness, followed by a rapid revulsion of the arrested blood, and a tingling sensation of agony trembling through every nerve and fiber of the frame. Suddenly all became lighted with an intense and lurid glow. Bright and gigantic through the darkness, which closed around it like the walls of hell, the mountain shone, a pile of fire. Its summit seemed riven in two, or rather above its surface, there seemed to rise two monster shapes, each confronting each, as demons contending for a world. These were of one deep, blood-red hue of fire, which lighted up the whole atmosphere far and wide. But below, the nether part of the mountain was still dark and shrouded, save in three places, adown which flowed serpentine and irregular rivers of molten lava. Darkly red through the profound gloom of their banks, they flowed slowly on, as toward the devoted city. Over the broadest there seemed to spring a cragged and stupendous arch, from which, as from the jaws of hell, gushed the sources of the sudden phlegethon and through the still air was heard the rattling of the fragments of rock, hurtling one upon another as they were borne down the fiery cataracts, darkening for one instant the spot where they fell, and suffused the next in the burnished hues of the flood in which they floated. Nearly seventeen centuries had rolled away when the city of Pompeii was disinterred from its silent tomb. Footnote. Destroyed A.D. 79, first discovered A.D. 1750. End of footnote. All vivid with undimmed hues, its walls fresh as if painted yesterday. Not a hue faded on the rich mosaic of its floors. In its forum the half-finished columns, as left by the workman's hand. In its gardens the sacrificial tripod. In its halls the chest of treasure. In its baths the strigil. In its theaters the counter of admission. In its saloons the furniture and the lamp. In its triclinia, the fragments of the last feast. In its cubicula, the perfumes and the rouge of faded beauty. And everywhere, the bones and skeletons of those who once moved the springs of that minute yet gorgeous machine of luxury and life. In the house of Diomed, in the subterranean vaults, twenty skeletons, one of a babe, were discovered in one spot by the door, covered by a fine ashen dust, that had evidently been wafted slowly through the apertures until it had filled the whole space. There were jewels and coins, candelabra for unavailing light, and wine hardened in the amphorae for the prolongation of agonized life. The sand, consolidated by damps, had taken the forms of the skeletons, as in a cast, and the traveler may yet see the impression of a female neck and bosom of young and round proportions, it seems to the inquirer as if the air had been gradually changed into a sulphurous vapor. The inmates of the vaults had rushed to the door to find it closed and blocked up by the scoria without, and in their attempts to force it had been suffocated with the atmosphere. In the garden was found a skeleton with a key by its bony hand, and near it a bag of coins. 
This is believed to have been the master of the house, who had probably sought to escape by the garden, and been destroyed either by the vapours or some fragment of stone. Besides some silver vases lay another skeleton, probably that of a slave. Various theories as to the exact mode by which Pompeii was destroyed have been invented by the ingenious. I have adopted that which is the most generally received, and which, upon inspecting the strata, appears the only one admissible by common sense, namely a destruction by showers of ashes and boiling water mingled with frequent eruptions of large stones, and aided by partial convulsions of the earth. Herculaneum, on the contrary, appears to have received not only the showers of ashes, but also inundations from molten lava, and the streams referred to must be considered as destined for that city rather than for Pompeii. Volcanic lightnings were evidently among the engines of ruin at Pompeii. Papyrus and other of the more inflammable materials are found in a burned state. Some substances in metal are partially melted, and a bronze statue is completely shivered as by lightning. Upon the whole, accepting only the inevitable poetic license of shortening the time which the destruction occupied, I believe my description of that awful event is very little assisted by invention, and will be found not the less accurate for its appearance in a romance. End of section 22. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rudd. The Jews' Last Struggle for Freedom. Their final dispersion, A.D. 132. Charles Merivale. The successful revolt of the Maccabees against the bloody persecutions of the Assyrian king Antiochus Epiphanes about B.C. 164 inaugurated a glorious epoch in Jewish history. From that time, the Jews enjoyed their freedom under the dynasty of their present kings till B.C. 63. The Romans under Pompey took possession of Jerusalem. A period of Roman tyranny and oppression followed. In A.D. 66 through 70, a great revolt of the Jews occurred. The Romans burned Jerusalem to the ground. Josephus says the number killed in this revolt was 1,100,000, and the number of prisoners 97,000. Of those who survived, all above 17 years old were sent to Egypt to work in the mines, or distributed among the provinces, to be exhibited as gladiators in the public theaters and in the combats against wild beasts. About 50 years later, A.D. 116, a tremendous uprising occurred among the Jews of the eastern Mediterranean, in which many lives were lost. It was quickly suppressed by the emperor Trajan, and the punishments were similar in cruelty to those which followed the previous insurrection. But this dauntless people were not yet conquered. When the Emperor Hadrian, A.D. 130, arrived at Jerusalem on his tour of the empire, he resolved that the holy city of the Jews should be rebuilt as a Roman colony, and its name changed to Aelia Capitolina, and the Jews were forbidden to sojourn in the new city. By this and other measures, the spark of revolt was once more kindled among the religious and patriotic spirits of the Jewish nation. The Jews in Palestine flew to arms, A.D. 132. Encouraged by the prayers, the vows, and the material support of their compatriots in Rome, Byzantium, Alexandria, and Babylon, the Jewish war cry echoed around the civilized world. A fitting leader for the insurrectionists soon appeared, in the person of Simon bar Kochabas. Julius Severus, who was in Britain ordering the affairs of that distant province, was summoned to the east to quell the disturbance, which had swollen to the dimensions of a revolution and threatened to abolish Roman authority in Palestine. The conflict which ensued lasted from A.D. 132 to 135, 
and was very bitterly contested on both sides. It was not before the Hebrew leader fell amid thousands of his followers that the Jewish forces were defeated. We are told that in this last revolution the Romans took fifty fortresses, nine hundred and eighty-five villages were occupied, and that the people killed numbered five hundred and eighty thousand. The Jews were dispersed to every quarter of the known world and remain so to this day. The new city of Hadrian continued to exist, but did not prosper, and the Jews were prohibited under penalty of death from ever setting foot in Jerusalem. The thread of imperial life could hardly snap without a jar, which would be felt throughout the whole extent of the empire. Trajan, like Alexander, had been cut off suddenly in the Far East, and like Alexander he had left no avowed successor. Several of his generals abroad might advance nearly equal claims to the sword of Trajan. Some of the senators at home might deem themselves not unworthy of the purple of Nerva. On every side there was an army or faction ready to devote itself to the service of its favorite or its champion. The provinces lately annexed were at the same time in a state of ominous agitation along one half of the frontiers. Britons, Germans, and Sarmatians were mustering their forces for invasion. A virulent insurrection was still glowing throughout a large portion of the empire. Nevertheless, the compact body of the Roman commonwealth was still held firmly together by its inherent self-attraction. There was no tendency to split in pieces, as in the ill-cemented masses of the Macedonian conquest and the presence of mind of a clever woman was well employed in effecting the peaceful transfer of power and relieving the state from the stress of disruption. Of the accession of Publius Aelius Hadrianus, A.D. 117, to the empire, of the means by which it was effected, of the character and reputation he brought with him to the throne, of the first measures of his reign, by which he renounced the latest conquests of his predecessor, while he put forth all his power to retain the realms bequeathed him from an earlier period, is matter for another story. But let us turn to a review of Eastern affairs, to the great Jewish insurrection, and the important consequences which followed from it. Trajan was surely fortunate in the moment of his death, Vexed as he doubtless was by the frustration of his grand designs for incorporating the Parthian monarchy with the Roman, and fulfilling the idea of universal empire which had flitted through the mind of Pompeius and Julius, but had been deliberately rejected by Augustus and Vespasian, his proud spirit would have been broken indeed had he lived to witness the difficulties in which Rome was plunged at his death. The spread of the Jewish revolt in Asia and Palestine, the aggression of the Moors, the Scythians, and the Britons at the most distant points of his dominions. The momentary success of the insurgents of Cyprus and Cyrene had prompted a general assurance that the conquering race was no longer invincible, and that the last great triumphs of its legions were followed by a rebound of fortune, still more momentous. The first act of the new reign was the formal relinquishment of the new provinces beyond the Euphrates. The Parthian tottered back with feeble step to his accustomed frontiers. Arabia was left unmolested. India was no longer menaced. Armenia found herself once more suspended between two rival empires, of which the one was too weak to seize, the other too weak to retain her. All the forces of Rome in the east were now set free to complete the suppression of the Jewish disturbances. The flames of insurrection which had broken out in so many remote quarters were concentrated and burned more fiercely than ever in the ancient center of the Jewish nationality. Martius Turbo, appointed to command in Palestine, was equally amazed at the fanaticism and the numbers of people whose faith had been mocked whose hopes frustrated, whose young men had been decimated, whose old men, women, and children had been enslaved and exiled. Under the teachings of the doctors of Tiberia, faith had been cherished and hope had revived. 
despised and unmolested for fifty years, a new generation had risen from the soil of their ancestors, recruited by the multitudes who flocked homeward year by year, with an unextinguishable love of country, and reinforced by the fugitives from many scenes of persecution, all animated with a growing conviction that the last struggle of their race was at hand, to be contested on the site of their old historic triumphs. It is not perhaps wholly fanciful to imagine that the Jewish leaders, after the fall of their city and temple and the great dispersion of their people, deliberately invented new means for maintaining their cherished nationality. Their conquerors, as they might observe, were scattered like themselves over the face of the globe and abode wherever they conquered. But the laws, the manners, and the traditions of Rome were preserved almost intact amid alien races by the consciousness that there existed a visible center of their nation, the source, as it were, to which they might repair to draw the waters of political life. But the dispersion of the Jews seemed the more irremediable as the destruction of their central home was complete. To preserve the existence of their nation, one other way presented itself. In their sacred books they retained a common bond of law and doctrine, such as no other people could boast. In these venerated records they possessed, whether on the Tiber or the Euphrates, an elixir of unrivaled virtue. With a sudden revulsion of feeling, the popular orators and captains betook themselves to the study of law, its history and antiquities, its actual text and its inner meaning. The schools of Tiberius resounded with debate on the rival principles of interpretation, the ancient and the modern, the stricter and the laxer, known respectively by the names of their teachers, Shammai and Hillel. The doctors decided in favor of the more accommodating system, by which the stern exclusiveness of the original letter was extenuated, and the law of the rude tribes of Palestine molded to the varied taste and temper of a cosmopolitan society, while the text itself was embalmed in the Masora, an elaborate system of punctuation and notation to every particle of which to ensure its uncorrupted preservation, a mystical significance was attached. By this curious contrivance, the letter of the law, the character of Judaism, was sanctified forever, while its spirit was remodeled to the exigencies of the present or the future, till it would have been no longer recognized by its authors or even by very recent disciples. To this new learning of tradition and glosses, the ardent youth of the nation devoted itself, with a fanaticism not less vehement than that which had fought and bled half a century before. The name of Rabbi Akiba is preserved as a type of the Hierophant of Restored Judaism. The stories depicting him are best expounded as myths and figures. He reached, it was said, the age of 120 years, the period assigned in the sacred records to his prototype, the lawgiver Moses. Like David, in his youth he kept sheep on the mountains. Like Jacob, he served a master, a rich citizen of Jerusalem, for Jerusalem in his youth was still standing. His master's daughter cast the eyes of affection upon him and offered him a secret marriage. But this damsel was no other than Jerusalem itself, so often imaged to the mind of the Jewish people by the figure of a maiden, a wife or a widow. This mystic bride required him to repair to the schools, acquire knowledge and wisdom, surround himself with disciples, and such, as we have seen, was the actual policy of the new defenders of Judaism. The damsel was rebuked by her indignant father, but when, after the lapse of twelve years, Akiba returned to claim his bride, with twelve thousand scholars at his heels, he heard her replying that, long as he had been absent, she only wished him to prolong his stay twice over so as to double his knowledge. Whereupon he returned patiently to his studies, 
and frequented the schools twelve years longer. Twice twelve years thus passed, he returned once more with twice twelve thousand disciples, and then his wife received him joyfully, and covered as she was with rags, an outcast and a beggar, he presented her to his astonished followers as the being to whom he owed his wisdom, his fame, and his fortune. Such were the legends with which new learning was consecrated to the defense of Jewish nationality. The concentration of the Roman forces on the soil of Palestine seems to have repressed, for a season, all overt attempts at insurrection. The Jewish leaders restrained their followers from action as long as it was possible to feed their spirit with hopes only. It was not till about the fourteenth year of Hadrian's reign that the final revolt broke out. When the Jews of Palestine launched forth upon the war, the doctor Akiba gave place to the warrior Bar Kochabas. This gallant warrior, the last of the national heroes, received or assumed his title, the Son of the Star, given successively to several leaders of the Jewish people, in token of the fanatic expectations of divine deliverance, by which his countrymen did not yet cease to be animated. Many were the legends which declared this champion's claims to the leadership of the national cause. His size and strength were vaunted as more than human. It was the arm of God, not of man, said Hadrian, when he saw at last the corpse encircled by a serpent. That could alone strike down the giant. Flame and smoke were seen to issue from his lips in speaking, a portent which was rationalized centuries later into a mere conjurer's artifice. The concourse of the Jewish nation at his summons was symbolized with a curious reference to the prevalent idea of Israel as a school and the law as a master, by the story that at Bethar the appointed rendezvous and last stronghold of the national defense were four hundred academies, each ruled by four hundred teachers, each teacher boasting a class of four hundred pupils. Akiba, now at the extreme point of his protracted existence, like Samuel of old, nominated the new David to the chiefship of the people. He girded bar with the sword of Jehovah, placed the staff of command in his hand, and held himself the stirrup by which he vaulted into the saddle. The last revolt of the Jewish people was precipitated apparently by the increased severity of the measures which the rebellion under Trajan had drawn down. They complained that Hadrian had enrolled himself as a proselyte of the law and were doubly incensed against him as a persecutor and a renegade. This assertion, indeed, may have no foundation. On the other hand, it is not unlikely that this prince, a curious explorer of religions, of opinions, had sought initiation into some of the mysteries of the Jewish faith and ritual. But however this may be, he gave them mortal offense by perceiving the clear distinction between Judaism and Christianity, and by forbidding the Jews to sojourn in the town which he was again raising on the ruins of Jerusalem, while he allowed free access to their rivals. He is said to even prohibited the right of circumcision by which they jealously maintained their separation from the nations of the West. At last, when they rose in arms, he sent his best generals against them. Tinius Rufus was long baffled and often defeated, but Julius Severus, following the tactics of Vespasian, constantly refused the battle they offered him and reduced their strongholds in succession by superior discipline and resources. But Kochabas struggled with the obstinacy of despair. Every excess of cruelty was committed on both sides and it is well, perhaps, that the details of this mortal spasm are almost wholly lost to us. The later Christian writers, while they allude with unseemly exultation to the overthrow of one inveterate enemy by another who proved himself 
in the end not less inveterate, affirmed that the barbarities of the Jewish leader were mainly directed against themselves. On such interested assertions we shall place little reliance. In the counter-narration of the Jews, even the name of Christians is contemptuously disregarded. It relates, however, how at the storming of Bethar, when Bar Kokhobas perished in the field, ten of the most learned of the rabbis were taken and put cruelly to death, while Akiba reserved to expire last and torn in pieces with hot pincers continued to attest the great principle of the Jewish doctrine, still exclaiming in his death throes, Jehovah Erhad, God is one. The Jews who fell in these, their latest combats, are counted by hundreds of thousands, and we may conclude that the suppression of the revolt was followed by sanguinary proscriptions, by wholesale captivity and general banishment. The dispersion of the unhappy race, particularly in the West, was now complete and final. The sacred soil of Jerusalem was occupied by a Roman colony, which received the name of Alia Capitolina, with reference to the emperor who founded it, and to the supreme god of the pagan mythology installed on the desecrated summits of Zion and Moriah. The fane of Jupiter was erected on the site of the holy temple, and a shrine of Venus planted, we are assured, on the very spot hallowed to Christians by our Lord's crucifixion. But Hadrian had no purpose of insulting the disciples of Jesus, and this desecration, if the tradition be true, was probably accidental. A Jewish legend affirms that the figure of a swine was sculpted in bitter mockery, over a gate of the new city. The Jews have retorted with equal scorn that the effigy of the unclean animal which represented to their minds every low and bestial appetite was a fitting emblem of the colony and its founder, of the lewd worship of its gods, and the vile propensities of its emperor. The fancy of later Christian writers that Hadrian regarded their co-religionists with special consideration seems founded as misconception. We hear indeed of the graciousness with which he allowed them, among other sectarians, to defend their usages and expound their doctrines in his presence. And doubtless his curiosity, if no worthier feeling, was moved by the fact which he fully appreciated of the interest they excited in certain quarters of the empire. But there is no evidence that his favor extended further than to the recognition of their independence of the Jews, from whom they now formally separated themselves, and the discouragement of the local persecutions to which they were occasionally subjected. So far the bigoted hostility of their enemies was overruled at last in their favor. In another way, they learn to profit by the examples of their rivals. From the recent policy of the Jews, they might understand the advantage to a scattered community, without a local center or a political status, of erecting in a volume of sacred records their acknowledged standard of faith and practice. The scriptures of the New Testament, like the Nushua of the Jewish rabbis, took the place of the Holy of Holies as the tabernacle of their God and the pledge of their union with Him. The canon of their sacred books, however casual its apparent formation, was indeed a providential development. The habitual references of bishops and doctors to the words of their founder and the writings of the first disciples guided them to the proper sources of their faith and taught them justly to discriminate the genuine from the spurious. Meager as are the remains of Christian literature of the second century, they tend to confirm our assurance that the scriptures of the new dispensation were known and recognized as divine at that early period, and that the Church of Christ, the future mistress of the world, was already become a great social fact, an empire within the empire. End of section 23.
Section 24 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Martyrdom of Polycarp and Justin Martyr, A.D. 155, by Homersham Cox. The Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius, who died A.D. 161, had been tolerant to the new Judaic sect known as Christians. Under his mild regime, although he did not encourage them, the faithful had greatly multiplied. The Christians had become a body great enough to be reckoned with in a political sense. The populace were generally hostile to them as enemies of the gods. More than one of the apostolic fathers had suffered martyrdom, among them Ignatius, a disciple of St. John and Bishop of Antioch, who is said to have been thrown to the lions in the circus about A.D. 107. But the account of the martyrdom of Polycarp is probably the first authentic description we have. Polycarp was born about A.D. 60, probably of Christian parents. He bridges the little-known period between the age of his master, the Apostle John, and that of his own disciple, Irenaeus. During the earlier half of the second century, he was Bishop of Smyrna. Ephesus had become the new hope of the faith, and in that city Polycarp had received his education and lived in familiar intercourse with many who had seen Christ. He was also intimate with Papias and Ignatius. The only writing of Polycarp extant is the Epistle to the Philippians, which follows. It is of great value for questions of the canon, the origin of the church, and the Ignatian epistles. Of the authenticity of Polycarp's epistle, Rev. Father W. O. B. Pardo, S.J., says, There are long and learned controversies about some of these apocryphal books. Of that in question, he says, probably authentic, not inspired. Archbishop Wake was fully convinced of its genuineness, and his translation has been here used. Justin, surnamed the Martyr, was born at Sitchin, Samaria, about A.D. 100. After his conversion to Christianity, he wandered about arguing for the truth of the new faith. He was of a bold, aggressive nature, and scorned to temporize in things spiritual. His language and mode of address were borrowed from the Stoics, but were the true utterance of his own manly soul. You can kill us, you cannot harm us, was his answer, when condemned for being a Christian. The words proceeded from a believer ready and destined to give his life for the faith. Truly did the blood of the martyrs prove the seed of the church. Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians, hereto annexed, is taken from a rare work which contains the uncanonical books of the period of Christ's infancy and the early days of the church, entitled The Apocryphal Books of the New Testament. The laity have little knowledge of it, but it is well known by the clergy. Homersham Cox Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, was undoubtedly a companion of the Apostle John, and received instruction from other apostles. About this time, says Eusebius, referring to the commencement of the second century, flourished Polycarp in Asia, an intimate disciple of the apostles, who received the episcopate of the Church of Smyrna at the hands of eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. The lengthened life of the Apostle John, who attained to an extreme old age, connects the fathers of the second century with the immediate followers of Christ. Polycarp must have been a contemporary of St. John for about twenty years. A letter of Irenaeus, who was a pupil of Polycarp, has been preserved, which gives a graphic and remarkably interesting account of the familiar intercourse of Polycarp with the Apostle. The letter is addressed by Irenaeus to a friend named Florinus, with whom he remonstrates for holding erroneous doctrines. These doctrines, O Florinus, to say the least, are not of a sound understanding. These doctrines are inconsistent with the Church, and calculated to thrust those that follow them into the greatest impiety. These doctrines not even the heretics out of the Church ever attempted to assert. These doctrines were never delivered to thee by the presbyters before us, those who also were the immediate disciples of the apostles. For I saw thee when I was yet a boy in Lower Asia, with Polycarp moving in great splendor at court, and endeavoring by all means to gain his esteem. 
I remember the events of those times much better than those of more recent occurrence, as the studies of our youth growing with our minds unite with them so firmly that I can tell also the very place where the blessed Polycarp was accustomed to sit and discourse, and also his entrances, his walks, his manner of life, the form of his body, his conversations with the people and familiar intercourse with John, as he was accustomed to tell, as also his familiarity with those that had seen the Lord, also concerning his miracles, his doctrine. All these were told by Polycarp in consistency with the Holy Scriptures, and he had received them from the eyewitnesses of the doctrine of salvation. These things, by the mercy of God and the opportunity then afforded me, I attentively heard, noting them down, not on paper, but in my heart. And these same facts I am always in the habit, by the grace of God, of recalling faithfully to mind. And I can bear witness in the sight of God, that if that blessed and apostolic presbyter had heard any such thing as this, he would have exclaimed and stopped his ears, and according to his custom would have said, O oh, good God, unto what things hast thou reserved me, that I should tolerate these things? He would have fled from the place in which he had sat or stood hearing doctrines like these. From his epistles also, which he wrote to the neighboring churches in order to confirm them, or to some of the brethren in order to admonish or exhort them, the same thing may be clearly shown. In another place, Irenaeus states that Polycarp was appointed Bishop of Smyrna by the Apostles themselves. Polycarp also was not only instructed by Apostles, and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by Apostles in Asia appointed Bishop of the Church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he lived a very long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught those things which he had learned from the apostles, and which the church has handed down, and which alone are true. Of the numerous letters which Polycarp, as Bishop of Smyrna, wrote to the neighboring churches, only one is extant. It is addressed by Polycarp and the presbyters with him to the Church of God sojourning at Philippi, and probably was written about the middle of the second century. In this epistle he praises the Philippians for their firm Christian faith, and exhorts them to adhere to the doctrine which St. Paul had taught them by word of mouth and by his epistle. After various exhortations to presbyters, deacons, and other members of the church, Polycarp refers to the martyrdom of Ignatius, but apparently was ignorant of the circumstances attending it, for the epistle concludes with a request for information respecting him. The martyrdom of Polycarp himself is described in an epistle addressed by the Church of Smyrna, of which he was bishop, to the church of Philomelium, a city of the neighboring province of Phrygia. There are probably some interpolations, but accepting these, the document can hardly be of much later date than the death of the martyr. There are several reasons for this conclusion. In the first place, the general tenor shows that it is intended to give information of events which had recently happened. Secondly, a postscript states that a copy of it belonged to Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp. And thirdly, a large part of it is transcribed by Eusebius, who treats it as an authentic document. The date of the death of Polycarp is well ascertained to be A.D. 167, in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. For some time previously, there had been a cruel persecution of the Christians at Smyrna, in which both the Gentile and Jewish inhabitants took part. Against Polycarp especially, as the chief minister of the Christian church, their hostility was directed. After several Christians had been tortured and thrown to the lions, the multitude clamored for the death of the bishop. Yielding to the urgent entreaties of those around him, Polycarp quitted the city, but he was pursued and brought back. The proconsul, who had reluctantly allowed him to be arrested, was anxious to save him. When he was led forward, a great tumult arose among those that heard he was taken. At length, as he advanced, the proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp, and, he answering that he was, he urged him to deny Christ, saying, Have a regard for your age, and adding similar expressions, such as are usual for them to employ. Swear, he said, by the genius of Caesar, repent, say, away with those that deny the gods. But Polycarp, with a countenance grave and serious, and contemplating the whole multitude that were collected in the stadium, beckoned with his hand to them, and with a sigh looked up to heaven and said, Away with the atheists. 
The governor continued to urge him again, saying, Swear, and I will dismiss you. Revile Christ. Revile Christ, Polycarp replied. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me wrong. And how can I now blaspheme my king who has saved me? The governor continued to urge him, and in vain threatened him with the wild beasts. At length the herald was ordered to proclaim in the midst of the stadium that Polycarp confesses he is a Christian. Thereupon the multitude cried out, This is that teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, and demanded that he should be burned alive, and the governor gave sentence accordingly. According to the horrid custom of the times, the executioners were about to fasten his hands to the stake by spikes, when he begged that he might be bound merely, saying that he who gave him strength to bear the flames would also give him strength to remain unmoved on the pyre. This last request was granted, and being bound to the stake, he uttered this beautiful prayer, Father of thy well-beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the knowledge of thee, the God of angels and powers and all creation, and of all the family of the righteous that live before thee, I bless thee that thou hast thought me worthy of the present day and hour to have a share in the number of the martyrs and in the cross of Christ unto the resurrection of eternal life both of the soul and body, in the incorruptible felicity of the Holy Spirit, among whom may I be received in thy sight this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as thou, the faithful and true God, hast prepared, hast revealed, and fulfilled. Wherefore, on this account, and for all things, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee through the eternal High Priest, Jesus Christ, thy well-beloved Son, through whom glory be to thee with him and the Holy Ghost, both now and evermore. Amen. The flames did not immediately seize upon his body, so one of the executioners, in mercy perhaps, plunged a sword into his body and so ended his sufferings. The centurion then placed the body in the midst of the fire and burned it, according to the custom of the Gentiles. Thus at last, taking up his bones, valued more than precious stones, more tried than gold, we deposited them where they should be. There also, as far as we can, the Lord will grant us to celebrate the natal day of his martyrdom in joy and gladness, both in commemoration of those who finished their contest before, and to prepare those that shall be hereafter. There is something wonderfully touching in this reference to the natal day of his martyrdom. Those who wrote it thought that the day on which Polycarp was pierced by the sword was not the day of his death, but the birthday of a new and happier life. Justin, who from the manner of his death is often called Justin Martyr, was a native of Samaria. He was of Roman parentage and was born early in the second century, and therefore must have been contemporary with many persons who had seen some of the apostles. Justin, who is addicted to philosophical pursuits, has given in one of his works a very curious account of his studies and search after religious truth. First, he thought to find it in the Stoic philosophy. I surrendered myself to a certain Stoic, and having spent a considerable time with him, when I had not acquired any further knowledge of God, for he did not know it himself, and said such instruction was unnecessary, I left him, and betook myself to another, who was called a peripatetic, and, as he fancied, shrewd. And this man, after having entertained me for a few days, requested me to settle the fee, in order that our intercourse might not be unprofitable. Him, too, for this reason I abandoned, believing him to be no philosopher at all. Disgusted with the mercenary spirit of the peripatetic, the inquirer next determined to make a trial of Pythagorean philosophy. But the celebrated Pythagorean teacher whom he consulted wished him to learn music, astronomy, and geometry. Those kinds of knowledge, however, were not what Justin wanted, and besides he thought that they would take up too much time. So he next resolved to make a trial of Platonism, and this time he was more successful. In my helpless condition it occurred to me to have a meeting with the Platonists, for their fame was great. I thereupon spent as much of my time as possible with one who had lately settled in our city, a sagacious man holding a high position among the Platonists and I progressed and made the greatest improvements daily, and the perception of immaterial things quite overpowered me, and the contemplation of ideas furnished my mind with wings, so that in a little, while I supposed that I had become wise, and such was my folly that I expected forthwith to look upon God, for this is the end of Plato's philosophy. 
Justin then proceeds to give a remarkably interesting and graphic account of his conversion to Christianity. And while I was thus disposed, when I wished to be filled with great quietness and to shun the path of men, I used to go into a certain field not far from the sea. And when I was near that spot one day, where I purposed to be by myself, a certain old man of dignified appearance, exhibiting meek and venerable manners, followed me at a little distance. And when I turned around on him, having halted, I fixed my eyes rather keenly upon him. Justin gets into conversation with the old man and says that he delights in solitary spots where his attention is not distracted and where his converse with himself is uninterrupted and proceeds to a fervid laudation of philosophy. Does philosophy then make happiness, said he interrupting? Assuredly, said I, and it alone. What then is philosophy, he said, and what is happiness? Pray tell me, unless something hinders you from saying. Philosophy, said I, is a knowledge of that which really exists and a clear perception of truth, and happiness is the reward of such knowledge and wisdom. But what do you call God, said he, that which always maintains the same nature and is the cause of all other things, that indeed is God. So I answered him, and he listened with pleasure. The conversation, which is too long to be fully transcribed, turns on the attributes of the soul, Justin discourses on that topic after the manner of the Platonists. The old man, on the other hand, urges him to study the prophets of the Old Testament, for they predicted the coming of Christ, and their prophecies have been fulfilled. They, said he, both glorified the Creator, the God and Father of all, and proclaimed his Son the Christ sent by him. But, he added, pray that above all things the gates of light may be opened to you, for these things cannot be perceived or understood by all but only by him to whom God and his Christ have imparted wisdom. When he had spoken these and many other things, which there is no time for mentioning at present, he went away, bidding me attend to them, and I have not seen him since. But straightway a flame was kindled in my soul, and a love of the prophets and of those men who are friends of Christ possessed me. And whilst revolving his words in my mind, I found this philosophy alone to be safe and profitable. Thus, and for this reason, I am a philosopher. Moreover, I would that all, making a resolution similar to my own, would regard the words of the Saviour, for they possess a terrible power in themselves, and are sufficient to inspire those who turn aside from the path of rectitude with all, while the sweetest rest is afforded to those who diligently observe them. The dialogue from which these passages are taken is a real or imaginary disputation with Trypho, a learned Jew at Ephesus, respecting the principles of Christianity, and contains an elaborate demonstration that Christ is the Messiah of the Old Testament. The controversy is carried on with courtesy on both sides, and each disputant is equally earnest in his attempt to convert the other. Justin was a very copious writer. The two most important of his writings now remaining are the two Apologies, these are certainly the two earliest of the numerous ancient pleas for toleration of Christianity now extant. The first, Apologia, is addressed to the Emperor Antoninus Pius and the Roman Senate and the whole people of the Romans, and the purport of it may be inferred from the commencement, in which Justin says that he presents this address and petition in behalf of all nations who were unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. The second apologia was addressed to the Roman Senate, probably in the reign of Antoninus Marcus Aurelius, and successor of Antoninus Pius. In this work, Justin appeals indignantly to the Roman Senate against the unjust conduct of one Urbicus, who at Rome had condemned several persons to death simply because they professed to be Christians. This Urbicus seems to have held the office of prefect of the city, a magistrate from whom there was no appeal except to the prince himself, or, as this apologia would suggest, to the senate. The two apologies contain the most vehement invectives against the whole system of heathen idolatry, and accuse Jupiter and the other gods whom the Romans revered of ineffable vices. Of course, the man who could thus tell the Roman senate and people that all they held sacred was unspeakably and hideously wicked could expect but one fate, Justin threw down the gauntlet, and the constituted authorities very quietly took it up, with the result which, as the human power was all with them, it was not difficult to foresee. Sometime in the reign of Aurelius, but in what year is not known, 
Justin and several other Christians were accused before Rusticus, prefect of Rome, of disobedience to certain decrees then in force, by which Christians who refused to sacrifice to the gods were liable to be put to death. It is difficult to reconcile the passing of these decrees with the known character of Aurelius, who is universally described as a humane, as a benevolent king. The probable explanation is that, like his predecessor Trajan, he was actuated by motives of state policy and regarded Christianity as rebellion against the authority of the state. Eusebius has given an account of the martyrdom of Justin upon the authority of Tatian, who was a disciple of the martyr. This account substantially agrees with the very ancient martyrdom of Justin, which concludes thus. The prefect says to Justin, Hearken, you who are called learned and think that you know true doctrines, if you are scourged and beheaded, do you believe that you will ascend into heaven? Justin said, I hope that if I endure these things I shall have this gift, for I know that to all who have thus lived there abides the divine favor until the completion of the world. Rusticus, the prefect, said, Do you suppose that you will ascend into heaven to receive such a recompense? Justin said, I do not suppose it, but I know and am fully persuaded of it. Thus also said the other Christians, Do what you will, for we are Christians, and do not sacrifice to idols. Rusticus, the prefect, pronounced sentence, saying, Let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to yield to the command of the emperor be scourged and led away to suffer decapitation according to the law. The holy martyrs, having glorified God and having gone forth to the accustomed place, were beheaded and perfected their testimony in the confession of the Savior. And some of the faithful, having secretly removed their bodies, laid them in a suitable place, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ having wrought along with them, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of section 24. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 25 of The Great Events by Famous Historians. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Martyrdom of Polycarp and Justin Martyr. The Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, A.D. 155, by Polycarp. Polycarp and the presbyters that are with him. To the church of God which is at Philippi, mercy unto you and peace from God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, be multiplied. I rejoice greatly with you in our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye receive the images of a true love and accompanied as it is behooved you those who were in bonds becoming saints which are the crowns of such as are truly chosen by god and our lord as also that the root of the faith which was preached from ancient times remains firm in you to this day and brings forth fruit to our lord jesus christ who suffered himself to be brought even to the death for our sins whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, into which many desire to enter, knowing that by grace ye are saved, not by works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Wherefore, girding up the loins of your minds, serve the Lord with fear and in truth, laying aside all empty and vain speech and the error of many believing in him that raised up our lord jesus christ from the dead and hath given him glory and a throne at his right hand to whom all things are made subject both that are in heaven and that are in earth whom every living creature shall worship who shall come to be the judge of the quick and the dead whose blood god shall require of them that believe in him but he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also raise us up in like manner, if we do his will and walk according to his commandments, and love those things which he loved, abstaining from all unrighteousness, inordinate affection, and love of money. 
from evil speaking false witness not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing or striking for striking or cursing for cursing but remembering what the lord has taught us saying judge not and ye shall not be judged forgive and ye shall be forgiven be merciful and ye shall obtain mercy for with the same measure that ye meet with all it shall be measured to you again and again that blessed are the poor and that they are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of god these things my brethren i took not the liberty of myself to write unto you concerning righteousness but you yourselves before encouraged me to it for neither can i nor any other such as i am come up to the wisdom of the blessed and renowned paul who being himself in person with those who then lived did with all exactness and soundness teach the word of truth and being gone from you wrote an epistle to you into which if you look you will be able to edify yourselves in the faith that has been delivered unto you which is the mother of us all being followed with hope and led on by a general love both toward god and toward christ and toward our neighbor for if any man has these things he has fulfilled the law of righteousness for he that has charity is far from sin but the love of money is the root of all evil knowing therefore that as we brought nothing into this world so neither may we carry anything out let us arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness and teach ourselves first to walk according to the commandments of the lord and then your wives to walk likewise according to the faith that is given to them in charity and in purity loving their own husbands with all sincerity and all others alike with all temperance and to bring up their children in the instruction and fear of the lord the widows likewise teach that they be sober as to what concerns the faith of the lord praying always for all men being far from all distraction evil speaking false witness from covetedness and from all evil knowing that they are the altars of god who sees all blemishes and from whom nothing is hid who searches out the very reasonings and thoughts and secrets of our hearts knowing therefore that god is not mocked we ought to walk worthy both of his command and of his glory also the deacons must be blameless before him as the ministers of god in christ and not of men not false accusers not double-tongued not lovers of money but moderate in all things compassionate careful walking according to the truth of the lord who is the servant of all whom if we please in this present world we shall also be made partakers of that which is to come according as he has promised to us that he will raise us from the dead and that if we shall walk worthy of him we shall also reign together with him if we believe in like manner the younger men must be unblameable in all things above all taking care of their purity and to restrain themselves from all evil for it is good to be cut off from the lusts that are in the world because every such lust warreth against the spirit and neither fornicators nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind shall inherit the kingdom of god nor they who do such things as are foolish and unreasonable wherefore ye must needs abstain from all these things being subject to the priests and deacons as unto god in christ the virgins admonish to walk in a spotless and pure conscience and let the elders be compassionate and merciful toward all turning them from their errors seeking out those who are weak not forgetting the widows the fatherless and the poor but always providing what is good in the sight of god and man abstaining from all wrath respect to persons and unrighteous judgment and especially being free from all covetedness not easy to believe anything against any nor severe in judgment knowing that we are all debtors in point of sin if therefore we pray to the lord that he would forgive us we ought also to forgive others for we are all in the sight of our lord and god and must all stand before the judgment seat of christ and shall every one give an account of himself let us therefore serve him in fear and with all reverence as both himself hath commanded 
and as the apostles who have preached the gospel unto us and the prophets who have foretold the coming of our lord have taught us being zealous of what is good abstaining from all offence and from false brethren and from those who bear the name of christ in hypocrisy who deceive vain men for whoever so does not confess that jesus christ is come in the flesh he is antichrist and whoever does not confess his suffering upon the cross is from the devil and whosoever perverts the oracles of the lord to his own lusts and says that there shall neither be any resurrection nor judgment he is the firstborn of satan wherefore leaving the vanity of many and their false doctrines let us return to the word that was delivered to us from the beginning watching unto prayer and persevering in fasting with supplication beseeching the all-seeing god not to lead us into temptation as the lord hath said the spirit is truly willing but the flesh is weak let us therefore without ceasing hold steadfastly to him who is our hope and the earnestness of our righteousness even jesus christ who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth but suffered all for us that we might live through him let us therefore imitate his patience and if we suffer for his name let us glorify him for this example he has given us by himself and so have we believed wherefore i exert all of you that ye obey the word of righteousness and exercise all patience which ye have set forth before our eyes not only in the blessed ignatius and zosimus and rufus but in others among ourselves and in paul himself and the rest of the apostles being confident in this that all these have not run in vain but in faith and righteousness and are gone to the place that was due to them from the lord with whom they also suffered for they love not this present world but him who died and was raised again by god for us stand therefore in these things and follow the example of the lord being firm and immutable in the faith lovers of the brotherhood lovers of one another companions together in the truth being kind and gentle toward each other despising none when it is in your power to do good defer it not for charity delivered from death be all of you subject one to another having your conversation honest among the gentiles that by your good works both ye yourselves may receive praise and the lord may not be blasphemed through you but woe be to him by whom the name of the lord is blasphemed therefore teach all men sobriety in which do ye also exercise yourselves i am greatly afflicted for valens who was once a presbyter among you that he should so little understand the place that was given to him in the church wherefore i admonish you that ye abstain from covetedness and that ye be chaste and true of speech keep yourselves from all evil for he that in these things cannot govern himself how shall he be able to prescribe them to another if a man does not keep himself from covetedness he shall be polluted with idolatry and be judged as if he were a gentile but who of you are ignorant of the judgment of god do we not know that the saints shall judge the world as paul teaches but i have neither perceived nor heard anything of this kind in you among whom the blessed paul labored and you are named in the beginning of his epistle for he glories of you in all the churches who then only knew god for we did not then know him wherefore my brethren i am exceedingly sorry both for him and for his wife to whom god grant a true repentance and be ye also moderate upon this occasion and look not upon such as enemies but call them back as suffering and erring members that ye may save your whole body for by doing so ye shall edify your own selves for i trust that ye are well exercised in the holy scriptures and that nothing is hid from you but at present it is not granted unto me to practise that which is written be angry and sin not and again let not the sun go down upon your wrath blessed be he that believeth and remembereth these things who also i trust you do 
now the god and father of our lord jesus christ and he himself who is our everlasting high priest the son of god even jesus christ build you up in faith and in truth and in all meekness and lenity in patience and long-suffering in forbearance and chastity and grant unto you a lot and portion among his saints and us with you and to all that are under the heavens who shall believe in our lord jesus christ and in his father who raised him from the dead pray for all the saints pray also for kings and all that are in authority and for those who persecute you and hate you and for the enemies of the cross that your fruit may be manifest in all and that ye may be perfect in christ ye wrote to me both ye and also ignatius that if any one went from hence into syria he should bring your letters with him which also i will take care of as soon as i shall have a convenient opportunity either by myself or him whom i shall send upon your account the epistles of ignatius which he wrote unto us together with what others of his have come to our hands we have sent to you according to your order which are subjoined to this epistle by which we may be greatly profited for they treat of faith and patience and of all things that pertain to edification in the lord jesus what you know certainly of ignatius and those that are with him signify to us these things i have written unto you by crescens whom by this present epistle i have recommended to you and do now again commend for he has had his conversation without blame among us and i suppose also with you ye also have regard unto his sister when she shall come unto you be ye safe in the lord jesus christ and in favour with all yours amen end of section twenty five section twenty six the great events by famous historians volume three this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Root. Persecution of the Christians in Gaul. A.D. 177 by Francois P. G. Guizot Part 1 That the persecutions of Christians under the Roman Empire should have been inaugurated by a Nero is not a subject of wonder in view of that emperor's character as depicted in history through all ages since his own. But it is difficult to understand how an emperor like Trajan an enlightened and humane ruler if he was powerless to prevent could have brought himself to give countenance to a policy at once so intolerant and cruel and in the end to prove so short-sighted a great cause prospers by persecution the martyr's spirit is strengthened by blows and faggots history has well proved the truth of that saying of the church fathers tersely given by st jerome est sanguis martyrium seminarium ecclesiarum the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church still more incomprehensible to modern students is the fact that marcus aurelius the imperial philosopher and benevolent man should also be stained with the infamy of the persecutions the charges brought against him as a cruel persecutor of the christians have given rise to much dispute among historical scholars among modern christian writers of favorable disposition toward marcus f w farrar has perhaps as clearly as any set forth the views that explain his conduct and vindicate his reputation for humanity that he shared the profound dislike with which christians were regarded is very probable that he was a cold-blooded and virulent persecutor is utterly unlike his whole character 
the deep calamities in which during his whole reign the empire was involved caused widespread distress and roused into peculiar fury the feelings of the provincials against men whose atheism for such they considered it to be had kindled the anger of the gods marcus when appealed to simply let the existing law take its course in like manner the purely official or legal view of human affairs often leads the most kindly and conscientious of men to pursue or acquiesce in policies against which in different situations their moral nature would rebel there were many reasons which led the populace to hate christians whom first of all they regarded as being unpatriotic while among romans it was considered the highest honor to possess the privileges of roman citizenship the christians announced that they were citizens of heaven they shrank from public office and military service again the ancient religion of rome was an adjunct of state dignity and ceremonial it was hallowed by a thousand traditional and patriotic associations the christians regarded its rites and its popular assemblies with contempt and abhorrence the romans viewed the secret meetings of the christians with suspicion and accused them of abominable excesses and crime they were known to have representatives in every important city of gaul spain italy and asia and the more their communities grew the more the roman populace raged against them only such considerations appear to mitigate the historical judgments against aurelius for marring the splendor of his reign by persecutions the tragedies enacted in the churches of lyon and vienne as described in the following pages form one of the most melancholy records of history when christianity began to penetrate into gaul it encountered there two religions very different one from the other and infinitely more different from the christian religion these were druidism and paganism hostile one to the other but with a hostility political only and unconnected with those really religious questions that christianity was coming to raise druidism considered as a religion was a mass of confusion wherein the instinctive notions of the human race concerning the origin and destiny of the world and of mankind were mingled with the oriental dreams of metempsychosis that pretended transmigration at successive periods of immortal souls into diverse creatures this confusion was worse confounded by traditions borrowed from the mythologies of the east and the north by shadowy remnants of a symbolical worship paid to the material forces of nature and by barbaric practices such as human sacrifices in honor of the gods or of the dead people who are without the scientific development of language and the art of writing do not attain to systematic and productive religious creeds there is nothing to show that from the first appearance of the gauls in history to their struggle with victorious rome the religious influence of druidism had caused any notable progress to be made in gallic manners and civilization a general and strong but vague and incoherent belief in the immortality of the soul was its noblest characteristic but with the religious elements at the same time coarse and mystical were united two facts of importance the druids formed a veritable ecclesiastical corporation which had throughout gallic society fixed attributes special manners and customs an existence at the same time distinct and national and in the wars with rome this corporation became the most faithful representatives and the most persistent defenders of gallic independence and nationality 
The Druids were far more a clergy than Druidism was a religion, but it was an organized and a patriotic clergy. It was especially on this account that they exercised in Gaul an influence which was still existent, particularly in northwestern Gaul, at the time when Christianity reached the Gallic provinces of the south and center. The Greco-Roman paganism was, at this time, far more powerful than Druidism in Gaul, and yet more lukewarm and destitute of all religious vitality. It was the religion of the conquerors and of the state, and was invested in that quality with real power, but beyond that it had but the power derived from popular customs and superstitions. As a religious creed, the Latin paganism was at bottom empty, indifferent, and inclined to tolerate all religions in the state, provided only that they, in their turn, were indifferent at any rate toward itself, and that they did not come troubling the state, either by disobeying her rulers, or by attacking her old deities, dead and buried beneath their own still-standing altars." Such were the two religions with which, in Gaul, nascent Christianity had to contend. Compared with them, it was, to all appearance, very small and very weak, but it was provided with the most efficient weapons for fighting and beating them, for it had exactly the moral forces which they lacked. Christianity, instead of being, like Druidism, a religion exclusively national and hostile to all that was foreign, proclaimed a universal religion free from all local and national partiality, addressing itself to all men in the name of the same God, and offering to all the same salvation. It is one of the strangest and most significant facts in history that the religion most universally human, most dissociated from every consideration but that of the rights and well-being of the human race in its entirety, that such a religion, be it repeated, should have come forth from the womb of the most exclusive, most rigorously and obstinately national religion that ever appeared in the world that is, Judaism. Such, nevertheless, was the birth of Christianity, and this wonderful contrast between the essence and the earthly origin of Christianity was, without doubt, one of its most powerful attractions and most efficacious means of success. Against paganism, Christianity was armed with moral forces not a whit less great, confronting mythological traditions and poetical or philosophical allegories appeared a religion truly religious concerned solely with the relations of mankind to god and with their eternal future to the pagan indifference of the roman world the christians opposed the profound conviction of their faith and not only their firmness in defending it against all powers and all dangers but also their ardent passion for propagating it without any motive but the yearning to make their fellows share in its benefits and its hopes they confronted, nay, they welcomed martyrdom, at one time to maintain their own Christianity, at another to make others Christians around them. Propagandism was for them a duty almost as imperative as fidelity. And it was not in memory of old and obsolete mythologies, but in the name of recent deeds and persons, in obedience to laws proceeding from God, one and universal, in fulfillment and continuation of a contemporary and superhuman history, that of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Son of Man, that the Christians of the first two centuries labored to convert to their faith the whole Roman world. Marcus Aurelius was contemptuously astonished at what he called the obstinacy of the Christians. He knew not from what source these nameless heroes drew a strength superior to his own, though he was at the same time emperor and sage 
It is impossible to assign with exactness the date of the first footprints and first labors of Christianity in Gaul. It was not, however, from Italy, nor in the Latin tongue and through Latin writers, but from the East and through the Greeks, that it first came and began to spread. Marseille and the different Greek colonies originally from Asia Minor and settled upon the shores of the Mediterranean or along the Rhone mark the route and were the places whither the first Christian missionaries carried their teaching. On this point the letters of the apostles and the writings of the first two generations of their disciples are clear and abiding proof. In the west of the empire, especially in Italy, the Christians at their first appearance were confounded with the Jews and comprehended under the same name. The emperor Claudius, says Suetonius, drove from Rome, A.D. 52, the Jews who, at the instigation of Christus, were in continual commotion. After the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus, A.D. 70, the Jews, Christian or not, dispersed throughout the empire, but the Christians were not slow to signalize themselves by their religious fervor and to come forward everywhere under their own true name. Leon became the chief center of Christian preaching and association in Gaul. As early as the first half of the second century there existed there a Christian congregation regularly organized as a church, and already sufficiently important to be in intimate and frequent communication with the Christian churches of the East and West. There is a tradition, generally admitted, that St. Pothinus, the first bishop of Lyon, was sent thither from the east by the bishop of Smyrna, St. Polycarp, himself a disciple of St. John. One thing is certain, that the Christian church of Lyon produced Gaul's first martyrs, among whom was the bishop, St. Pothinus. It was under Marcus Aurelius, the most philosophical and most conscientious of the emperors, that there was enacted for the first time in Gaul against nascent Christianity that scene of tyranny and barbarity which was to be renewed so often and during so many centuries in the midst of Christendom itself. In the eastern provinces of the empire, and in Italy, the Christians had already been several times persecuted, now with cold-blooded cruelty, now with some slight hesitation and irresolution. Nero had caused them to be burned in the streets of Rome, accusing them of the conflagration he himself had kindled and a few months before his fall st peter and st paul had undergone martyrdom at rome domitian had persecuted and put to death christians even in his own family and though invested with the honours of the consulate Righteous Trajan, when consulted by Pliny the Younger on the conduct he should adopt in Bithynia toward the Christians, had answered, It is impossible in this sort of matter to establish any certain general rule. There must be no quest set on foot against them, and no unsigned indictment must be accepted. But if they be accused and convicted, they must be punished." To be punished, it sufficed that they were convicted of being Christians, and it was Trajan himself who condemned St. Ignatius, bishop of Antioch, to be brought to Rome and thrown to the beasts, for the simple reason that he was highly Christian. Marcus Aurelius, not only by virtue of his philosophical conscientiousness, but by reason of an incident in his history, seemed bound to be further than any other from persecuting the Christians. During one of his campaigns on the Danube, A.D. 174, his army was suffering cruelly from fatigue and thirst, and at the very moment when they were on the point of engaging in a great battle against the barbarians, the rain fell in abundance, refreshed the Roman soldiers, and conduced to their victory. There was in the Roman army a legion, the twelfth, 
called the Melitine, or the Thundering, which bore on its roll many Christian soldiers. They gave thanks for the rain and the victory to the one omnipotent God who had heard their prayers, while the pagans rendered like honor to Jupiter, the rain-giver and the thunderer. The report about these Christians got spread abroad and gained credit in the empire, so much so that there was attributed to Marcus Aurelius a letter, in which by reason no doubt of this incident he forbade persecution of the Christians. Tertullian, a contemporary witness, speaks of this letter in perfect confidence and the christian writers of the following century did not hesitate to regard it as authentic nowadays a strict examination of its existing text does not allow such a character to be attributed to it at any rate the persecutions of the christians were not forbidden for in the year one seventy seven that is only three years after the victory of marcus aurelius over the germans there took place undoubtedly by his orders the persecution which caused at Lyon the first Gallic martyrdom. This was the fourth, or according to others, the fifth great imperial persecution of the Christians. Most tales of the martyrs were written long after the event, and came to be nothing more than legends laden with details, often utterly puerile or devoid of proof. The martyrs of Lyon in the second century wrote, so to speak, their own history, for it was their comrades, eye-witnesses of their sufferings and their virtue, who gave an account of them in a long letter addressed to their friends in Asia Minor, and written with passionate sympathy and pious prolixity, but bearing all the characteristics of truth it seems desirable to submit for perusal that document which has been preserved almost entire in the ecclesiastical history of eusebius bishop of caesarea in the third century and which will exhibit better than any modern representations the state of facts and of souls in the midst of the imperial persecutions and the mighty faith devotion and courage with which the early christians faced the most cruel trials the servants of christ dwelling at vienne and leon in gaul to the brethren settled in asia and phrygia who have the same faith and hope of redemption that we have peace grace and glory from god the father and jesus christ our lord none can tell to you in speech or fully set forth to you in writing the weight of our misery the madness and rage of the gentiles against the saints and all that hath been suffered by the blessed martyrs our enemy doth rush upon us with all the fury of his powers and already giveth us a foretaste and the first fruits of all the license with which he doth intend to set upon us he hath omitted nothing for the training of his agents against us and he doth exercise them in a sort of preparatory work against the servants of the lord not only are we driven from the public buildings from the baths and from the forum but it is forbidden to all our people to appear publicly in any place whatsoever the grace of god hath striven for us against the devil at the same time that it hath sustained the weak it hath opposed to the evil one as it were pillars of strength men strong and valiant ready to draw on themselves all his attacks they have had to bear all manner of insult they have deemed but a small matter that which others find hard and terrible and they have thought only of going to christ proving by their example that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be put in the balance with the glory which is to be manifested in us they have endured in the first place all the outrages that could be heaped upon them by the multitude outcries blows thefts spoliation stoning imprisonment all that the fury of the people could devise against hated enemies 
then dragged to the forum by the military tribune and the magistrates of the city they have been questioned before the people and cast into prison until the coming of the governor he from the moment our people appeared before him committed all manner of violence against them then stood forth one of our brethren vettius epagathus full of love toward god and his neighbor living a life so pure and strict that young as he was men held him to be the equal of the aged zacharias he could not bear that judgment so unjust should go forth against us and moved with indignation he asked leave to defend his brethren and to prove that there was in them no kind of irreligion or impiety those present at the tribunal among whom he was known and celebrated cried out against him and the governor himself enraged at so just a demand asked him no more than this question art thou a christian straightway with a loud voice he declared himself a christian and was placed among the number of the martyrs afterward the rest began to be examined and classed the first firm and well prepared made hearty and solemn confession of their faith others ill prepared and with little firmness showed that they lacked strength for such a fight about ten of them fell away which caused us incredible pain and mourning their example broke down the courage of others who not being yet in bonds though they had already had much to suffer kept close to the martyrs and withdrew not out of their sight then were we all stricken with dread for the issue of the trial not that we had great fear of the torments inflicted but because prophesying the result according to the degree of courage of the accused we feared much falling away they took day by day those of our brethren who were worthy to replace the weak so that all the best of the two churches those whose care and zeal had founded them were taken and confined they took likewise some of our slaves for the governor had ordered that they should be all summoned to attend in public and they fearing the torments they saw the saints undergo and instigated by the soldiers accused us falsely of odious deeds such as the banquet of thyestes the incest of oedipus and other crimes which must not be named or even thought of and which we cannot bring ourselves to believe that men were ever guilty of these reports having once spread among the people even those persons who had hitherto by reason perhaps of relationship shown moderation towards us burst forth into bitter indignation against our people thus was fulfilled that which had been prophesied by the lord the time cometh when whosoever shall kill you shall think that he doeth god's service since that day the holy martyrs have suffered tortures that no words can express the fury of the multitude of the governor and of the soldiers fell chiefly upon sanctus a deacon of vienne upon maturus a neophyte still but already a valiant champion of christ upon Attalus also born at pergamus but who hath ever been one of the pillars of our church upon blandina lastly in whom christ hath made it appear that persons who seem vile and despised of men are just those whom god holds in the highest honour by reason of the excellent love they bear him which is manifested in their firm virtue and not in vain show all of us and even blandina's mistress here below who fought valiantly with the other martyrs feared that this poor slave so weak of body would not be in a condition to freely confess her faith but she was sustained by such vigour of soul that the executioners who from morn till eve put her to all manner of torture failed in their efforts and declared themselves beaten not knowing what further punishment to inflict and marvelling that she still lived with her body pierced through and through 
and torn piecemeal by so many tortures, of which a single one should have sufficed to kill her. But that blessed saint, like a valiant athlete, took fresh courage and strength from the confession of her faith, all feeling of pain vanished, and ease returned to her at the mere utterance of the words, I am a Christian, and no evil is wrought among us. As for Sanctus, the executioners hoped that in the midst of the tortures inflicted upon him, the most atrocious which man could devise, they would hear him say something unseemly or unlawful, but so firmly did he resist them that, without even saying his name, or that of his nation or city, or whether he was bond or free, he only replied in the Roman tongue to all questions, I am a Christian. Therein was for him his name, his country, his condition, his whole being, and never could the Gentiles wrest from him another word. The fury of the governor and the executioners was redoubled against him, and, not knowing how to torment him further, they applied to his most tender members bars of red-hot iron. His members burned, but he, upright and immovable, persisted in his profession of faith, as if living waters from the bosom of Christ flowed over him and refreshed him. Some days after, these infidels began again to torture him, believing that if they inflicted upon his blistering wounds the same agonies, they would triumph over him, who seemed unable to bear the mere touch of their hands, and they hoped also that the sight of his torturing alive would terrify his comrades. But, contrary to general expectation, the body of Sanctus, rising suddenly up, stood erect and firm amid these repeated torments, and recovered its old appearance and the use of its members as if, by divine grace, this second laceration of his flesh had caused healing rather than suffering. End of section 26, part 1section twenty seven the great events by famous historians volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the great events by famous historians volume three edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and John Rood. Section 27. Persecution of the Christians in Gaul, A.D. 177, Part 2. By Francois P. G. Guizot. When the tyrants had thus expended and exhausted their tortures against the firmness of the martyrs sustained by Christ, the devil devised other contrivances, they were cast into the darkest and most unendurable place in their prison their feet were dragged out and compressed to the utmost tension of the muscles the jailers as if instigated by a demon tried every sort of torture insomuch that several of them for whom god willed such an end died of suffocation in prison others who had been tortured in such a manner that it was thought impossible they should long survive deprived as they were of every remedy and aid from men but supported nevertheless by the grace of god remained sound and strong in body as in soul and comforted and reanimated their brethren the blessed pothinus who held at that time the bishopric of Lyon, being upward of ninety, and so weak in body that he could hardly breathe, was himself brought before the tribunal, so worn with old age and sickness that he seemed nigh to extinction, but he still possessed his soul, wherewith to subserve the triumph of Christ, being brought by the soldiers before the tribunal, whither he was accompanied by all the magistrates of the city and the whole populace that pursued him with hootings, he offered, as if he had been the very Christ, the most glorious testimony. 
at a question from the governor who asked what the god of the christians was he answered if thou be worthy thou shalt know he was immediately raised up without any respect or humanity and blows were showered upon him those who happened to be nearest to him assaulted him grievously with foot and fist without the slightest regard for his age those who were farther off cast at him whatever was to their hand they would all have thought themselves guilty of the greatest default if they had not done their best each on his own score to insult him brutally they believed they were avenging the wrongs of their gods Pothinus, still breathing, was cast again into prison, and two days after yielded up his spirit. Then were manifested a singular dispensation of God and the immeasurable compassion of Jesus Christ, an example rare among brethren, but in accord with the intentions and the justice of the Lord. All those who, at their first arrest, had denied their faith, were themselves cast into prison and given over to the same sufferings as the other martyrs, for their denial did not serve them at all. Those who had made profession of being what they really were, that is, Christians, were imprisoned without being accused of other crimes. The former, on the contrary, were confined as homicides and wretches, thus suffering double punishment. The one sort found repose in the honorable joys of martyrdom, in the hope of promised blessedness, in the love of Christ, and in the Spirit of God the Father. The other were a prey to the reproaches of conscience. It was easy to distinguish the one from the other by their looks. The one walked joyously, bearing on their faces a majesty mingled with sweetness, and their very bonds seemed unto them an ornament even as the broidery that decks a bride the other with downcast eyes and humble and dejected air were an object of contempt to the gentiles themselves who regarded them as cowards who had forfeited the glorious and saving name of christians and so they who were present at this double spectacle were thereby signally strengthened and whoever among them chanced to be arrested confessed the faith without doubt or hesitation. Things having come to this pass, different kinds of death were inflicted on the martyrs, and they offered to God a crown of diverse flowers. It was but right that the most valiant champions, those who had sustained a double assault and gained a signal victory, should receive a splendid crown of immortality. The neophyte Maturus and the deacon Sanctus, Blandina and Attalus, then, were led into the amphitheatre and thrown to the beasts as a sight to please the inhumanity of the Gentiles. Maturus and Sanctus there underwent all kinds of tortures, as if they had hitherto suffered nothing, or rather like athletes who had already been several times victorious, and were contending for the crown of crowns, they braved the stripes with which they were beaten, the bites of the beasts that dragged them to and fro, and all that was demanded by the outcries of an insensate mob so much the more furious because it could by no means overcome the firmness of the martyrs or extort from sanctus any other speech than that which on the first day he had uttered i am a christian after this fearful contest as life was not extinct their throats were at last cut when they alone had thus been offered as a spectacle to the public instead of the variety displayed in the combat of gladiators. Blandina, in her turn, tied to a stake, was given to the beasts. She was seen hanging, as it were, on a sort of cross, calling upon God with trustful fervor, and the brethren present were reminded, in the person of a sister, of him who had been crucified for their salvation. As none of the beasts would touch the body of Blandina, she was released from the stake, taken back to prison, and reserved for another occasion. Attalus, whose execution, seeing that he was a man of mark, was furiously demanded by the people, 
came forward ready to brave everything, as a man deriving confidence from the memory of his life, for he had courageously trained himself to discipline, and had always among us borne witness for the truth. He was led all round the amphitheatre, preceded by a board bearing this inscription in Latin, This is Adelus the Christian. The people pursued him with the most furious hootings, but the governor, having learned that he was a Roman citizen, had him taken back to prison with the rest. Having subsequently written to Caesar, he waited for his decision as to those who were thus detained. This delay was neither useless nor unprofitable, for then shone forth the boundless compassion of Christ. Those of the brethren who had been but dead members of the church were recalled to life by the pains and help of the living. The martyrs obtained grace for those who had fallen away, and great was the joy in the church, at the same time virgin and mother, for she once more found living those whom she had given up for dead. Thus revived and strengthened by the goodness of God, who willeth not the death of the sinner, but rather inviteth him to repentance, they presented themselves before the tribunal, to be questioned afresh by the governor. Caesar had replied that they who confessed themselves to be Christians should be put to the sword, and they who denied sent away safe and sound. When the time for the great market had fully come, there assembled a numerous multitude from every nation and every province. The governor had the blessed martyrs brought up before his judgment seat, showing them before the people with all the pomp of a theatre. He questioned them afresh, and those who were discovered to be Roman citizens were beheaded. The rest were thrown to the beasts. Great glory was gained for Christ by means of those who had at first denied their faith, and who now confessed it contrary to the expectation of the Gentiles. Those who, having been privately questioned, declared themselves Christians, were added to the number of the martyrs. Those in whom appeared no vestige of faith and no fear of God remained without the pale of the church. When they were dealing with those who had been reunited to it, one Alexander, a Phrygian by nation, a physician by profession, who had for many years been dwelling in Gaul, a man well known to all for his love of God and open preaching of the faith, took his place in the Hall of Judgment, exhorting by signs all who filled it to confess their faith, even as if he had been called in to deliver them of it. The multitude, enraged to see that those who had at first denied, turned round and proclaimed their faith, cried out against Alexander, whom they accused of the conversion. The governor forthwith asked him what he was, and at the answer, I am a Christian, condemned him to the beast. On the morrow, Alexander was again brought up, together with Adolus, whom the governor, to please the people, had once more condemned to the beasts. After they had both suffered in the amphitheatre all the torments that could be devised, they were put to the sword. Alexander uttered not a complaint, not a word. He had the air of one who was talking inwardly with God. Adolus, seated on an iron seat, and waiting for the fire to consume his body, said in Latin to the people, See what ye are doing, it is in truth devouring men. As for us, we devour not men, and we do no evil at all. He was asked what was the name of God. God, said he, is not like us mortals, he hath no name. After all these martyrs, on the last day of the shows, Blandina was again brought up, together with a young lad named Ponticus, about fifteen years old. They had been brought up every day before that they might see the tortures of their brethren. When they were called upon to swear by the altars of the Gentiles, they remained firm in their faith, making no account of those pretended gods 
and so great was the fury of the multitude against them that no pity was shown for the age of the child or the sex of the woman tortures were heaped upon them they were made to pass through every kind of torment but the desired end was not gained supported by the exhortations of his sister who was seen and heard by the gentiles ponticus after having endured all magnanimously gave up the ghost blandina last of all like a noble mother that hath roused the courage of her sons for the fight and sent them forth to conquer for their king passed once more through all the tortures they had suffered anxious to go and rejoin them and rejoicing at each step toward death at length after she had undergone fire the talons of beasts and agonizing aspersion she was wrapped in a network and thrown to a bull that tossed her in the air she was already unconscious of all that befell her and seemed altogether taken up with watching for the blessings that christ had in store for her even the gentiles allowed that never a woman had suffered so much or so long still their fury and their cruelty toward the saints were not appeased they devised another way of raging against them they cast to the dogs the bodies of those who had died of suffocation in prison and watched night and day that none of our brethren might come and bury them and for what remained of the martyrs half mangled or devoured corpses they left them exposed under a guard of soldiers coming to look on them with insulting eyes and saying where is now their god of what use to them was this religion for which they laid down their lives we were overcome with grief that we were not able to bury these poor corpses nor the darkness of night nor gold nor prayers could help us to succeed therein after being thus exposed for six days in the open air given over to all manner of outrage the corpses of the martyrs were at last burned reduced to ashes and cast hither and thither by the infidels upon the waters of the rhone that there might be left no trace of them on earth they acted as if they had been more mighty than God, and could rob our brethren of their resurrection. "'Tis in that hope, said they, that these folk bring among us a new and strange religion, that they set at naught the most painful torments, and that they go joyfully to face death. Let us see if they will rise again, if their God will come to their aid, and will be able to tear them from our hands." It is not without a painful effort that, even after so many centuries, we can resign ourselves to be witnesses in imagination only of such a spectacle. We can scarce believe that among men of the same period and of the same city so much ferocity could be displayed in opposition to so much courage, the passion for barbarity against the passion for virtue nevertheless such is history and it should be represented as it really was first of all for truth's sake then for the due appreciation of virtue and all it costs of effort and sacrifice and lastly for the purpose of showing what obstacles have to be surmounted what struggles endured and what sufferings borne when the question is the accomplishment of great moral and social reforms marcus aurelius was without any doubt a virtuous ruler and one who had it in his heart to be just and humane but he was an absolute ruler that is to say one fed entirely on his own ideas very ill-informed about the facts on which he had to decide and without a free public to warn him of the errors of his ideas or the practical results of his decrees he ordered the persecution of the christians without knowing what the christians were or what the persecution would be and this conscientious philosopher let loose at leon against the most conscientious of subjects the zealous servility of his agents and the atrocious passions of the mob the persecution of the christians did not stop at leon 
or with Marcus Aurelius, it became, during the third century, the common practice of the emperors in all parts of the empire, from A.D. 202 to 312, under the reigns of Septimius Severus, Maximinus I, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, Diocletian, Maximian, and Galerius. There are reckoned six great general persecutions, without counting others more circumscribed or less severe. The emperors Alexander Severus, Philip the Arabian, and Constantius Chlorus were almost the only exceptions to this cruel system, and nearly always, wherever it was in force, the pagan mob, in its brutality or fanatical superstition, added to imperial rigor its own atrocious and cynical excesses. But Christian zeal was superior in perseverance and efficacy to pagan persecution. St. Pothinus the Martyr was succeeded as bishop at Lyon by St. Irenaeus, the most learned, most judicious, and most illustrious of the early heads of the church in Gaul. Originally from Asia Minor, probably from Smyrna, he had migrated to Gaul, at what particular date is not known, and had settled as a simple priest in the diocese of Lyon, where it was not long before he exercised vast influence, as well on the spot as also during certain missions entrusted to him, and among them one, they say to the Pope, St. Eleutherius at Rome. While Bishop of Lyon, from A.D. 177 to 202, he employed the five-and-twenty years in propagating the Christian faith in Gaul, and in defending by his writings the Christian doctrines against the discord to which they had already been subjected in the East, and which was beginning to penetrate the West. In 202, during the persecution instituted by Septimius Severus, St. Irenaeus crowned by martyrdom his active and influential life. It was in his episcopate that there began what may be called the swarm of Christian missionaries who, toward the end of the second and during the third century, spread over the whole of Gaul, preaching the faith and forming churches. Some went from Lyon at the instigation of St. Irenaeus, others from Rome, especially under the pontificate of Pope St. Fabian, himself martyred in 249, St. Felix and St. Fortunatus to Valence, St. Feriol to Besancon, St. Marcellus to chalon sur sayon St. Benignus to Dijon, St. Trophimus to Arles, St. Paul to Narbonne, St. Saturninus to Toulouse, St. Martial to Limoges, St. Andial and St. Privatus to the Cévennes, St. Ostremont to Clément Ferrand, St. Gallien to Tours, St. Denis to Paris, and so many others that their names are scarcely known beyond the pages of erudite historians, or the very spots where they preached, struggled, and conquered, often at the price of their lives. Such were the founders of the faith and of the Christian church in France. At the commencement of the fourth century, their work was, if not accomplished, at any rate triumphant, and when, A.D. 312, Constantine declared himself a Christian. He confirmed the fact of the conquest of the Roman world, and of Gaul in particular, by Christianity. No doubt the majority of the inhabitants were not as yet Christians, but it was clear that the Christians were in the ascendant and had command of the future. Of the two grand elements which were to meet together on the ruins of Roman society for the formation of modern society, the moral element, the Christian religion, had already taken possession of souls. The devastated territory awaited the coming of new peoples, known to history under the general name of Germans, whom the Romans called the barbarians. End of section 27
Section 28 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 28. Beginning of Rome's Decline. Commodus, A.D. 180, by Edward Gibbon. That a ruler of such noble character as the Roman philosopher Marcus Aurelius should have had for his son and successor a man like Commodus is one of the strange contrasts of history. The succession of Commodus, marking as it does the beginning of the decline of the great empire, may be regarded as one of the most critical moments in the existence of Rome. How folly and cruelty, shameless vice and unbridled ferocity, may be associated in the same character, has often been illustrated in the careers of the world's rulers, and nowhere more conspicuously than in some of the Roman emperors. And in the case of Commodus, the combination of these qualities led to acts which involved not only the emperor himself, but also the empire over which he ruled in fatal consequences. This vast empire, composed of many different peoples, was under the rule and subject to the caprice of one man, the form of the government imposed practically no checks on his power. With such able emperors as Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius, the state was safe. But the wise men of Rome had foreseen that a tyrant or weak and inexperienced ruler under this system might plunge the empire into confusion and ruin. Yet they had made no provision against such a contingency. In the death of such a ruler and the accession of an abler and juster one lay their only hope of amelioration. The course of events during the bloody reign of the degenerate Commodus was such as surely to forecast the decline of Roman power and supremacy. In the next hundred years there were twenty-three emperors, thirteen of whom were murdered by their own soldiers or servants, a tragic period of cruelty, licentiousness, and decay. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, Name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors, whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted in the image of liberty, and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. Such princes deserved the honor of restoring the Republic, had the Romans of their days been capable of enjoying a rational freedom. The labors of these monarchs were overpaid by the immense reward that inseparably waited on their success, by the honest pride of virtue, and by the exquisite delight of beholding the general happiness of which they were the authors. A just but melancholy reflection embittered, however, the noblest of human enjoyments. They must often have recollected the instability of a happiness which depended on the character of a single man. The fatal moment was perhaps approaching when some licentious youth or some jealous tyrant would abuse, to the destruction, that absolute power which they had exerted for the benefit of their people. The ideal restraints of the Senate and the laws might serve to display the virtues, but could never correct the vices of the emperor. The military force was a blind and irresistible instrument of oppression, and the corruption of Roman manners would always supply flatterers eager to applaud and ministers prepared to serve the fear or the avarice, the lust or the cruelty of their masters. These gloomy apprehensions had been already justified by the experience of the Romans. The annals of the emperors exhibit a strong and various picture of human nature, which we should vainly seek among the mixed and doubtful characters of modern history. In the conduct of those monarchs, we may trace the utmost lines of vice and virtue, the most exalted perfection, and the meanest degeneracy of our own species. The mildness of Marcus Aurelius, which the rigid discipline of the Stoics was unable to eradicate, formed, at the same time, the most amiable and the only defective part of his character. His excellent understanding was often deceived by the unsuspecting goodness of his heart. Artful men, who studied the passions of princes and concealed their own, approached his person in the disguise of philosophic sanctity, 
and acquired riches and honors by affecting to despise them. His excessive indulgence to his brother, his wife, and his son exceeded the bounds of private virtue and became a public injury by the example and consequences of their vices. Faustina, the daughter of Pius and the wife of Marcus, has been as much celebrated for her gallantries as for her beauty. The grave simplicity of the philosopher was ill-calculated to engage her wanton levity, or to fix that unbounded passion for variety which often discovered personal merit in the meanest of mankind. The Cupid of the ancients was, in general, a very sensual deity, and the amours of an empress, as they exact on her side the plainest advances, are seldom susceptible of much sentimental delicacy. Marcus was the only man in the empire who seemed ignorant or insensible of the irregularities of Faustina, which, according to the prejudices of every age, reflected some disgrace on the injured husband. He promoted several of her lovers to posts of honor and profit, and, during a connection of thirty years, invariably gave her proofs of the most tender confidence and of a respect which ended not with her life. In his meditations he thanks the gods, who had bestowed on him a wife so faithful, so gentle, and of such a wonderful simplicity of manners. The obsequious senate, at his earnest request, declared her a goddess. She was represented in her temples with the attributes of Juno, Venus, and Ceres, and it was decreed that on the day of their nuptials, the youth of either sex should pay their vows before the altar of their chaste patroness. The monstrous vices of the son have cast a shade on the purity of the father's virtues. It has been objected to Marcus that he sacrificed the happiness of millions to a fond partiality for a worthless boy, and that he chose a successor in his own family rather than in the empire. Nothing, however, was neglected by the anxious father, and by the men of virtue and learning whom he summoned to his assistance, to expand the narrow mind of young Commodus, to correct his growing vices, and to render him worthy of the throne for which he was designed. But the power of instruction is seldom of much efficacy, except in those happy dispositions where it is almost superfluous. The distasteful lesson of a grave philosopher was, in a moment, obliterated by the whisper of a profligate favorite. And Marcus himself blasted the fruits of this labored education by admitting his son, at the age of fourteen or fifteen, to a full participation of the imperial power. He lived but four years afterward, but he lived long enough to repent a rash measure which raised the impetuous youth above the restraint of reason and authority. Most of the crimes which disturb the internal peace of society are produced by the restraints which the necessary but unequal laws of property have imposed on the appetites of mankind by confining to a few the possession of those objects that are coveted by many. Of all our passions and appetites, the love of power is of the most imperious and unsociable nature, since the pride of one man requires the submission of the multitude. In the tumult of civil discord, the laws of society lose their force, and their place is seldom supplied by those of humanity. The ardor of contention, the pride of victory, the despair of success, the memory of past injuries, and the fear of future dangers all contribute to inflame the mind and to silence the voice of pity. From such motives, almost every page of history has been stained with civil blood. But these motives will not account for the unprovoked cruelties of Commodus, who had nothing to wish and everything to enjoy. The beloved son of Marcus succeeded to his father amid the acclamations of the Senate and armies. And when he ascended the throne, the happy youth saw around him neither competitor to remove nor enemies to punish. In this calm, elevated station, it was surely natural that he should prefer the love of mankind to their detestation, the mild glories of his five predecessors, to the ignominious fate of Nero and Domitian. Yet Commodus was not, as he has been represented, a tiger born with an insatiate thirst of human blood, and capable from his infancy of the most inhuman actions. Nature had formed him of a weak rather than a wicked disposition, his simplicity and timidity rendered him the slave of his attendants, who gradually corrupted his mind. His cruelty, which at first obeyed the dictates of others, degenerated into habit and at length became the ruling passion of his soul. Upon the death of his father, Commodus found himself embarrassed with the command of a great army and the conduct of a difficult war against the Quadi and Marcomanni. The servile and profligate youths whom Marcus had banished soon regained their station and influence about the new emperor. They exaggerated the hardships and dangers of a campaign in the wild countries beyond the Danube, and they assured the indolent prince that the terror of his name and the arms of his lieutenants 
would be sufficient to complete the conquest of the dismayed barbarians, or to impose such conditions as were more advantageous than any conquest. By a dexterous application to his sensual appetites, they compared the tranquility, the splendor, the refined pleasures of Rome with the tumult of a Pannonian camp, which afforded neither leisure nor materials for luxury. Commodus listened to the pleasing advice, but while he hesitated between his own inclination and the awe which he still retained for his father's counselors, the summer insensibly elapsed, and his triumphal entry into the capital was deferred till the autumn. His graceful person, popular address, and imagined virtues attracted the public favor. The honorable peace which he had recently granted to the barbarians diffused a universal joy. His impatience to revisit Rome was fondly ascribed to the love of his country, and his dissolute course of amusements was faintly condemned in a prince of nineteen years of age. During the three first years of his reign, the forms, and even the spirit, of the old administration were maintained by those faithful counselors to whom Marcus had recommended his son, and for whose wisdom and integrity Commodus still entertained a reluctant esteem. The young prince and his profligate favorites reveled in all the license of sovereign power, but his hands were yet unstained with blood, and he had even displayed a generosity of sentiment which might perhaps have ripened into solid virtue. A fatal incident decided his fluctuating character. One evening, as the emperor was returning to the palace through a dark and narrow portico in the amphitheater, an assassin who waited his passage rushed upon him with a drawn sword, loudly exclaiming, The Senate sends you this. The menace prevented the deed. The assassin was seized by the guards and immediately revealed the authors of the conspiracy. It had been formed not in the state but within the walls of the palace. Lucilla, the emperor's sister and widow of Lucius Verus, impatient of the second rank and jealous of the reigning empress, had armed the murderer against her brother's life. She had not ventured to communicate the black design to her second husband, Claudius Pompeianus, a senator of distinguished merit and unshaken loyalty. But among the crowd of her lovers, for she imitated the manners of Faustina, she found men of desperate fortunes and wild ambition, who were prepared to serve her more violent as well as her tender passions. The conspirators experienced the rigor of justice, and the abandoned princess was punished, first with exile and afterward with death. But the words of the assassin sunk deep into the mind of Commodus, and left an indelible impression of fear and hatred against the whole body of the Senate. Those whom he had dreaded as importunate ministers he now suspected as secret enemies. The Delators, a race of men discouraged and almost extinguished under the former reigns, again became formidable, as soon as they discovered that the emperor was desirous of finding disaffection and treason in the Senate. That assembly, whom Marcus had ever considered as the great council of the nation, was composed of the most distinguished of the Romans, and distinction of every kind soon became criminal. The possession of wealth stimulated the diligence of the informers. Rigid virtue implied a tacit censure of the irregularities of Commodus. Important services implied a dangerous superiority of merit, and the friendship of the father always ensured the aversion of the son. Suspicion was equivalent to proof, trial to condemnation. The execution of a considerable senator was attended with the death of all who might lament or revenge his fate, and when Commodus had once tasted human blood, he became incapable of pity or remorse. Of these innocent victims of tyranny, none died more lamented than the two brothers of the Quintilian family, Maximus and Condianus, whose fraternal love has saved their names from oblivion and endeared their memory to posterity. Their studies and their occupations, their pursuits and their pleasures, were still the same. In the enjoyment of a great estate, they never admitted the idea of a separate interest. Some fragments are now extant of a treatise which they composed in common, and in every action of life it was observed that their two bodies were animated by one soul. The Antonines, who valued their virtues and delighted in their union, raised them in the same year to the consulship and Marcus afterward entrusted to their joint care the civil administration of Greece and a great military command, in which they obtained a signal victory over the Germans. The kind cruelty of Commodus united them in death. The tyrant's rage, after having shed the noblest blood of the Senate, at length recoiled on the principal instrument of his cruelty. While Commodus was immersed in blood and luxury, he devolved the detail of the public business on Perennis, a servile and ambitious minister, who had obtained his post by the murder of his predecessor, but who possessed a considerable share of vigor and ability. 
By acts of extortion and the forfeited estates of the nobles sacrificed to his avarice, he had accumulated an immense treasure. The Praetorian guards were under his immediate command, and his son, who already discovered a military genius, was at the head of the Illyrian legions. Perennis aspired to the empire, or what, in the eyes of Commodus, amounted to the same crime. He was capable of aspiring to it, had he not been prevented, surprised, and put to death. The fall of a minister is a very trifling incident in the general history of the empire, but it was hastened by an extraordinary circumstance, which proved how much the nerves of discipline were already relaxed. The legions of Britain, discontented with the administration of Perennis, formed a deputation of 1,500 select men, with instructions to march to Rome and lay their complaints before the emperor. These military petitioners, by their own determined behavior, by inflaming the divisions of the guards, by exaggerating the strength of the British army, and by alarming the fears of Commodus, exacted and obtained the minister's death as the only redress of their grievances. This presumption of a distant army and their discovery of the weakness of government were a sure presage of the most dreadful convulsions. The negligence of the public administration was betrayed soon afterward by a new disorder which arose from the smallest beginnings. A spirit of desertion began to prevail among the troops, and the deserters, instead of seeking their safety in flight or concealment, infested the highways. Maternus, a private soldier of a daring boldness above his station, collected those bands of robbers into a little army, set open the prisons, invited the slaves to assert their freedom, and plundered with impunity the rich and defenseless cities of Gaul and Spain. The governors of the provinces, who had long been the spectators and perhaps the partners of his depredations, were at length roused from their supine indolence by the threatening commands of the emperor. Maternus found that he was encompassed and foresaw that he must be overpowered. A great effort of despair was his last resource. He ordered his followers to disperse, to pass the Alps in small parties and various disguises, and to assemble at Rome during the licentious tumult of the festival of Cybele. To murder Commodus and to ascend the vacant throne were the ambition of no vulgar robber. His measures were so ably concerted that his concealed troops already filled the streets of Rome. The envy of an accomplice discovered and ruined this singular enterprise in the moment when it was ripe for execution. Suspicious princes often promote the last of mankind from a vain persuasion that those who have no dependence except on their favor will have no attachment except to the person of their benefactor. Cleander, the successor of Perennis, was a Phrygian by birth, of a nation over whose stubborn but servile temper blows only could prevail. He had been sent from his native country to Rome in the capacity of a slave, as a slave, he entered the imperial palace, rendered himself useful to his master's passions, and rapidly ascended to the most exalted station which a subject could enjoy. His influence over the mind of Commodus was much greater than that of his predecessor, for Cleander was devoid of any ability or virtue which could inspire the emperor with envy or distrust. Avarice was the reigning passion of his soul and the great principle of his administration, the rank of consul, of patrician, of senator, was exposed to public sale, and it would have been considered as disaffection if anyone had refused to purchase these empty and disgraceful honors, with the greatest part of his fortune. In the lucrative provincial employments, the minister shared with the governor the spoils of the people. The execution of the laws was venal and arbitrary. A wealthy criminal might obtain not only the reversal of the sentence by which he was justly condemned, but might likewise inflict whatever punishment he pleased on the accuser, the witnesses, and the judge. By these means Cleander, in the space of three years, had accumulated more wealth than had ever yet been possessed by any freedman. Commodus was perfectly satisfied with the magnificent presence which the artful courtier laid at his feet in the most seasonable moments. To divert the public envy, Cleander, under the emperor's name, erected baths, porticos, and places of exercise for the use of the people. He flattered himself that the Romans, dazzled and amused by this apparent liberality, would be less affected by the bloody scenes which were daily exhibited, that they would forget the death of Beerus, a senator to whose superior merit the late emperor had granted one of his daughters, and that they would forgive the execution of Arius Antoninus, the last representative of the name and virtues of the Antonines. The former, with more integrity than prudence, had attempted to disclose to his brother-in-law the true character of Cleander. An equitable sentence pronounced by the latter, when proconsul of Asia, 
against a worthless creature of the favorite proved fatal to him. After the fall of Perennis, the terrors of Commodus had for a short time assumed the appearance of a return to virtue. He repealed the most odious of his acts, loaded his memory with the public execration, and ascribed to the pernicious counsels of that wicked minister all the errors of his inexperienced youth. But his repentance lasted only thirty days, and, under Cleander's tyranny, the administration of Perennis was often regretted. Pestilence and famine contributed to fill up the measure of the calamities of Rome. The first could be only imputed to the just indignation of the gods. But a monopoly of corn, supported by the riches and power of the minister, was considered as the immediate cause of the second. The popular discontent, after it had long circulated in whispers, broke out in the assembled circus. The people quitted their favorite amusements for the more delicious pleasure of revenge, rushed in crowds toward a palace in the suburbs, one of the emperor's retirements, and demanded, with angry clamors, the head of the public enemy. Cleander, who commanded the Praetorian guards, ordered a body of cavalry to sally forth and disperse the seditious multitude. The multitude fled with precipitation toward the city. Several were slain, and many more were trampled to death. But when the cavalry entered the streets, their pursuit was checked by a shower of stones and darts from the roofs and windows of the houses. The foot guards, who had long been jealous of the prerogatives and insolence of the Praetorian cavalry, embraced the party of the people. The tumult became a regular engagement, and threatened a general massacre. The Praetorians at length gave way, oppressed with numbers, and the tide of popular fury returned with redoubled violence against the gates of the palace, where Commodus lay, dissolved in luxury, and alone unconscious of the civil war. It was death to approach his person with the unwelcome news. He would have perished in this supine security had not two women, his eldest sister Fidilla and Marcia, the most favored of his concubines, ventured to break into his presence. Bathed in tears and with disheveled hair, they threw themselves at his feet, and, with all the pressing eloquence of fear, discovered to the affrighted emperor the crimes of the minister, the rage of the people, and the impending ruin which, in a few minutes, would burst over his palace and person. Commodus started from his dream of pleasure and commanded that the head of Cleander should be thrown out to the people. The desired spectacle instantly appeased the tumult, and the son of Marcus might even yet have regained the affection and confidence of his subjects. But every sentiment of virtue and humanity was extinct in the mind of Commodus. While he thus abandoned the reins of empire to these unworthy favorites, he valued nothing in sovereign power except the unbounded license of indulging his sensual appetites. The influence of a polite age and the labor of an attentive education had never been able to infuse into his rude and brutish mind the least tincture of learning, and he was the first of the Roman emperors totally devoid of taste for the pleasures of the understanding. Nero himself excelled, or affected to excel, in the elegant arts of music and poetry, nor should we despise his pursuits had he not converted the pleasing relaxation of a leisure hour into the serious business and ambition of his life. But Commodus, from his earliest infancy, discovered an aversion to whatever was rational or liberal, and a fond attachment to the amusements of the populace, the sports of the circus and amphitheater, the combats of gladiators, and the hunting of wild beasts. The masters in every branch of learning, whom Marcus provided for his son, were heard with inattention and disgust, while the Moors and Parthians, who taught him to dart the javelin and to shoot with the bow, found a disciple who delighted in his application, and soon equaled the most skillful of his instructors in the steadiness of the eye and the dexterity of the hand. The servile crowd, whose fortune depended on their master's vices, applauded these ignoble pursuits. The perfidious voice of flattery reminded him that by exploits of the same nature, by the defeat of the Nemean lion, and the slaughter of the wild boar of Arimanthus, the Grecian Hercules had acquired a place among the gods and an immortal memory among men. They only forgot to observe that in the first ages of society, when the fiercer animals often dispute with man the possession of an unsettled country, a successful war against those savages is one of the most innocent and beneficial labors of heroism. In the civilized state of the Roman Empire, the wild beasts had long since retired from the face of man and the neighborhood of populous cities. To surprise them in their solitary haunts and to transport them to Rome that they might be slain in pomp by the hand of an emperor was an enterprise equally ridiculous for the prince and oppressive for the people. 
Ignorant of these distinctions, Commodus eagerly embraced the glorious resemblance and styled himself, as we still read on his medals, the Roman Hercules. The club and the lion's hide were placed by the side of the throne, among the ensigns of sovereignty, and statues were erected in which Commodus was represented in the character and with the attributes of the god whose valor and dexterity he endeavored to emulate in the daily course of his ferocious amusements. Elated with these praises, which gradually extinguished the innate sense of shame, Commodus resolved to exhibit before the eyes of the Roman people those exercises which till then he had decently confined within the walls of his palace and to the presence of a few favorites. On the appointed day, the various motives of flattery, fear, and curiosity attracted to the amphitheater an innumerable multitude of spectators, and some degree of applause was deservedly bestowed on the uncommon skill of the imperial performer. Whether he aimed at the head or heart of the animal, the wound was alike certain and mortal. With arrows whose point was shaped into the form of a crescent, Commodus often intercepted the rapid career and cut asunder the long, bony neck of the ostrich. A panther was let loose, and the archer waited till he had leaped upon a trembling malefactor. In the same instant the shaft flew, the beast dropped dead, and the man remained unhurt. The dens of the amphitheater disgorged at once a hundred lions. A hundred darts from the unerring hand of Commodus laid them dead as they ran raging round the arena. Neither the huge bulk of the elephant nor the scaly height of the rhinoceros could defend them from his stroke. Ethiopia and India yielded their most extraordinary productions, and several animals were slain in the amphitheater, which had been seen only in the representations of art or perhaps of fancy. In all these exhibitions, the securest precautions were used to protect the person of the Roman Hercules from the desperate spring of any savage, who might possibly disregard the dignity of the emperor and the sanctity of the god. But the meanest of the populace were affected with shame and indignation when they beheld their sovereign enter the lists as a gladiator, and glory in a profession which the laws and manners of the Romans had branded with the justest note of infamy. He chose the habit and arms of the secutor, whose combat with the retiarius formed one of the most lively scenes in the bloody sports of the amphitheater. The secutor was armed with a helmet, sword, and buckler. His naked antagonist had only a large net and a trident. With the one he endeavored to entangle, with the other to dispatch his enemy. If he missed the first throw, he was obliged to fly from the pursuit of the secutor till he had prepared his net for a second cast. The emperor fought in this character 735 several times. These glorious achievements were carefully recorded in the public acts of the empire, and that he might omit no circumstance of infamy, he received from the common fund of gladiators a stipend so exorbitant that it became a new and most ignominious tax upon the Roman people. It may be easily supposed that in these engagements the master of the world was always successful. In the amphitheater his victories were not often sanguinary, but when he exercised his skill in the school of gladiators or his own palace, his wretched antagonists were frequently honored with a mortal wound from the hand of Commodus, and obliged to seal their flattery with their blood. He now disdained the appellation of Hercules. The name of Paulus, a celebrated secutor, was the only one which delighted his ear. He was inscribed on his colossal statues and repeated in the redoubled acclamations of the mournful and applauding Senate. Claudius Pompeianus, the virtuous husband of Lucilla, was the only senator who asserted the honor of his rank. As a father, he permitted his sons to consult their safety by attending the amphitheater. As a Roman, he declared that his own life was in the emperor's hands, but that he would never behold the son of Marcus prostituting his person and dignity. Notwithstanding his manly resolution, Pompeianus escaped the resentment of the tyrant and, with his honor, had the good fortune to preserve his life. Commodus had now attained the summit of vice and infamy. Amid the acclamations of a flattering court, he was unable to disguise from himself that he had deserved the contempt and hatred of every man of sense and virtue in his empire. His ferocious spirit was irritated by the consciousness of that hatred, by the envy of every kind of merit, by the just apprehension of danger, and by the habit of slaughter which he contracted in his daily amusements. History has preserved a long list of consular senators sacrificed to his wanton suspicion, which sought out, with peculiar anxiety, those unfortunate persons connected, however remotely, with the family of the Antonines, without sparing even the ministers of his crimes or pleasures. His cruelty proved at last fatal to himself. 
He had shed with impunity the noblest blood of Rome. He perished as soon as he was dreaded by his own domestics. Marcia, his favorite concubine, Eclectus, his chamberlain, and Laetus, his praetorian prefect, alarmed by the fate of their companions and predecessors, resolved to prevent the destruction which every hour hung over their heads, either from the mad caprice of the tyrant or the sudden indignation of the people. Marcia seized the occasion of presenting a draught of wine to her lover, after he had fatigued himself with hunting some wild beasts. Commodus retired to sleep, but while he was laboring with the effects of poison and drunkenness, a robust youth, by profession a wrestler, entered his chamber and strangled him without resistance. The body was secretly conveyed out of the palace, before the least suspicion was entertained in the city, or even in the court, of the emperor's death. Such was the fate of the son of Marcus, and so easy was it to destroy a hated tyrant who, by the artificial powers of government, had oppressed, during thirteen years, so many millions of subjects, each of whom was equal to their master in personal strength and personal abilities. End of section 28. Section 29 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 3. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 29. Eventful Reign of Sapor I, King of Persia, A.D. 240, by George Rawlinson. Under Mithridates I, the Parthian Empire rose to great power, and that monarch, about B.C. 163, began to make conquests toward the west. By B.C. 150, he had added to his possessions Media Magna, Susiniana, Babylonia, Assyria proper, and Persia. The Persians appear to have yielded without resistance to his rule, and he governed them with a fair degree of moderation, allowing them, as was the Parthian policy toward subject peoples, a large measure of self-government under their hereditary native kings, the king of kings exacting little from them besides regular tribute and the required number of men for his armies. The Parthian Empire was in turn overthrown by Artashir or Artaxerxes, who about B.C. 226 defeated and killed Artavan, the last Parthian king, and became the chief founder of the Sasanian dynasty, which ruled Persia until the Mohammedan invasion. The victories of Artaxerxes had fatal results for the Roman power in the east, for the new head of the Persian monarchy was no sooner established on his throne than he sent an embassy to the Roman emperor, Alexander Severus, to demand from him the surrender of all Asia and the withdrawal of Roman arms and authority to the western shores of the Aegean Sea and of the Propontis, as the Sea of Marmora was anciently called. From this began a series of wars which continued at intervals for four centuries, and which ended only with the Mahometan conquests that overwhelmed Roman and Persian power alike. The first campaigns of the Romans against Artaxerxes were indecisive, but the renewal of the war in the reign of his son, Sapor I, was followed by disasters to the Roman arms which Rawlinson describes in his most lucid and vigorous manner, together with the other feats of this remarkable man. Artaxerxes appears to have died in A.D. 240. He was succeeded by his son Shupuri, or Sapor, the first Sasanian prince of that name. According to the Persian historians, the mother of Sapor was a daughter of the last Parthian king, Artabanus, whom Artaxerxes had taken to wife after his conquest of her father. But the facts known of Sapor throw doubt on this story, which has too many parallels in Oriental romance to claim implicit credence. Nothing authentic has come down to us respecting Sapor during his father's lifetime, but from the moment that he mounted the throne, we find him engaged in a series of wars, which show him to have been of a most active and energetic character. Armenia, which Artaxerxes had subjected, attempted, it would seem, to regain its independence at the commencement of the reign, but Sapor easily crushed the nascent insurrection, 
and the Armenians made no further effort to free themselves till several years after his death. Contemporaneously with this revolt in the mountain region of the north, a danger showed itself in the plains country of the south, where Manizan, king of Hatra, or al Hader, not only declared himself independent, but assumed dominion over the entire tract between the Euphrates and the Tigris, the Jazeera of the Arabian geographers. The strength of Hatra was great, as had been proved by Trajan and Severus. Its thick walls and valiant inhabitants would probably have defied every attempt of the Persian prince to make himself master of it by force. He, therefore, resorted to stratagem. Manizan had a daughter who cherished ambitious views. On obtaining a promise from Sapor that if she gave Hatra into his power, he would make her his queen, this unnatural child turned against her father, betrayed him into Sapor's hands, and thus brought the war to an end. Sapor recovered his lost territory, but he did not fulfill his bargain. Instead of marrying the traitoress, he handed her over to an executioner to receive the death that she had deserved, though scarcely at his hands. Encouraged by his success in these two lesser contests, Sapor resolved, apparently in A.D. 241, to resume the bold projects of his father and engage in a great war with Rome. The confusion and troubles which afflicted the Roman Empire at this time were such as might well give him hopes of obtaining a decided advantage. Alexander, his father's adversary, had been murdered in A.D. 235 by Maximin, who from the condition of a Thracian peasant had risen into the higher ranks of the army. The upstart had ruled like the savage that he was, and after three years of misery, the whole Roman world had risen against him. Two emperors had been proclaimed in Africa. On their fall, two others had been elected by the Senate. A third, a mere boy, had been added at the demand of the Roman populace. All the pretenders except the last had met with violent deaths, and after the shocks of a year, unparalleled since A.D. 69, the administration of the greatest kingdom in the world was in the hands of a youth of fifteen. Sapor, no doubt, thought he saw in this condition of things an opportunity that he ought not to miss, and rapidly matured his plans lest the favorable moment should pass away. Crossing the middle Tigris into Mesopotamia, the bands of Sapor first attacked the important city of Nisibis. Nisibis, at the time a Roman colony, was strongly situated on the outskirts of the mountain range which traverses northern Mesopotamia between the 37th and 38th parallels. The place was well fortified and well defended. It offered a prolonged resistance, but the walls were breached and it was forced to yield itself. The advance was then made along the southern flank of the mountains by Karhai, Haran, and Edessa to the Euphrates, which was probably reached in the neighborhood of Berejik. The hordes then poured into Syria, and, spreading themselves over that fertile region, surprised and took the metropolis of the Roman East, the rich and luxurious city of Antioch. But meantime, the Romans had shown a spirit which had not been expected from them. Gordian, young as he was, had quitted Rome and marched through Moesia and Thrace into Asia, accompanied by a formidable army and by at least one good general. Timesatheus, whose daughter Gordian had recently married, though his life had hitherto been that of a civilian, exhibited on his elevation to the dignity of Praetorian prefect considerable military ability. The army, nominally commanded by Gordian, really acted under his orders. With it, Timesatheus attacked and beat the bands of Sapor in a number of engagements, recovered Antioch, crossed the Euphrates, retook Karhai, defeated the Persian monarch in a pitched battle near Racina, Reis el in recovered Nisibis, and once more planted the Roman standards on the banks of the Tigris. Sapor hastily evacuated most of his conquests, and retired first across the Euphrates, and then across the more eastern river, while the Romans advanced as he retreated, placed garrisons in the various Mesopotamian towns, and even threatened the great city of Tessaphon. Gordian was confident that his general would gain further triumphs, and wrote to the Senate to that effect. But either disease or the arts of a rival cut short the career of the victor, 
and from the time of his death, the Romans ceased to be successful. The legions had, it would seem, invaded southern Mesopotamia when the praetorian prefect, who had succeeded to Mesotheus, brought them intentionally into difficulties by his mismanagement of the commissariat, and at last retreat was determined on. The young emperor had almost reached his own frontier when the discontent of the army, fomented by the prefect, Philip, came to a head. Gordian was murdered at a place called Zaitha, about twenty miles south of Circesium, and was buried where he fell, the soldiers raising a tumulus in his honor. His successor, Philip, was glad to make peace on any tolerable terms with the Persians. He felt himself insecure upon his throne, and was anxious to obtain the Senate's sanction of his usurpation. He therefore quitted the East in A.D. 244, having concluded a treaty with Sapor by which Armenia seems to have been left to the Persians, while Mesopotamia returned to its old condition of a Roman province. The peace made between Philip and Sapor was followed by an interval of fourteen years, during which scarcely anything is known of the condition of Persia. We may suspect that troubles in the northeast of his empire occupied Sapor during this period, for at the end of it we find Bactria, which was certainly subject to Persia during the earlier years of the monarchy, occupying an independent position, and even assuming an attitude of hostility toward the Persian monarch. Bactria had, from a remote antiquity, claims to preeminence among the Aryan nations. She was more than once inclined to revolt from the Achaemenidae, and during the later Parthian period she had enjoyed a sort of semi-independence. It would seem that she now succeeded in detaching herself altogether from her southern neighbor and becoming a distinct and separate power. To strengthen her position, she entered into relations with Rome, which gladly welcomed any adhesions to her cause in this remote region. Sapor's second war with Rome was, like his first, provoked by himself. After concluding his peace with Philip, he had seen the Roman world governed successively by six weak emperors, of whom four had died violent deaths, while at the same time there had been a continued series of attacks upon the northern frontiers of the empire by Alamanni, Goths, and Franks, who had ravaged at will a number of the finest provinces, and threatened the absolute destruction of the great monarchy of the West. It was natural that the chief kingdom of Western Asia should note these events, and should seek to promote its own interests by taking advantage of the circumstances of the time. Sapor, in A.D. 258, determined on a fresh invasion of the Roman provinces, and once more entering Mesopotamia, carried all before him, became master of Nisibis, Carhai, and Edessa, and, crossing the Euphrates, surprised Antioch, which was wrapped in the enjoyment of theatrical and other representations, and only knew its fate on the exclamation of a couple of actors that the Persians were in possession of the town. The aged emperor Valerian hastened to the protection of his more eastern territories, and at first gained some successes, retaking Antioch and making that city his headquarters during his stay in the east. But after this the tide turned. Valerian entrusted the whole conduct of the war to Macrianus, his praetorian prefect, whose talents he admired and of whose fidelity he did not entertain a suspicion. Macrianus, however, aspired to the empire and intentionally brought Valerian into difficulties in the hope of disgracing or removing him. His tactics were successful. The Roman army in Mesopotamia was betrayed into a situation whence escape was impossible, and where its capitulation was only a question of time. A bold attempt made to force a way through the enemy's lines failed utterly, after which famine and pestilence began to do their work. In vain did the aged emperor send envoys to propose a peace, and offer to purchase escape by the payment of an immense sum in gold. Sapor, confident of victory, refused the overture, and, waiting patiently till his adversary was at the last gasp, invited him to a conference, and then treacherously seized his person. The army surrendered or dispersed. Macrianus, the praetorian prefect, shortly assumed the title of emperor and marched against Gallienus, 
the son and colleague of Valerian, who had been left to direct affairs in the west. But another rival started up in the east. Sapor conceived the idea of complicating the Roman affairs by himself putting forward a pretender, and an obscure citizen of Antioch, a certain Myriades, or Syriades, a refugee in his camp, was invested with the purple and assumed the title of Caesar. The blow struck at Edessa laid the whole of Roman Asia open to attack, and the Persian monarch was not slow to seize the occasion. His troops crossed the Euphrates in force, and, marching on Antioch, once more captured that unfortunate town, from which the more prudent citizens had withdrawn, but where the bulk of the people, not displeased at the turn of affairs, remained and welcomed the conqueror. Myriades was installed in power, while Sapor himself, at the head of his irresistible squadrons, pressed forward, bursting like a mountain torrent into Cilicia, and thence into Cappadocia. Tarsus, the birthplace of St. Paul, at once a famous seat of learning in a great emporium of commerce, fell. Cilicia Campestris was overrun, and the passes of Taurus, deserted or weakly defended by the Romans, came into Sapor's hand. Penetrating through them and entering the campaign country beyond, his bands soon began the siege of Caesarea Mazaca, the greatest city of these parts, estimated at this time to have contained a population of 400,000 souls. Demosthenes, the governor of Caesarea, defended it bravely, and, had force only been used against him, might have prevailed, but Sapor found friends within the walls, and by their help made himself master of the place, while its bold defender was obliged to content himself with escaping by cutting his way through the victorious host. All Asia Minor now seemed open to the conqueror, and it is difficult to understand why he did not at any rate attempt a permanent occupation of the territory, which he had so easily overrun, but it seems certain that he entertained no such idea. Devastation and plunder, revenge and gain, not permanent conquest, were his objects, and hence his course was everywhere marked by ruin and carnage, by smoking towns, ravaged fields, and heaps of slain. His cruelties have no doubt been exaggerated, but when we hear that he filled the ravines and valleys of Cappadocia with dead bodies, and so led his cavalry across them, that he depopulated Antioch, killing or carrying off into slavery almost the whole population, that he suffered his prisoners in many cases to perish of hunger, and that he drove them to water once a day like beasts, we may be sure that the guise in which he showed himself to the Romans was that of a merciless scourge, an avenger bent on spreading the terror of his name, not of one who really sought to enlarge the limits of his empire. During the whole course of this plundering expedition, until the retreat began, we hear but of one check that the bands of Sapor received. It had been determined to attack Emesa, one of the most important of the Syrian towns, where the Temple of Venus was known to contain a vast treasure. The invaders approached, scarcely expecting to be resisted, but the high priest of the temple, having collected a large body of peasants, appeared in his sacerdotal robes at the head of a fanatic multitude armed with slings, and succeeded in beating off the assailants. Amisa, its temple, and its treasure escaped the rapacity of the Persians, and an example of resistance was set, which was not perhaps without important consequences. For it seems certain that the return of Sapor across the Euphrates was not effected without considerable loss and difficulty. On his advance into Syria, he had received an embassy from a certain Odenathus, a Syrian or Arab chief, who occupied a position of semi-independence at Palmyra, which through the advantages of its situation had lately become a flourishing commercial town. Odenathus sent a long train of camels laden with gifts, consisting in part of rare and precious merchandise, to the Persian monarch, begging him to accept them and claiming his favorable regard on the ground that he had hitherto refrained from all acts of hostility against the Persians. It appears that Sapor took offense at the tone of the communication, which was not sufficiently humble to please him. Tearing the letter to fragments and trampling it beneath his feet, he exclaimed, 
Who is this Odenathus, and of what country, that he ventures thus to address his lord? Let him now, if he would lighten his punishment, come here and fall prostrate before me with his hands tied behind his back. Should he refuse, let him be well assured that I will destroy himself, his race, and his land. At the same time, he ordered his servants to cast the costly presence of the Palmyrene prince into the Euphrates. This arrogant and offensive behavior naturally turned the willing friend into an enemy. Odenathus, finding himself forced into a hostile position, took arms and watched his opportunity. So long as Sapor continued to advance, he kept aloof. As soon, however, as the retreat commenced, and the Persian army, encumbered with its spoil and captives, proceeded to make its way back slowly and painfully to the Euphrates, Odenathus, who had collected a large force, in part from the Syrian villages, in part from the wild tribes of Arabia, made his appearance in the field. His light and agile horsemen hovered about the Persian host, cut off their stragglers, made prize of much of their spoil, and even captured a portion of the seraglio of the great king. The harassed troops were glad when they had placed the Euphrates between themselves and their pursuer, and congratulated each other on their escape. So much had they suffered, and so little did they feel equal to further conflicts, that on their march through Mesopotamia, they consented to purchase the neutrality of the people of Edessa, by making over to them all the coined money that they had carried off in their Syrian raid. After this, it would seem that the retreat was unmolested, and Sapor succeeded in conveying the greater part of his army, together with his illustrious prisoner, to his own country. With regard to the treatment that Valerian received at the hands of his conqueror, it is difficult to form a decided opinion. The writers nearest to the time speak vaguely and moderately, merely telling us that he grew old in his captivity and was kept in the condition of a slave. It is reserved for authors of the next generation to inform us that he was exposed to the constant gaze of the multitude, fettered but clad in the imperial purple, and that Sapor, whenever he mounted on horseback, placed his foot upon his prisoner's neck. Some add that when the unhappy captive died, about the year A.D. 265 or 266, his body was flayed and the skin inflated and hung up to view in one of the most frequented temples of Persia, where it was seen by Roman envoys on their visits to the great king's court. It is impossible to deny that Oriental barbarism may conceivably have gone to these lengths, and it is in favor of the truth of the details that Roman vanity would naturally have been opposed to their invention. But, on the other hand, we have to remember that in the East the person of a king is generally regarded as sacred, and that self-interest restrains the conquering monarch from dishonoring one of his own class. We have also to give due weight to the fact that the earlier authorities are silent with respect to any such atrocities, and that they are first related half a century after the time when they are said to have occurred. Under these circumstances, the skepticism of Gibbon with respect to them is perhaps worthy of commendation. It may be added that Oriental monarchs, when they are cruel, do not show themselves ashamed of their cruelties, but usually relate them openly in their inscriptions or represent them in their bas-reliefs. The remains ascribed on good grounds to Sapor do not, however, contain anything confirmatory of the stories which we are considering. Valerian is represented on them in a humble attitude, but not fettered, and never in the posture of extreme degradation commonly associated with his name. He bends his knee, as no doubt he would be required to do, on being brought into the great king's presence, but otherwise he does not appear to be subjected to any indignity. It seems thus to be on the whole most probable that the Roman emperor was not more severely treated than the generality of captive princes, and that Sapor has been unjustly taxed with abusing the rights of conquest. The hostile feeling of Odenathus against Sapor did not cease with the retreat of the latter across the Euphrates. The Palmyrene prince was bent on taking advantage of the general confusion of the times to carve out for himself a considerable kingdom, of which Palmyra should be the capital. Syria and Palestine, on the one hand, Mesopotamia, on the other, were the provinces that lay most conveniently near to him and that he especially coveted. 
but Mesopotamia had remained in the possession of the Persians as the prize of their victory over Valerian, and could only be obtained by wrestling it from the hands into which it had fallen. Odenathus did not shrink from this contest. It has been, with some reason, conjectured that Sapor must have been at this time occupied with troubles which had broken out on the eastern side of his empire. At any rate, it appears that Odenathus, after a short contest with Macrianus and his son Quietus, turned his arms once more, about A.D. 263, against the Persians, crossed the Euphrates into Mesopotamia, took Carhai and Nisibis, defeated Sapor and some of his sons in a battle, and drove the entire Persian host in confusion to the gates of Ctesiphon. He even returned to lay siege to that city, but it was not long before effectual relief arrived. From all the provinces flocked in contingents for the defense of the western capital. Several engagements were fought, in some of which Odenathus was defeated, and at last he found himself involved in difficulties through his ignorance of the localities, and so thought it best to retire. Apparently his retreat was undisturbed. He succeeded in carrying off his booty and his prisoners, among whom were several satraps, and he retained possession of Mesopotamia, which continued to form a part of the Palmyrene kingdom until the capture of Zenobia by Aurelian, A.D. 273. The successes of Odenathus in A.D. 263 were followed by a period of comparative tranquility. That ambitious prince seems to have been content with ruling from the Tigris to the Mediterranean, and with the title of Augustus, which he received from the Roman emperor Gallienus, and king of kings, which he assumed upon his coins. He did not press further upon Sapor, nor did the Roman emperor make any serious attempt to recover his father's person or revenge his defeat upon the Persians. An expedition which he sent out to the east, professedly with this object, in the year A.D. 267, failed utterly, its commander, Heraclianus, being signally defeated by Zenobia, the widow and successor of Odenathus. Odenathus himself was murdered by a kinsman three or four years after his great successes, and though Zenobia ruled his kingdom almost with a man's vigor, the removal of his powerful adversary must have been felt as a relief by the Persian monarch. It is evident, too, that from the time of the accession of Zenobia, the relations between Rome and Palmyra had become unfriendly. The old empire grew jealous of the new kingdom, which had sprung up upon its borders, and the effect of this jealousy, while it lasted, was to secure Persia from any attack on the part of either. It appears that Sapor, relieved from any further necessity of defending his empire in arms, employed the remaining years of his life in the construction of great works, and especially in the erection and ornamentation of a new capital. The ruins of Shapur, which still exist near Kazarun, in the province of Fars, commemorate the name and afford some indication of the grandeur of the second Persian monarch. Besides remains of buildings, they comprise a number of bas-reliefs and rock inscriptions, some of which were, beyond a doubt, set up by Sapor I. In one of the most remarkable, the Persian monarch is represented on horseback, wearing the crown usual upon his coins, and holding by the hand a tunicked figure, probably Myriades, whom he is presenting to the captured Romans as their sovereign. Foremost to do him homage is the kneeling figure of a chieftain, probably Valerian, behind whom are arranged in a double line seventeen persons, representing probably the different corps of the Roman army. All these persons are on foot, while in contrast with them are arranged behind Sapor ten guards on horseback, who represent his irresistible cavalry. Another bas-relief at the same place gives us a general view of Sapor on his return to Persia with his illustrious prisoners. Here, fifty-seven guards are ranged behind him, while in front are thirty-three tribute-bearers, having with them an elephant and a chariot. In the center is a group of seven figures, comprising Sapor, who is on horseback in his usual costume, Valerian, who is under the horse's feet, Myriades, who stands by Sapor's side, three principal tribute bearers in front of the main figure, and a victory, which floats in the sky.
Another important work, assigned by tradition to Sapor I, is the great dike at Schuster. This is a dam across the river Karun, formed of cut stones, cemented by lime, and fastened together by cramps of iron. It is 20 feet broad and no less than 1,200 feet in length. The whole is a solid mass except in the center, where two small arches have been constructed for the purpose of allowing a part of the stream to flow in its natural bed. The greater portion of the water is directed eastward into a canal cut for it, and the town of Schuster is thus defended on both sides by a water barrier, whereby the position becomes one of great strength. Tradition says that Sapor used his power over Valerian to obtain Roman engineers for this work, and the great dam is still known as the Dam of Caesar to the inhabitants of the neighboring country. Sapor died, having reigned 31 years, from A.D. 240 to A.D. 271. He was undoubtedly one of the most remarkable princes of the Sasanian series. In military talent, indeed, he may not have equaled his father, for though he defeated Valerian, he had to confess himself inferior to Odonathus. But in general governmental ability, he is among the foremost of the Neo-Persian monarchs, and may compare favorably with almost any prince of the series. He baffled Odonathus when he was not able to defeat him, by placing himself behind walls, and by bringing into play those advantages which naturally belonged to the position of a monarch attacked in his own country. He maintained, if he did not permanently advance, the power of Persia in the west, while in the east it is probable that he considerably extended the bounds of his dominion. To the internal administration of his empire, he united works of usefulness with the construction of memorials which had only a sentimental and aesthetic value. He was a liberal patron of art and is thought not to have confined his patronage to the encouragement of native talent. On the subject of religion, he did not suffer himself to be permanently led away by the enthusiasm of a young and bold free thinker. He decided to maintain the religious system that had descended to him from his ancestors, and turned a deaf ear to persuasions that would have led him to revolutionize the religious opinion of the East without placing it upon a satisfactory footing. The Orientals add to these commendable features of character that he was a man of remarkable beauty, of great personal courage, and of a noble and princely liberality. According to them, he only desired wealth that he might use it for good and great purposes. End of section 29